The rusty sign that greeted visitors to the remote community of Wendon, Idaho, wasn't much to look at, but it marked a moment I'd never forget. As a long-haul truck driver, Jared Maxson, yeah, I know, it's an unusual last name, had seen his fair share of hidden countryside gems across America from behind the wheel of his Kenworth. But Wendon was different, holding a charm and mystique that few other places could replicate. For years, I'd heard talk about Wendon's old folk tales, whispers spread in truck stops up and down the freeway. My buddy for this trip was Maurice Hurtwood, a tough son of a gun who looked like he'd been chiseled out of granite from one of those long shuttered quarries lining the highway we were driving. Although he was a tough guy on the outside, Maurice had a knack for exchanging stories with anyone he encountered, and this trip found us on the trail of Wendon's elusive Red River Ripper. Frightening encounters with dangerous people or creatures are best left to TV shows and cheap novels, or so I thought until that night put my skepticism to the test. The mystery had deep roots in Wendon, an elusive serial killer who locals claimed had haunted generations before any concrete evidence had ever surfaced. Some suggested it was descendants who continued the family's legacy or some twisted, blood-crazed cults spanning across generations. Maurice continued prodding local folks we crossed paths with until finally receiving concrete details about one disturbing encounter. Isolated in a clearing about ten miles outside town near Abbott Falls lay a small cluster of abandoned buildings where no living soul ever ventured. Locals avoided these structures because they believed they were where the Ripper crafted violent carnage. Against our better judgment, we sought out this desolate corner. After parking our trucks, we hesitated for just a moment before heading towards the derelict site. Guided by the ghostly light of our flashlights, we stepped carefully over broken boards and rusty nails. My heart raced as I stepped into the desolate building. Maurice ventured ahead, and I heard him gasp barely audible over my own breathing. Following his gaze, we discovered a gruesome scene. Blood splatters adorned the walls like some twisted painting, and bones lay conspicuously scattered about. We considered retreating when we heard it, the subtle sound of footsteps dragging along with a heavy knife scraping against the worn floorboards. Panic seized both of us, barely letting out a word. Only one thought crossed my mind. We were about to become the next victims of the Red River Ripper. Holding our breaths, we heard whispering voices just outside, soft and menacing. The dilapidated door creaked as it opened slowly, a patch of darkness slowly revealing itself into the deadbolt's moonlight silhouette. Suddenly, a figure emerged, noticeably tall and lean with blood-stained clothes and a pallid complexion. My eyes widened in terror at the sight of what I presumed to be the Red River Ripper. Who the devil are you? Maurice barked, attempting to mask his fear with bravado. You poor souls, the man replied, his voice dripping with malice. What the hell do you think you're doing here? I stammered struggling to find my own courage. The stranger grinned sinisterly. This is my art. It is my masterpiece. He gestured towards the bloody scene around us. You see, he continued, a master needs a proper canvas to bring his work alive. Maurice clenched his fists, ready for confrontation. You're sick in the head, you know that? The man laughed darkly. Perhaps. He glanced at a wristwatch before continuing. Well, gentlemen, it's time for me to add another stroke of color to this little exhibition. He stepped menacingly towards us, dragging that heavy knife across the floor. Don't move any closer. I warned him as Maurice and I began backing away slowly. An unexpected change occurred within a split second. 
The man's expression morphed from sadistic glee to sheer panic when he spotted something behind us. We twisted our heads around just in time to see a group of armed townsfolk storm into the room where we were cowering. Drop your weapon! shouted one of the men. Frozen in place and unarmed against our new allies, the Ripper raised his hands in surrender. It seemed as if he had finally met his end. But as they closed in on him, the killer displayed an eerie calmness that sent chills down my spine. Without warning, he grabbed a strange device he had tucked into his blood-stained coat while everyone was momentarily distracted by the commotion. As soon as he pressed the button, a blinding flash of light filled the room. We all staggered back, gasping for air and shielding our eyes from the unnatural glow. When we recovered and looked again, the Ripper was gone, vanished without a trace, unbound by time or reason. We quickly realized it also left an unsettling message on the wall. None shall ever capture me, not while my soul remains bound to this accursed domain. And so, the elusive Red River Ripper continued to wreak havoc on Wendon, Idaho. Despite many deaths and several sightings throughout the years, the townsfolk were cursed to never apprehend him. He continued his bloody work, forever lurking just out of reach. As for me and Maurice, we left Wendon shortly after that harrowing encounter. I couldn't let it consume us like it had with too many others. For my sanity, we vowed never to return to that cursed place or investigate its blood-soaked mysteries again. Still, there's not a day that goes by without my thoughts drifting back to Wendon and the Red River Ripper. Even in my darkest nightmares, I'm haunted by that sinister laugh and the horrific scenes we witnessed that unforgettable night. It started off like any other Thursday. My truck was loaded up and ready to make a cross-country delivery visit from Colfax, Iowa. To Loveland, Colorado. As I merged onto the highway, I noticed a peculiar detail about an old minivan in the rearview mirror. The side door had an unusual number of deep scratches as if someone had violently clawed at it. Strange, I thought, but I quickly shrugged it off. As hours ticked by and the sun dipped below the horizon with purple and gold streaks left behind in the evening sky, I pulled into a roadside truck stop to stretch my legs and fuel up. My name is Paxton Thorne, and though I've been driving this route for five years, one thing I've picked up on is that you never know what interesting characters you'll meet along the road. While inside the convenience store, paying for my gas and grabbing a cup of coffee, my eyes met those of an elderly man named Herman Crowley sitting in one of the corner booths. There was something familiar in his eyes, a sadness almost hiding behind his thick lenses and bushy gray eyebrows. Rough day on the road? He asked me once after we struck up a conversation about life on the open highway. Yeah, I told him, thinking back to those claw marks from earlier. But it's just another day's work. I heard there have been some crimes around these parts lately. Herman added nonchalantly over his steaming coffee. What kind of crimes? Gruesome ones. What was left behind at each scene were dismembered limbs discarded as though they meant nothing. Herman whispered carefully so that others wouldn't overhear us. My heart clenched as he continued spilling details. Stories of people going missing or being found brutally murdered around our area all hinting towards a possible link between this series of morbid events. At that moment, I couldn't put my finger on it, but I had a nagging feeling that what he shared was all connected. Nevertheless, I wished Herman well and returned to my truck. As I drove off into the night, his words echoed in my mind. 
Hours went by when I finally stopped for some rest on a quiet stretch of Interstate 76. It was nearing one o'clock in the morning when there came a soft tapping at my door, a jagged and unfamiliar sound. Cautiously, I unhooked my seatbelt, clutching the large tire iron I always kept close by for emergency purposes. I swung open the door only to stumble upon a horrific sight, a dismembered hand lying on the ground beside my parked truck. As quickly as possible, I jumped back inside and locked all the doors while dialing 911. My heart pounded furiously in my chest while I told the dispatcher about this gruesome discovery. With adrenaline coursing through my veins, I left the eerily dark surrounding area and hurried back onto the highway. That day stayed with me long after authorities investigated the incident but found no concrete leads. It seems somewhere out there still lurks an unspeakable terror, invoking fear amongst those it hunts. Was it some human serial killer, or perhaps something more sinister lurking beneath our comprehension? Regardless of what it was, I knew deep down that our paths would inevitably cross again someday. Suddenly, there was a sharp knock on my passenger door. I swung open the passenger door, bracing myself for another gruesome sight. But instead, I was greeted by a sweaty teenager with tangled hair and wild eyes. He gasped for air as he collapsed onto the passenger's seat. I quickly stepped in and closed the door after him. Please, you've got to help me. He panicked, arms flailing. I saw it. I saw that thing. It's in there, man. As I tried to calm him down, he described what he had witnessed, clawed limbs emerging from the darkness at the truck stop owner's office. They had torn apart two employees before disappearing back into the darkness. His recount of their engorged white skin and pulse-pounding veins sent shivers down my spine as I realized that this might be the work of our mysterious antagonist. At his insistence, we hurried back to the scene of the crime, with dread tightening around my throat like a noose. The truck stop had become completely silent. No one else dared approach its eerie perimeter. We cautiously entered the ravaged office, where splatters of blood and torn flesh covered every surface like macabre graffiti. Time seemed to slow down as we took in the horrifying scene. Looking back now, it feels like it happened around 3.45 a.m. on that same night. In an adjacent room, we discovered a secret display case filled with newspaper clippings. Every one of them reported on gruesome incidents around this very area. Every story pointed to our twisted antagonist. Gathering our courage, we decided to track down this merciless killer before he claimed any more lives. Guided by moonlight and adrenaline, we followed faint trails of blood through dense woods behind the truck stop. As we crept along carefully and silently through the shadows, I began to discern a monstrous figure standing motionless among rotten leaves and tangled branches, its head bowed as if in mourning. It appeared humanoid, yet its limbs seemed more like tendrils that oozed a sickly gray liquid. Its body was covered in white, bloated skin, and pulsating veins ran up and down its entire length. The sight made my stomach churn, my fear transforming into a horrific fascination. I knew we were way out of our depths here. It wasn't human. My hands shook, but I held them steady as we slowly backed away from the grotesque figure, careful not to alert it to our presence. But then... As if sensing my terror, it turned its head to fix an impossibly black gaze directly at me. Its eyes were endless voids, swallowing any semblance of hope. It let out a guttural screech that chilled me to the bone and surged toward us with inhuman speed. We sprinted away in sheer terror, our only thought being to escape the fiendish grasp of this creature from hell. As we stumbled back into the truck stop parking lot, 
The sun was just beginning to rise, signaling that it must have been close to 6.30 a.m. by then. We heaved gasping breaths of relief at having narrowly avoided meeting the same fate as its previous victims. I promised the teenager, whose name was Nate, that I would notify the authorities, and they would put a stop to this nightmare. With heavy hearts and shaking hands, we went our separate ways that fateful morning, praying that no one else would meet this gruesome fate. But with every passing day, I've come to realize that this creature cannot be killed or captured. It remains out there, lurking in the shadows and feasting on innocent souls while evading capture at every turn. Our encounter has left me tormented, wondering if maybe some horrors are never meant to be vanquished and nightmares like these will forever haunt those who dare cross their paths. As I lay sleepless every night, I can't help but wonder if there will ever come a day when the cycle of violence is broken, when humanity can come to terms with the unspeakable evil that dwells among us and find a way to end its soul-crushing reign of terror. But until that day comes, we who have seen its face must live with the knowledge that unspeakable malevolence walks among us, and the weight of that realization is unbearable. There I was, driving through the eerily quiet hills of Yellowstone County, Montana, on a perfectly ordinary Wednesday. Call me Sentel Krieger. Most folks do. No one could have guessed what would transpire that bone-chilling evening. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary. Rolling hills, winding roads, and an empty sky above. As a truck driver, I'd grown used to long stretches of silence and being alone with my thoughts. But I hadn't chosen this life for myself. It was just something that fell into my lap. In the rearview mirror, I saw headlights approaching from behind. A convoy of 18-wheelers roared past me, taking advantage of the open road until they disappeared over the horizon. In the blink of an eye, everything went haywire. My radio crackled to life and spouted unintelligible noises, static mixed with what sounded like garbled voices. Squinting out into the darkness, I caught a glimpse of something moving alongside my truck's passenger window. Out of nowhere, parked cars were haphazardly strewn around in disarray at a rest stop just outside Billings city limits. The windows of all these vehicles were shattered, and trails of blood smeared across the pavement, as if whatever happened here had been dragged away. Panicked whispers bounced through my ears from walkie-talkies abandoned on the ground. Code blue, missing persons, dangerous creature. Suddenly, I felt like I had stumbled upon something monumental, something beyond comprehension. The name, Olmstead, echoed through these chilling airwaves. A lost hunter hailing from some faraway stretch of Montana or Wyoming countryside? Or maybe something far more sinister, a heartless serial killer or even a paranormal predator preying on the unsuspecting? Laughter permeated the air as figures cloaked in darkness appeared on either side of my vehicle. They looked almost human but grotesquely twisted, with limbs contorted at bizarre angles. Their faces were a seething mess of flesh peeled back to reveal gnashing teeth and hollow eye sockets. Trying to steady my resolve, I reached for the gun tucked under my seat, but my hands trembled uncontrollably. The first few shots missed these hellish beings entirely, but in a last desperate attempt to defend myself, I mustered the courage to take aim once more. A bullet pierced through one of their heads, causing it to crumble into dust. Terrified, I attempted to flee. I managed to catch snatches of conversation between the other creatures as they pursued me, their hollow voices revealing a cryptic message regarding an ancient history tied closely with the region wherein they dwelled. 
But as I raced further away from that grisly scene, swerving through the traffic and fighting to keep my sanity in check, something within me prevented total comprehension of their true meaning, the chilling curse that plagues our lands and the people who dwell nearby. Having emerged from that hellish encounter by breaking free from their grasp, I spent the following days piecing together what I could learn about a mysterious figure named Olmsted. I dug through local archives, spoke to people who had lived in the area for decades, and scoured the internet for some clues. One afternoon, as I reviewed my findings at a small diner, a waitress noticed my research and struck up a conversation. Olmstead, huh? She said, her voice hesitant. That's a name locals don't much like to talk about. I encouraged her to tell me more. Her face paled as she glanced around nervously. Then she whispered, Legend has it that Olmstead was once human, but he made a pact with dark powers for immortality and has been cursed ever since. He performs twisted experiments and preys on hapless victims. I pressed for details of his appearance. She took a deep breath and replied in hushed tones, those who've survived encounters describe him as unnaturally tall with limbs that twist like gnarled tree branches. His eyes are an empty black void, and his skin is so black it seems to swallow any light. On Wednesday at 10.13 p.m., buoyed by my research discoveries, I located Olmsted's hidden lair deep within the hills of Yellowstone County. To my horror, I found the mangled remains of people, or what used to be people, experiments gone awry in his quest for wicked knowledge. In one corner lay a mutilated creature with four legs fused together at the torso. Each limb clawed at the air as if begging for death. Its face was nothing more than concave pits where its eyes should have been and a gaping hole where its mouth once was. There were other unrecognizable creatures scattered throughout the dark chamber, victims who had suffered at the hands of Olmsted. But then I found something worse. In another room were freshly killed victims, their faces contorted in perpetual cries of anguish and disbelief. Their bodies were forcibly merged, their organs spilling out into a grotesque tableau. It seemed like Olmsted had been preparing them for some darker purpose. Sickened and enraged, I realized that merely escaping him couldn't end the nightmare. People deserve justice, and it was up to me to do it. I gathered all the remaining explosives from my truck and rigged them around Olmsted's lair. Then I did what no one before me had dared to do. On Thursday at 1.45 a.m., under the cover of night, I confronted Olmsted himself. His towering form passed beyond every shadow in the depths of his lair. And his face, a face that seemed to consume everything around it as if darkness itself was consuming the room. Your reign of terror is over. I proclaimed as I brandished my weapon at him. A low growl emanated from the disturbing entity and with an unnerving speed nearly impossible for anything human-like to achieve, he attacked. Dodging his elongated limbs, I tried to find openings when his guard was down. The fight was brutal. My arms ached from deflecting wild swings that would have likely disemboweled me with a single hit. In a rare moment of clarity amidst the chaos, I realized that killing Olmsted wasn't my goal. It felt impossible anyway. Instead, my purpose was to put an end to his sick experiments and victim suffering. Before he could strike again, I activated the explosives tucked away in my jacket pocket. The blast knocked us both off our feet, but it did its job. The walls crumbled around us. Thick smoke filled the air as evidence of Olmsted's twisted life disappeared amidst flickering flames. With a furious bellow, Olmsted vanished into the smoke-darkened night. Despite my injuries, I limped away from the chaos. 
The sound of sirens filled my ears as emergency responders approached the site. As I sank into unconsciousness, I felt a strange peace. Though Olmsted hadn't perished, his ability to harm innocent people had been destroyed, at least temporarily. If he ever dared return, we would stand against him. The light of our community would challenge his darkness. That may be enough for now. The sun dipped below the horizon as a disquieting chill settled over Devil's Ridge, Arkansas. It was my first transport run along this route, unaware that today would lead to a chilling encounter beyond my wildest nightmares. The ominous silence suffocated everything around me as I drove along the winding road in the dense wilderness. My name is Erasmus Keller and I've been a truck driver for over 20 years now. My usual routes were uneventful, but this new change of scenery, followed by an unwelcome feeling of unease, was starting to get under my skin. I had to deliver these goods by morning, so putting up with the eerie atmosphere was my only choice. Halfway through Devil's Ridge came an unexpected roadblock. A fallen tree lay in my path. I got out of the truck and tried to move it on my own with no luck. Frustration soon turned into panic as the fading light revealed deep gashes etched into the bark. This wasn't just some coincidence. Something powerful had done this. A group of hikers approached from behind, giving me some sense of relief until they told me about a string of unsettling disappearances on Devil's Ridge. They theorized that. The Ridgeside Ripper, a notorious serial killer rumored to be active again, might be responsible. My blood ran cold as their words echoed through my mind. With no other option, we held an impromptu strategy meeting under one hiker's flashlight. Amelia, a crimson-haired woman with piercing blue eyes, was our natural leader and quickly set us to task work together to move the tree and reach safety as quickly as possible. We struggled as one unit against the weight of that massive oak trunk when, all at once, unnerving growls broke through the darkness around us. The growls morphed into sinister laughter, and then an ear-piercing scream like nails on a blackboard. A wild frenzy of adrenaline coursed through me. I knew the Ridgeside Ripper was among us. In the chaos, Amelia shouted orders, trying to organize our retreat. We scrambled towards the truck, desperate for shelter, while our world devolved into sheer terror. Hernando, a burly beard-wearing hiker, met a gruesome fate. His body was torn apart with surgical precision by unknown hands. Blood splattered everywhere as we struggled to contain our horror and continue. As we piled into the truck, hearts pounding and hands gripping weapons tightly, I slammed the door shut behind me, locking out the malicious laughter that echoed throughout Devil's Ridge. I floored the gas pedal and raced through the dark night, leaving behind a trail of devastation wrought by an unseen force. Days later, news reports flooded in about more deaths at Devil's Ridge. The killer remained at large. No weapon was found, and no witnesses were left alive to describe him accurately. The identity of the Ridgeside Ripper remained a chilling mystery. Forever haunted by that night and by Amelia's parting words as she vanished into the shadows. Hold on to your life tightly, for darkness will engulf us all. Since that horrific night, I haven't been able to sleep properly. Every time I closed my eyes, I'd see Hernando's body mutilated beyond recognition. Amelia's haunting words played in my mind like a broken record, taunting me to the edge of madness. I knew I had to do something, anything, to bring closure to this chilling tale and expose the identity of the Ridgeside Ripper. 
Over the next couple of days, the hikers moved on, all except Amelia. Our shared experience ignited a fierce determination within her. She suggested we team up and comb the wilderness surrounding Devil's Ridge for clues. We both longed for justice and wanted our lives back, free from fear. Together, we mapped out every inch of Devil's Ridge, all while remaining ever vigilant for signs of imminent danger. We collected any potential evidence. A rusted knife buried behind a rock, scattered bones deep in brushwood, tattered clothing snag on barbed branches. We spent hours in local records offices and scoured old newspapers, piecing together a chilling profile of the Ridgeside Ripper. Our research led us to eyewitness accounts that seemed too bizarre to be true yet appeared consistently throughout history. Witnesses described the killer as tall, thin, and unnaturally agile, with ghastly facial scars that twisted into an eternal leer of malice. Our detailed timeline led us to one fateful afternoon when everything changed. With trembling hands clutching our makeshift weapons, we trudged toward the heart of Devil's Ridge. Trapped beneath a canopy of twisted branches, we blotted out any sunlight and cast an eerie gloom over our surroundings. Then we saw it, a dilapidated shack buried deep within the ominous woods. Its warped walls strained against rusted nails as if screaming out in pain. Cautiously, we approached the sinister dwelling. As we stepped over the threshold and entered the dank, rotting interior, the air turned heavy. The walls were covered in crude drawings of mutilated bodies and unsettling symbols scrawled in dried blood. That's when we heard it, a guttural snarl followed closely by that sinister laughter we'd come to dread. We shivered with fear as the ridgeside ripper revealed himself. He was taller than any human had the right to be, his skeletal frame cloaked in a filthy, tattered coat that once might have been white. His face, God, his face, was a mangled mess of scars, as if he'd willingly torn it apart and stitched it back together. His eyes gleamed like those of a predator stalking its prey. The urge to flee consumed me, but Amelia remained defiant. We know who you are, she screamed. You won't hurt anyone else ever again. The thing that was once a man merely laughed in return. He darted forward with inhuman speed and, to our horror, impaled Amelia on his outstretched hand sharp fingers piercing through her chest like daggers. I'll never forget her anguished scream or the manic glee in the ridgeside ripper's eyes as I stumbled backward from the scene before me. The ripper licked his fingers, savoring his grotesque treat while locking eyes with mine. He dropped Amelia's lifeless body to the ground and lunged at me. Sobbing with terror, I managed to dodge just enough for him to miss my heart. His claws ripped through my shoulder instead. In agony and disbelief at my own survival, I sprinted through the woods back toward civilization, my tormentor's horrifying laughter echoing behind me. Three days later, I'm covered in bandages and still reeling from the trauma of it all. News reports about Amelia's discovery have sent shockwaves throughout Devil's Ridge, but the Ridgeside Ripper remains at large. Even now, sleep escapes me. Each moment that passes is consumed by anxiety, knowing that he's still out there and he'll never be stopped. But maybe, just maybe, the fact that I survived the encounter will be enough to make other victims feel less alone. Because in the end, we're all bound by one haunting truth. The Ridgeside Ripper cannot be killed, only contained within our darkest nightmares. As I peered out the window of my truck, I couldn't help but notice the lingering heaviness that seemed to have blanketed Bitterroot Valley, Montana. 
The morning air was still thick with the faint scent of rain that had yet to fall. My name is Lachlan Merritt, and I've been a truck driver for the best part of 20 years now. This job has taken me down roads less traveled, and in that relentless pursuit of adventure, I stumbled upon a chilling secret. It was an otherwise typical Tuesday, and like any other day, my first stop was at a small diner just off Highway 93, an unassuming little spot frequented by weary travelers and solitary truckers like myself. Its greasy spoon charm had always felt welcoming enough, but something about the atmosphere on that particular day felt off. My attention was soon drawn to a group of locals huddled together in whispered conversation. Their serious faces reflected unease as they exchanged stories of recent activity in the area. Try as I might to eavesdrop discreetly, it wasn't until one of them, Eloise McCoy, a shopkeeper I'd become friendly with, noticed me listening and reluctantly came clean. She told me about a series of grisly incidents plaguing Bitterroot Valley, from mutilated livestock to gruesome discoveries made by hunters in the nearby woods. Though each account varied slightly, one element remained consistent through every retelling, a mysterious presence lurking within the forest's depths. That evening's cargo drop-off was deep into Timberland territory, something I hadn't given much thought to before. But as those chilling tales circulated in my mind like an icy gust of wine through the trees, my normal route became increasingly unnerving. Sunset arrived quickly as the surrounding forest grew denser and cast shadows that further fueled my unease. It was then that something stepped out onto the narrow road up ahead, a man or something bearing a close resemblance. This disheveled figure, with hollow eyes and a gaunt face smeared in crimson, stared at my truck approaching him. Frantically rummaging in a tattered bag, he produced an object that gleamed ominously under my headlights, a hunting knife. My heart pounded against my chest as I hit the brakes. But when my eyes narrowed to focus on this ghastly apparition, it seemed to dissipate into the foliage without a sound. The moment felt like an eternity, but with no evidence before me, I chalked it up to nerves and continued down the now eerie path. Fingers gripping the wheel and senses on high alert, I struggled to shake off the adrenaline coursing through me. As I set my gaze on the remainder of my journey, an unsettling truth emerged from between the trees, someone or something was following me. At seemingly random intervals along those winding roads, the grotesque figure would emerge for just long enough to remind me that he was not alone. Was it the infamous Bitterroot Slayer? Or maybe a deranged stalker preying on unsuspecting truckers? Regardless of who or what it was, my only goal was survival. The oppressive darkness toyed with my instincts with every nerve-wracking curve in the road. Was that bloodthirsty figure within reach or simply lurking behind me? I gripped tightly onto my sidearm stuffed in the glove box as fear slithered down my spine. In what felt like a final attempt to evade this monstrous stalker, I swerved around an upcoming bend with forceful determination, and then I escaped onto a scarcely populated dirt road that seemed like my only hope of survival. As I drove further into the unfamiliar terrain, an overpowering odor dominated my senses. It was the unmistakable stench of death. Parked along the side of the road was a makeshift campsite, littered with debris and what appeared to be human remains. The victims were mutilated beyond recognition, their skin marred by deep lacerations and missing chunks of flesh. The thunderous roar of an engine suddenly snapped me out of my shocked stupor. In my rearview mirror, I spotted an old and battered pickup truck barreling toward me with reckless abandon. In plain view, on a crude rack mounted on the hood of his truck, was a collection of large, rusty knives that looked like they had been used recently. 
Panicked, I slammed on the gas pedal and sped off deeper into the woods, desperate to escape my twisted pursuer. The pickup truck stayed on my tail relentlessly as I maneuvered through tight curves and avoided fallen trees at breakneck speeds. I experienced the feeling of being the prey of an unstoppable predator as we sped through shallow streams and over rocks. Despite my adrenaline-fueled efforts to evade capture, the mysterious figure caught up to me at an abrupt fork in the road. His face was now clearly visible, a pallid visage framed by matted hair that stuck to his head like a ragged mop. Scars crisscrossed his face in grotesque patterns while his eyes appeared devoid of humanity. He taunted me as we faced off amidst the encroaching darkness, our vehicles idling inches from one another with their high beams slicing through the night air. You done running, boy? He snarled as he clutched his steering wheel with white-knuckled intensity. Knowing that it was now or never, I decided to take matters into my own hands. I shoved open the door to my truck and, gripping my sidearm tight, aimed it squarely at my adversary's twisted face. The end of the line, you sick daughter of a whore! I shouted, my voice cracking from a mixture of rage and terror. To my surprise, he threw his head back and emitted an eerie cackle that seemed to reverberate throughout the forest. You've got some fire in you, boy. But so do I. He spat before reaching for something I couldn't see, an assault rifle that had been concealed between his legs. With no time left to react, both of us squeezed our triggers in near unison. The cacophony of gunfire deafened our ears as bullets shredded through the intervening space. In what could only be described as a stroke of luck, one of my rounds found its mark in the precarious location on the psychotic man's head, causing his truck to veer off course and into an ancient tree with resounding force. Miraculously unharmed by the barrage of bullets that had come uncomfortably close to ending my life, I crawled back into my vehicle and raced away from the grisly scene as fast as my weary legs could carry me. With adrenaline surging through every fiber of my being, I managed to navigate through the narrow trail until I reached the familiar glow of civilization off in the distance. The next morning, local authorities investigated the scene where carnage had unraveled in Bitterroot Valley seemingly unremarkable terrain. The mysterious figure was still alive despite grave injuries losing a considerable portion of his skull but still clinging to life, much like a twisted avatar of pure malevolence that refused to die. As they pieced together what they could from this gruesome scene while fending off their revulsion, one thing became chillingly clear. These sinister happenings in Bitterroot Valley were just the beginning of something far darker and more sinister than any of us could have ever imagined, and whoever, or whatever, was responsible for it all seemed beyond the reach of mortal constraints. Even now, as I drive my truck down some forgotten highway with a heavy heart and an uneasiness that lingers with me always, I can't help but wonder, will I ever be truly free from the shadow of fear cast by the villainous figure I encountered that fateful evening in Bitterroot Valley? Only time will tell. I just arrived at a small truck stop in Texarkana, Arkansas, that had gained an infamously eerie reputation among us truckers. They called it the Void. Rumor had it that those who parked on the west side of the lot would experience odd things that just didn't make sense. As a skeptic, I didn't buy the stories one bit, but curiosity got the better of me. As I walked into the dimly lit diner connected to the truck stop, I took my seat next to a rather gruff-looking guy who was nursing his coffee. We exchanged pleasantries, and I couldn't help but ask if he'd ever spent time on the west side of this lot. 
You a skin about that strange stuff people talk about? He asked with a raspy laugh. I can't say I put much stock in it either, but between you and me. He leaned in closer and whispered. I saw something last week that made my blood run cold. The man introduced himself as Reuben Stalson. He began his tale about how, after finishing his meal and stepping outside for a smoke break, he'd spotted something lurking at the edge of the woods near the void. It had appeared to be a man, or so he thought, with unusually long limbs and unnerving movements. Despite this bone-chilling experience, Reuben still wasn't convinced it was anything more than some drunkard. This world has plenty of twisted souls, Reuben conceded with a surly tone, looking into his cigarette smoke as if searching for words. After some time, we decided to head back to our respective trucks for some shut-eye, thinking little of Reuben's unnerving story. Later that night, as darkness enveloped the truck stop around me, I awoke to an odd scratching sound outside my cab door. Worried it might be someone trying to break in, I grabbed my handgun and slowly turned the lock. Pushing the door open, I quickly stepped out, ready to confront whoever was on the other side. And then my heart dropped. Standing just a few feet away from me was what I assumed to be the same figure Reuben had described. It looked almost human, yet something was terribly off about the creature. It was so unnatural, with elongated limbs and eerily slow movements. Its face was twisted and disfigured, fixed in a terrifying, eager smile. It stared at me, its eyes devoid of emotion. I raised my gun, trying to steady my shaking hands. The beast stopped in its tracks but barely flinched as I fired a warning shot just inches from its ghastly face. What do you want? Who are you? I yelled as sweat beads dripped down my neck. The creature let out an inhuman wail that pierced the night like a razor blade through flesh. My legs suddenly grew weak, nearly buckling beneath me. Just then, Reuben's truck door flew open, and he slammed shut his cabin with immense force. Without so much as a word or even a glance back toward that horrifying figure, he started his truck and sped off into the night. As for me, not wanting to stay a second longer, I jumped back into my truck. As I fumbled for the keys in sheer panic and dread, something dawned on me. This creature didn't necessarily appear aggressive or intent on harming me. In fact, I almost sensed a hint of hesitation in its grotesque movements. Was it looking for something or someone? I pushed my fear aside and decided to take an unorthodox approach. Slowly lowering my gun, I spoke calmly to the creature. Look, I don't know who you are or what you want, but let's try talking this out. The creature tilted its head slightly, with its mouth twitching as if it were considering my words. After what seemed like an eternity, its twisted grin disappeared and was replaced with an odd expression of acceptance. My name is Malcolm. It finally rasped in something barely resembling a human voice. I stood there dumbfounded as the creature began to tell me its tale. A vengeful man named Harold came seeking revenge on another truck driver he believed was responsible for his brother's death in a fiery accident years ago. Harold decided to take matters into his own hands and dabbled in black magic to bring his deceased brother back, only for the spell to backfire catastrophically, turning him into the monstrosity before me now. As it turns out, Malcolm hadn't intended any harm toward Reuben or me. He just sought release from his tormented existence. My pity stirred, I gritted my teeth and I asked the single question that would change our lives forever. Is there anything I can do to help? He stared at me for a moment longer before muttering an incantation that could reverse the curse. Determined that Malcolm's suffering should end, 
I agreed and quickly etched the spell onto a spare sheet of paper. I read it aloud three times, bracing myself as Malcolm trembled violently. His elongated limbs seemed to twist and shrink, his body contorting like a ship lost in the stormy sea. Malcolm's agonizing howls echoed through the night, causing fellow truckers to stir and stare wide-eyed at one another. But then, as suddenly as it began, the whine ceased, and a silence fell over the void. Before me stood an ordinary man, exhausted yet undeniably grateful. As we exchanged looks of disbelief, an air of guilt weighed on me. How long had I doubted this creature's existence, only to have its tragic fate resting in my hands all along? Thank you, he whispered. Working together, we painstakingly concealed every trace of the spell's components and made our way back to our respective trucks. Despite Malcolm's newfound freedom, I knew that he still carried a great weight on his shoulders. He faced a long road ahead, a road toward redemption for his past sins. Malcolm expressed his desire to return home and make amends for what he had done under Harold's control. As we exchanged nods of farewell that night under the haunting Texarkana moonlight, I knew it would be a long time before I ever dismissed the story as unbelievable as the void again. I won't know whether Malcolm found peace or if the truth about the curse ever reaches anyone else but us. Still, each time my eastbound ten takes me through Texarkana, my mind drifts back to that eerie night and the twisted entity that managed to find salvation, its haunting gaze still ever-present in my memories. Some mysteries are better left unsolved, except those where life hangs in the balance. And it's in those moments when this world throws wicked twists in our direction that I'm reminded of a simple truism. No monster is beyond redemption, no matter how grotesque their shackles may seem. Weaving down Route 89 in Arizona, I was hauling a load of electronics headed for Flagstaff. The last rays of sunlight streaked across the desert landscape, casting eerie shadows on the barren wasteland before me. I experienced a strange sense of comfort in the solitude these desolate stretches of highway offered while listening to the engine's rhythmic hum and feeling the gentle sway of my 18-wheeler. My phone chimed, rousing me from my reverie. It was a text from my cousin Alaric Bentham, warning me about recent reports of truck drivers disappearing without a trace on this very road. Gazing out into the encroaching darkness, I scoffed at what seemed like just another urban legend. Little did I know that tonight would be like no other in my life. Three hours into my journey, I pulled into a desolate truck stop in Chino Valley to catch some sleep. As I walked toward the restroom facilities, a haggard old man approached me with wild eyes and frayed clothes, his arms flailing fervently. You've got to get out of here, he rasped as he grabbed my arm. It's not safe. They're coming for us. His hysteria unnerved me. It wasn't the usual demeanor displayed by truck stop regulars. However, sleep deprivation had taken its toll on me, and I chalked his crazed warnings up to drugs or some sort of mental issue. I gently removed myself from his grip and continued toward the restrooms. Later that night, as sleep evaded me within the cramped confines of my truck cabin, I heard something disturbing. Screams nearby sounded like pure terror. Curiosity tugged at me, and I clambered out onto the pavement to investigate. In the dim light cast by distant street lamps, I saw several men in hooded cloaks dragging one of my fellow truckers toward an unmarked white van at the edge of the truck stop. My heart raced as panic gripped me, but I fought to remain level-headed. 
I snapped a few pictures of them with my phone and dialed 911, hoping for a response. The police arrived, but it was too late. The hooded figures and their abductees had vanished without a trace. The officers tried to reassure me that they would find the mysterious assailants. Yet, deep down, I couldn't shake the nagging sense that there was far more to this horrifying experience than met the eye. Days later, Alaric explained what he had discovered about those strange hooded men. They were part of an underground cult called Silent Angels, notorious for abducting and torturing victims as part of their twisted beliefs. No one knew why they targeted truckers specifically, and any further details remained shrouded in mystery. Although some time has passed since that harrowing night in Chino Valley, I can't escape from the memory of those depraved individuals or the tormented screams of their victims. The sinister world I'd unwittingly stumbled upon now haunted every mile on the road. What frightens me most is the knowledge that somewhere out there, these deviant cultists still hunt unsuspecting travelers on desolate highways. And as I continue my midnight journeys across this vast country, I find myself constantly peering through the darkness, dreading another ominous encounter with those cruel angels who serve only misery and terror. My instincts told me to keep my distance and mind my own business, but I couldn't let go of those people I'd seen being dragged away. Deep down, I knew I had to do something. Over the next few days, I began digging into the Silent Angel's cult further, hoping to find some lead that would point me toward their underlying motive or even their whereabouts. During a stop in Prescott, I met another trucker named Mark who claimed he'd escaped an abduction by the cult just a week before. They have a hidden compound in the Black Canyon. He whispered with a quivering voice, clenching his cup of cold coffee tightly in his hands. Feeling uneasy but determined, I decided to venture out into Black Canyon after my evening shift. Armed with my trusty flashlight and grappling hook, I trekked deep into the canyon under the cover of darkness. Hours passed before I found it, an old warehouse camouflaged by decaying foliage. My heart raced as I snuck inside, hoping to find some clue that might save those unfortunate souls. The stench hit me immediately, a mixture of decay and despair that made me want to gag. Dim lights illuminated rows of cages containing the cult's victims. Their eyes were hollow and defeated. Some were bruised and bloodied beyond recognition. Gaining courage from their desperate gazes, I forged ahead and discovered a room with detailed plans outlining some macabre ritual. Before I could read more, footsteps echoed along the narrow hallway. Panicking, I swiftly slipped back into the shadows and observed as two hooded figures entered, one bearing grisly scars all over his face, the other clearly acting as his subordinate. Scarface began brutalizing an unconscious victim hanging from the ceiling as the clock struck 9 p.m., seemingly for pleasure rather than any religious reason. Suddenly overwhelmed with fury, I leaped out of hiding brandishing my grappling hook and lunging at Scarface. His grunt of surprise was quickly silenced as I smashed the hook into his grotesque visage. He staggered back, blood streaming from between his fingers as he clutched at his mangled face. His right-hand man lunged at me, but I managed to jab him in the ribs with my flashlight and send both of them sprawling. Seizing the moment, I dashed through the warehouse and tripped the alarm system, praying it would attract help. As sirens wailed in the distance, I released as many victims as possible before scrambling out of the building. Police descended upon the compound shortly after but found the injured cultists had slipped away. Despite having done my best to rescue those people, a sickening feeling gnawed at me. 
I could still see Scarface's twisted smile burned into my brain as he stumbled away. Although local authorities recognized my efforts to unravel the Silent Angel's dark world, there were still no answers about their motives or how far their reach went. Days turned into weeks, strengthening my resolve to put an end to their horror. Each night, as I traversed the lonely roads searching for missing truckers and potential leads, a cold silence enveloped me like never before. The Silent Angels, twisted monsters wearing human skin, still lived on in darkness as they inflicted suffering upon innocent souls. Every shadow seemed to whisper their name, and every unknown noise sent shivers down my spine. Though I may never obliterate their existence or find all those missing truckers, my tenacity refused to falter. And each time I stared out into the cold void of the night, weary eyes searched for hidden evils lurking beyond, unwilling to relent until no other suffered at the hands of those soulless fiends called silent angels. It was a sweltering summer afternoon in Winslow, Arizona, and I just finished unloading cargo at a warehouse on the outskirts of town. My name is Bastian Lockhart, and I've been a truck driver for over ten years. As I climbed back into my rig to depart for my next delivery, I received a phone call from my buddy Delmore, who worked at the same company as I did. Hey Bastian! Have you heard about what happened to Kirk? He asked. Not really, I replied, wiping the sweat from my brow. Any trouble? He never made his delivery last night. Delmore informed me worriedly. Nobody's seen or heard from him since he left. They found his truck abandoned off Route 180. The truck was empty and damaged like something had smashed into it. As the conversation progressed, an uneasy feeling started bubbling within me. Drivers disappearing wasn't something new, but the gruesome details got worse each time I heard about another inexplicable disappearance. Is this some sort of serial killer like the infamous, Road Ripper, stalking us? Or maybe something even more sinister and surreal? The following week, the wildest news began circulating. Several drivers attested they'd encountered an immense beast that had darted across their truck's headlights late in the evening hours. Some claimed it looked like an oversized coyote or hellhound with glowing red eyes and immense strength. Bullshit! Delmore scoffed when we discussed these stories at a local diner. Probably some widows in costume toying with us. I raised an eyebrow, sipping my coffee. I don't know, man. Kirk's disappearance doesn't sit right with me. Late one night, while driving through Holbrook near Petrified Forest National Park, I found myself doubting everything that had made sense to me until then. The moon seemed blood red, and darkness suffocated my surroundings. I glanced at a road sign warning of elk crossings when I argued with myself about whether I should believe in the supernatural or just focus on the task at hand. That's when a massive shape darted in front of me. I slammed the brakes, barely avoiding the bulky beast that had appeared. It was covered in matted fur, reeking of decay, with snarling red eyes glaring at me from a horribly twisted canine face. Panicking, I floored the accelerator and sped off towards civilization as fast as my rig could carry me. The creature sprinted alongside my truck for a while, growling and snapping its jaws as if trying to rip into the steel chassis to get to me. After several agonizing moments, it gradually lost interest, or maybe chose potential prey or victims elsewhere. Whatever the case, it vanished into the shadows of the desolate landscape. When I finally got back home, 
I started researching legends from the area, which eventually led me to some blood-curdling stories about skinwalkers, evil shamans who were believed to assume animal forms and terrorize locals searching for victims in their sinister path. You're saying you came face to face with a skinwalker? Delmore exclaimed in disbelief when we met up again, and I told him about my encounter. Man, I wouldn't want to be around here when that creature comes back. The next few weeks were filled with nerve-wracking uncertainties and dread. Nobody could say for certain whether this was all an elaborate hoax or if there truly was a malevolent force hunting truck drivers. Then one night at an isolated gas station, I decided to take matters into my own hands and investigate these bizarre events. I couldn't shake the feeling that the skinwalker was responsible for all the truck driver disappearances and that it was only a matter of time before it struck again. I began staying up late, staking out truck stops and deserted highways in hopes of catching a glimpse of the creature. It was during one of these stakeouts, a Thursday at 11.37 p.m., that I finally saw it again. It moved between the trees, stealthy and agile despite its massive size. The red eyes glowed in the moonlight as it stalked towards an unsuspecting truck driver taking a break outside his vehicle. I knew this was my chance to save a life. I sprinted from my hiding spot, screaming at both the skinwalker and the trucker. Run! I yelled, hoping to buy the driver enough time. The creature wheeled around on me its hideous snarl revealing snaggletooth fangs dripping with saliva. Its matted fur stunk like a rotting carcass left in the sun for days. Those red orbs stared straight into my soul as they prepared to pounce. I braced myself for impact, but in that crucial moment, another truck driver intervened by shooting at the abomination with his shotgun. The deafening blast echoed through the night air as Buckshot tore into its mangled flesh. The skinwalker howled in pain but did not fall. Instead, it hissed and backed away, then vanished into the darkness once more. The two drivers stood gaping at me with wide-eyed fear and questions on their lips. They didn't understand what had just transpired or why their comrade had vanished in front of them in an instant. Overwhelmed by gratitude that I'd managed to save someone, I sat down with these men to tell them everything, all about my own encounter with the skinwalker and the legends I'd discovered. They were initially skeptical, but ultimately, they admitted that something sinister was at play. They asked me what we could do to put an end to this reign of terror, and truthfully, I didn't have an answer for them. Skinwalkers were not creatures you could hunt to a corner. They lurked in the shadows and struck when you least expected it. So instead of finding a way to kill it or trap it, we decided to band together and spread the word throughout our community. We shared our stories with others and urged them to remain vigilant, taking necessary precautions like never traveling alone at night and keeping their truck cabins locked. As days turned into weeks, no more drivers disappeared. Reports of strange sightings still happened occasionally, but no one else fell prey to the beast, which seemed to have retreated from us for now. In the end, we knew we couldn't defeat this ancient evil. However, we learned that as long as we stood strong together, sharing knowledge and warning others so they could successfully protect themselves, we could keep its terrible influence at bay, at least for a while. The low rumble of the truck's engine echoed through the obsidian sky, leaving the world seemingly hanging in quiet suspense. Georgie Saskin, that's me. I pulled my truck over at the roadside park on Route 79 near Tohoka, Texas, 
not knowing that I would experience something that would baffle and terrify me to my very core. My intention was simple, grab a snack, stretch my legs, and continue along my brisk midnight journey. I couldn't have known, as I grabbed my half-eaten ham sandwich from the seat beside me, that my harmless stop would turn out to be anything but. Gravel crunched underfoot as I started toward a dimly lit park bench when I noticed a small gathering huddled near a set of swings. An eerie chill swept over me as they moved about disjointedly like a group of marionettes with frayed strings. Their whispers were faintly audible against the backdrop of silence, not quite human and undeniably unsettling. Well, ain't this just cozy? remarked a grizzled trucker stepping out from behind his cap. My name is Vernon Mallory. Yeah, cozy. I agreed tentatively, still fixated on the unsettling shadowy figures in the distance. As I continued to observe their strange behavior, something inside me whispered that I should pay attention to them. They seemed drawn to a large oak tree in the park's center. Suspicion gnawed inside me. Something felt deeply wrong here. Vernon scratched his beard thoughtfully as I muttered my initial concerns under my breath. They're locals, he said quietly after a moment of hesitation. Rumor has it they're part of some cult obsessed with the Wendigo, a beast from Native American folklore said to feast on human flesh. My stomach lurched at Vernon's words as if an icy hand swiftly clenched around my heart. The Wendigo was a name I recognized from countless campfire stories but never believed to be anything more than just that, a story. Suddenly, loud screams broke the uneasy atmosphere as the unnerving group crowded the oak tree. From within the shadows emerged an emaciated creature with sickly pale skin stretched tightly over contorted limbs. A twisted caricature of a man, feral and gruesome, with eyes that glared hungrily. Vernon and I stared in pure horror as the twisted creature lunged at one of the cult members, its razor-sharp teeth sinking deep into her flesh. Blood sprayed in wild arcs as it viciously tore chunks from the poor victim's neck, leaving destruction in its wake. Fucking hell, Vernon cursed, reaching inside his cab and brandishing a hunting knife. We've got to do something. As we cautiously approached them, I couldn't help but notice the disconnect between the cult members and the monstrous beasts. They didn't seem to recognize the carnage taking place before them. In fear for our own lives, we separated from each other to try and break up the chaos unfolding around us. My heart raced wildly in my chest as I grabbed one of the blinded cult members by the collar and began shaking some sense into him. His eyes were wide with fear when he finally met my gaze. It's not supposed to be like this. He stammered. She was supposed to control it. Another scream rang out just inches before me. As the woman's lifeless body dropped to the ground, I realized that the monster standing before me was nothing like the ordinary Wendigo from the stories. This ghastly creature was much more sinister. Its skin hung from its skeletal frame like tattered cloth, pale and translucent with an ethereal luminescence. The horrifying sight of its intense, Bloodshot eyes paralyzed me when they locked onto mine. I knew that I had to do something quickly to save the remaining members of this deranged cult. They were still transfixed on the oak tree, completely oblivious to the death two inches from them. While Vernon courageously attempted to distract the creature with his knife, I focused on breaking their connection to the tree. 3.13 a.m. marked my desperate attempt to tear some sense into these people. I shook them violently, one by one, trying to make them see reason. Then I noticed a strange symbol carved into the tree. It appeared to be some form of sigil or binding charm that held their minds captive. 
I recognized this symbol from a book on rituals and dark arts that I'd read out of curiosity a few years ago. It became apparent that this cult had attracted a beast far more horrifying than your everyday Wendigo, and we needed to break the connection immediately. While thoughts raced through my mind at what felt like light speed, Vernon fought valiantly against the monster. Each second felt like hours as I tried desperately to recall anything I could about breaking these cursed bonds. Then it hit me. Fire! Vernon, do you have a lighter? I yelled over his shoulder as he dodged another violent swipe from the creature's razor-sharp claws. He threw me his Zippo lighter with surprising accuracy, despite his grave predicament. 4.02 a.m. found me beneath the thick branches of that damned oak tree, igniting small patches of rough bark until an intense flame roared before me. As the fire spread to the eerie symbol, the cult members gradually broke free from their trance. What the hell? One of them shouted, their faces dripping with a mixture of sweat and terror. You have to bind it. You have to. But before they could finish their sentence, the creature let out an ear-piercing screech that shattered any semblance of hope we once had. Its twisted form started to change dramatically, like a grotesque metamorphosis. 5.28 a.m. marked a moment I'll never forget. The monstrous being had transformed into a more dangerous form, part Wendigo, part horror from another realm. More powerful than before and angrier than ever. We have to leave now. I yelled at Vernon. Some of the cult members attempted to chant hastily prepared binding spells while others fled in terror. Vernon and I exchanged glances, then we sprinted back to our trucks under the cloak of darkness as that creature let out an agonizing howl of defeat. The beast made no effort to pursue us as we slipped through its claws once again. As we drove away from that horrifying nightmare on Route 79 near Tohoka, Texas, my hands shook so violently that I could barely stay on the road. Do you think it's over? Vernon asked me, his voice thick with fear. For now, that thing was unable to leave the confines of that roadside park. However, deep down, I knew with chilling certainty that this was far from over. A feral part of my mind whispered to me, casting a looming shadow over my thoughts. No matter how much distance separated us from that place or that creature, what had been witnessed, who had been lost, those grisly memories would seep into our dreams and haunt us relentlessly for many years to come. Settling into the booth at Danny's Diner on Route 66, near Yukon, Oklahoma, I glanced at the old clock on the wall. It read 12.06 a.m. I had been driving for hours on my usual delivery route and decided to stop for a late-night meal. The diner was fairly crowded for that time of night. As I took a sip of my black coffee, Albert Starkweather shuffled over and took the seat across from me. He had always been an odd character in town, but we'd exchange pleasantries now and then. Hey, D'Angelo, he said with his raspy voice that hinted at years of incessant smoking. Reckon, it's a lively night at this watering hole. I furrowed my eyebrows at his choice of words but shrugged them off as typical Albert ramblings. We enjoyed our meal together, sharing small talk about local news and distant family members. As we were eating, one curious topic became evident. Some livestock had been found mutilated on the outer fringes of town. It was gruesome stuff. People whispered in hushed tones over grits and eggs. D'Angelo. Elbert said gravely as he leaned in closer to me, causing me to catch a whiff of his stale cigarette smell. There have been whispers round these parts about something sinister lurking in those same outskirts. 
Now skeptical, I leaned back in my seat and chuckled. Come on, Elbert, do you actually believe those tall tales? His eyes widened, but he held mine firm. I've never seen anything like it myself, but those stories from other truckers make you wonder. He sighed as he pushed away his plate. After finishing our meals, we parted ways, and I resumed my route through the dark Oklahoma night. Heading down an old stretch of road flanked by empty fields blended with patches of dense forest, I came upon a scene that stole my breath away. A mangled carcass of what seemed to be a calf lay on the roadside. The sheer brutality of its wounds couldn't have been the work of a normal predator. It was mutilated beyond recognition. Something about that grotesque sight sent shivers down my spine. Despite gripping the wheel so tightly that my knuckles turned white, I continued on. From the corner of my eye, I noticed continuous movement in the woods, as if something swift and agile was shadowing the truck. The further I drove, the more these unsettling occurrences intensified. Approaching an intersection, my radio suddenly crackled to life, and through distorted static, another driver's frantic voice demanded assistance. Someone help me. I'm being hunted out here. Beyond being startled by that transmission and deeply concerned for their safety, this wasn't just some random incident around Yukon. Creeping beneath my incredulity but unable to fully suppress it was an old childhood story about an ancient beast called Wendigo that terrorized helpless individuals wandering near its territory after dark. As an adult, those chilling tales always seemed far-fetched, until now. Debating whether to face whatever was out there or abandon fellow truckers to their fate, my fight-or-flight instincts abruptly flared up when a gut-wrenching scream echoed into the night, slicing through the air like rusty razors across raw flesh. That gut-wrenching scream seemed to echo endlessly as I gripped the wheel tighter. My heart pounded in my chest, and I knew instinctively that retreating wasn't an option. This fellow driver needed help, and they sounded desperate. Pushing my foot down harder on the gas, I sped toward the desperate cries, following the signal from their radio transmission. As I approached, I could see a truck pulled over on the side of the road with its hazard lights flashing and a figure lying face down on the asphalt near it. I pulled over cautiously, and my gut twisted in knots. Taking a deep breath, I stepped out of my truck and approached the driver of the other rig. He was dead, blood smeared across the ground around him from deep gashes carved into his back. It was apparent that something brutally powerful had attacked him. Suddenly, a low growl resonated from the darkness of the nearby woods. Frozen with terror for only a moment, I ran back to my truck and locked myself in. The growl grew louder as heavy footsteps approached. At that moment, an enormous creature emerged from the woods, at least eight feet tall and covered in matted fur. Its grotesque face bore sharpened teeth as it snarled menacingly at me. The thing locked eyes with me, yellow orbs in its skull clearly filled with murderous intent. The beast slammed against my windshield with brutal force. God help me. I whispered frantically as I started the engine and floored it into reverse. I sped down Route 66 in reverse at breakneck speed, trying to shake off this monstrous creature. Something caught my eye in that horrid blur. It was Albert Starkweather's truck rammed into a tree ahead of me on the side of the road. Filled with dread, I slammed on the brakes hard causing both vehicles to screech to a halt. The abrupt stop caught the creature off guard, and it fell backward into the forest's shadows. Extraction was now my only option. Shaking and uneasy, I sprinted toward Albert's damaged truck. The sight inside was chilling. Albert lay dead, his mangled body barely recognizable. 
It was clear he, too, had encountered this savage beast. Overcome with grief and terror, I knew that Yukon was no longer safe, not with this heinous monster on the loose. Jammed between Albert's lifeless fingers was an old leather-bound book. Taking it with me, I climbed back into my truck and resumed my journey down Route 66, praying that whatever evil pursued I had would not return. Back at Danny's diner in Yukon, I opened that book. It was full of lore about local creatures, Wendigos included. From what I gleaned, it seemed that Yukon rested on the precipice of hell. Some dark gate between worlds had opened here. That thing that had hunted me, Albert, was the devil in sheep's clothing all along. Over ten days have now passed, and word has spread about the nightmarish events on Route 66 near Yukon. Drivers going missing, livestock found mutilated, and people claiming to see unseen horrors stalking the shadows at night. Everyone is left terrified, locking their doors each dusk against an unknown, immortal force, a beast from another time, that comes to haunt us. One mystery remains amid all this destruction. Who sent the old man? And why did he become this harbinger of chaos? The local townspeople can only wonder and speculate. As dark clouds gather above Yukon each nightfall now. I still drive along Route 66 at night, but I'm more cautious than ever. Glancing over my shoulder more frequently, I listen for whispers of evil as they glide on the wind past these fields and dark woods. The answers to many secrets are held within Albert's leather book, although perhaps some mysteries are best left unsolved. All I know is that those who live in the town near the intersection of Route 66 must forever remain on guard, lest they, too, become prey to something unseen lurking in the shadows of Oklahoma. I still remember the first time I encountered him, which was two days ago, on June 3rd, as I was driving my truck through the desolate confines of the Mojave Desert in California. The sun had just set, and a nearly full moon illuminated the desolate landscape as far as my headlights allowed. While traversing these vast terrains may seem monotonous to some, I relished this part of my job for the peace it granted me. As I drove along the highway, miles and miles away from civilization, a crackling voice broke through on my CB radio. It was another trucker named Leroy De La Cruz. We announced our presence on this channel now and then to ward off the loneliness. Our conversation started innocently enough, just discussions about work and life on the road. But gradually, Leroy began to tell me about an unnerving encounter he'd had around this area a few years ago. He explained that while driving at night, he had pulled over in a general location in the Mojave Desert. As he did his routine checkup, he noticed something in his peripheral vision, a figure that seemed to lurk at the edge of his headlights beam. Assuming it was another weary traveler at first, he didn't pay much heed until he noticed how strangely the figure moved. Then this timid creature lummed and attacked one of his wheels savagely with some instrument Leroy couldn't quite identify. Panicking, Leroy hopped back into his truck and raced away, leaving behind any semblance of order or calm comprehension of what had just occurred. His words sent shivers down my spine as I recalled a similar event that happened almost a year ago when one of my friends returned with horrifying tales of his adventures around this same area in the Mojave Desert. As an avid stone collector who regularly trawled its depths in search of gems to add to his trove, he recently stopped sharply on June 6th after discovering that someone had maliciously scattered unusual rocks across the sand dunes close to his site.
rocks that seem to be arranged in strange patterns with inexplicable malice underlying every placement. I shook off the story, confident that I would never encounter or comprehend such insanity. Yet destiny seemed determined to prove me wrong. As I glanced up from my dashboard, something caught my eye in the distance. To my disbelief, a figure was standing by the side of the road, shrouded in darkness. Clutching tightly onto my steering wheel, I debated whether to call for help or simply race past at full speed. The decision was made for me as I approached the figure. It suddenly launched a mangled mass that smashed into the windshield. While it remained intact, this newfound obfuscation was causing my heart to race and my blood to turn cold. As I steadied myself and swerved around the mysterious figure, I couldn't help but notice through my fogged windshield its grotesque face. A patchwork of skin that appeared barely stitched together, accompanied by lifeless eyes that seemed to possess no spark of humanity within them. My fear lent wings to my vehicle as I sped away from this frightful being, whose very existence seemed like a nightmare ripped from our world's most horrifying folklore. That first glimpse of his twisted visage would haunt me for days. I still don't know who or what that creature was. Had I truly stumbled upon something malevolent lurking in the shadows of this desolate landscape? Or should Lyra's retelling be scrutinized more closely? Either way, some things are better left unexplored and some mysteries unsolved. Unfortunately for me, although this comment may seem contrary, unfortunately for me, the enigmatic figure I encountered had left an indelible mark on my psyche, making it nearly impossible to shrug off his sinister presence. My sleep was plagued with nightmares, and my days brought only paranoia as I continued my long hauls, gripping the steering wheel with white knuckles. Four days later, on a humid June evening, I decided to stop by a small roadside diner for some much-needed human interaction. The gruff old bartender's presence was comforting as I tried to regain my bearings. I couldn't help but let slip what I had encountered on that dreaded night. Sounds like you've met the stitch man, the bartender declared gravely after hearing my story. As if on cue, the silence that enveloped them attracted the attention of other patrons who seemed all too familiar with the local legend. The bartender then shared one of many gory tales about this malefactor commonly known as the Stitch Man. He was said to have been a doctor who roamed these deserted highways at night, stitching torn flesh after morbidly tragic accidents in exchange for something else. Various accounts spread of him sneaking into cars parked by saloons or lurking within the motel rooms of truckers nearby. It wasn't until one unfortunate patron spoke up that a chill went down my spine. This man recounted an awful tale from three days prior, a young couple stopping for gas and losing their infant child in a horrific manner involving strange markings and missing body parts. Panic gripped me. Could this have been his doing? Desperate to rid myself of this presence once and for all, I began conducting a personal investigation into the stitch man's origin while on the road as a way of passing the time between halls. Late night deep dives through archived town records yielded little more than cold leads. However, they sparked an obsession that grew uncontrollable. As June 13th rolled around, my paranoia reached a tipping point. While driving through Nevada with trembling hands, I sought solace at a seedy truck stop hotel where other drivers traveling the same haunted highways whispered rumors of strange markings outside guest rooms and odd occurrences in the dead of night. Despite these palpable terrors, sleep somehow managed to find me for a few hours before an unsettling disturbance jolted me awake at precisely 3 a.m. The cacophony of erratic knocking on my door spurred me into action. 
I haphazardly threw on clothes and demanded an explanation from the perpetrator. To my horror, the door swung open to reveal nothing, but the dark night beyond, and behind me, strange markings were etched ominously in my room. The stitched man was toying with me, testing my limits, and pushing me to the brink of sanity. What did he want? As I struggled with this new revelation, I knew that facing him head-on would be the only way I could rid myself of this evil force that now plagued my every waking moment. During those next few days, it became apparent that he would never relent. Encountering mangled animals and abandoned vehicles with torn flesh hastily stitched only served as cruel reminders that no one was safe, not even the innocent and unwitting civilians who unknowingly crossed his path. The following day, a begrudging decision solidified in my mind. Life as I knew it had become devoted entirely to unmasking and confronting this monster that instilled fear in all unfortunate enough to hear his tale. His macabre game had stripped away reason, leaving only bare determination in its wake. Squaring my shoulders resolutely and leaving any semblance of a normal life behind me, I set out on an impossible mission that would consume the remainder of my days, pursuing the stitch man exposing him for who he truly was and preventing his horrors from plaguing more innocent lives propelled me forward, ever vigilant. And though a definitive end may prove elusive in my quest to rid the world of a seemingly untouchable enemy, I will continue to embrace my newfound purpose, fueled by the strength of my resolve. Who knows what dark secrets I may unveil as I walk this harrowing path. It is my life's mission now, and there's no turning back. As I pulled into the truck stop in Oakwood, Ohio, on that fateful May 12th morning, I had no idea that my life would change forever. The sun was starting to rise, and I could feel the heaviness of the past night's journey slowly lifting from my body. It was just a regular work day. My name is Merrick Van Doren, and I'm a long-haul truck driver. There is nothing spectacular or exciting about my job, just me, the open road, and a whole lot of miles in between. I checked my cargo one last time, then went inside to grab some coffee and breakfast. I chatted with a few other drivers before heading to my assigned table. Among them was a man named Zorian Caldwell. He too was a trucker who had been driving for years and knew every back road in America like the back of his hand. As we consumed our greasy meals, Zorian began to tell me about a string of gruesome murders that have been happening in small towns near our current route for decades. I dismissed his tales as exaggerated gossip from frightened small-town folks. After all, this was the first I was hearing about it. I'm telling you, Merrick, he insisted while wiping bacon grease off his chin. Be careful when you're out on those roads at night. I decided it was time to get back on the road and tried to shake off Zorian's foreboding tales. As night fell, I couldn't help but glance anxiously at my rearview mirror from time to time as paranoia set in. At first, everything seemed ordinary, until I noticed headlights following me from quite some distance away. The vehicle stayed behind me for hours without overtaking or turning off simply lurking in the shadows. Feeling increasingly uneasy, I pulled into a rest stop, hoping whoever it was would continue on their way. Instead, the headlights followed me, confirming my suspicions. I tried to get a look at the driver from inside the truck cabin, but their face was shrouded in darkness. As I stepped out of my truck to confront them, the figure hastily disembarked from their vehicle with a sawed-off shotgun in hand. 
My heart raced as my mind jumped back to Zorian's stories of horrific murders along these isolated roads. Who are you? I demanded shakily, standing next to my truck for cover. The figure remained silent, sizing me up with unnerving intensity. As we stood there locked in a suspenseful standoff, headlights suddenly illuminated the scene, and another truck pulled up behind me. The mysterious assailant quickly retreated into the shadows before I could get a better look at his face. I later learned that Zorian had secretly followed me once he realized that I was next on that brutal killer's list. He had saved my life just in time. When I recounted my terrifying encounter to a local sheriff, he confessed that several drivers have reported similar incidents for years along these very routes. The assailant was never caught, nor were his motives ever unearthed. That unknown menace, dubbed the Highway Reaper, by law enforcement, still remains at large and continues to terrify anyone who travels these desolate roads. I realized that information about the Highway Reaper was even more valuable now. If Zorian hadn't followed me and intervened, I could have quickly become another victim. Gathering all the courage I had, I decided to try to learn more and potentially put an end to this terror affecting so many lives. After discussing the matter with Zorian, he agreed to join me in this potentially dangerous endeavor. We began by collecting accounts from other drivers, victims who had managed to escape their encounters with this elusive killer, and rummaging through old newspaper clippings. We talked to family members of those who didn't survive their respective encounters and contacted local law enforcement officials for any leads they might have. The gruesome descriptions of the crime scenes sent shivers down my spine, but I couldn't let fear win, not when so many lives were still at stake. A pattern emerged. The Highway Reaper targeted long-haul truck drivers along secluded highways during nighttime hours. Descriptions of him varied slightly, but there were overlapping peculiarities. A tall, gaunt figure with piercing green eyes that glowed beneath the hood of his dark jacket. Everything about his appearance screamed, out of the ordinary. With Zorian's help, we came up with a plan, one that would put us both at risk. We decided that baiting the Reaper was our best shot at getting close enough to reveal his identity and stop the killings. And so, over the course of several nights, we took turns driving different trucks on desolate roads in hopes of luring him out. Finally, on May 16th at approximately 2.37 a.m., it happened, headlights in my rearview mirror as if they'd appeared out of nowhere. The chase was on, adrenaline was pumping through my veins. Zorian's truck was positioned nearby so he could intervene if necessary. The Reaper followed me into an isolated rest area, just like he had done before. I pulled over, knowing that my only chance to confront him was now. Stepping out of the truck, I watched him approach slowly and menacingly, brandishing a long and razor-sharp hunting knife coated in a dark, viscous substance. Before he could draw any closer, Zorian's truck burst into the rest stop, headlights sweeping across the scene. Panicked but determined, I pulled out my phone and snapped a picture of the Highway Reaper's face. The flash momentarily stunned him and gave us enough time to maneuver our trucks to block his exit. The Reaper attempted to retreat into the shadows but found himself trapped. He removed his dark hood then and revealed his horribly disfigured face, shallow indentations where his mouth should have been carved into an unnerving grin, scarred skin clinging tightly to his skull. You wanted to know who I am? Here I am, he hissed as he advanced towards me. Just as he surged forward, law enforcement officials we had alerted earlier stormed the scene with cries of, Drop your weapon! ringing through the air. Despite being cornered though, that night didn't mark the end of the Highway Reaper, 
somehow managing to slip away in those critical final moments as law enforcers sought to apprehend him. The photograph I had taken provided law enforcement with their first solid lead on this shadowy figure, even if it wasn't enough to end his terror. As days turned into months following that fateful confrontation, Zorian and I knew we had exposed at least part of his identity, but still couldn't bring him to justice before he could strike again. He remained free but was aware that others knew who he was. The photograph we provided had made it harder for him to continue lurking in the darkness unnoticed by potential victims. Though we failed to capture or kill him that night, we cast such a light on the Highway Reaper that he could no longer entirely escape. His crimes continued, but now everyone shared a grim awareness of the danger lurking on those desolate highways. And so, the Reaper's legacy and legend seemed to be set in stone, as a ghostly figure haunting truck drivers on lonely roads, moving closer and closer to an inevitable reckoning. But for Zorian and me, his horrifying face remained permanently etched in our memories, a reminder that sometimes evil can't be easily conquered or vanquished. It was a chilling truth we'd never forget. It all began on an ordinary day, just like any other. My partner, Lysander Eldridge, and I were hauling a load down the long stretch of Interstate 70 across the sprawling plains of Kansas. We used to play games to pass the long hours and miles on our runs, quizzing each other on obscure facts or retelling anecdotes about our lives before truck driving. The thing is, you come across all sorts of people when you're out on the road. Fellow truckers, travelers from all walks of life, and sometimes, when you wander too far off the beaten path, things that defy explanation. I'd heard from other truckers of strange occurrences happening at rest stops along this sleepy part of Kansas. There were whispers of something sinister lurking in the shadows. I passed it off as nothing more than idle talk and the figments of sleep-deprived imaginations. On this particular run, we encountered Rico, another driver we knew from the circuits, grizzled, with years in the business under his belt. He told us the story of a creature seen by several drivers near Silver Lake Rest Area off Exit 365. It stood tall with human-like features but moved with primal ferocity and had unmatched strength. No one knew what it was or where it came from, and that seemed to foster an aura of fear in those who crossed its path. Lysander and I shrugged it off as yet another tall tale. Little did we know just how deadly an encounter with this thing could be. We made a pit stop at Silver Lake Rest Area later that day under an ever-darkening sky, hoping for a quick rest before pushing through to our final destination. The rest area appeared innocuous enough, desolate but for a haphazard scattering of cars and trucks parked nearby. It wasn't until we stumbled upon a gruesome scene that we realized something was horribly wrong. Blood painted the pavement like abstract art leading to the carnage of a woman we recognized as a fellow driver, her body mangled beyond recognition as if an immense force had torn her apart. Lysander choked back vomit, and I felt my heart hammering against my chest. An icy chill of sheer terror crept along every inch of my body at the sight before us. Convinced that the disturbing creature Rico had mentioned and this horrifying event were intertwined, we cautiously searched the area. It wasn't long before we heard anguished cries ring out in the distance as we discovered more blood-splattered victims. We called 911 to report what we believed to be a brutal crime scene. Meanwhile, I fingered the handle of my hunting knife tucked into my belt, although I feared it would provide little protection against whatever lay waiting for us. As we continued our search, 
Our suspicions grew when it became apparent that whoever or whatever was responsible for all this carnage hadn't been caught yet. The police showed up sooner than expected, so we managed to arm ourselves with guns from their cruisers after briefly explaining our situation. Their eyes told us they believed there might be some truth in our desperate words. We asked them to accompany us further into the rest area. But as they approached deeper into the darkness, something unexpected happened. In a flash of movement too breathtakingly quick for any human being, two officers were dragged screaming into the shadows by an eye that shone with a sickly yellow glow. Their bodies were obliterated in a cacophony of bones breaking and flesh tearing while other officers fired at it desperately. But the beings seemed impervious to their bullets and vanished into the black night before our eyes. Time stood still, and no one moved or spoke, all consumed by fear at what they had just witnessed. As for me and Lysander, we both knew without saying a word that neither of us would ever be the same again. With trembling legs, I clutched my gun, completely unsure of what to do. The police held their weapons with shaking hands. As we stood there, unsure of what to do next, I realized that this nightmare wouldn't end until we got a good look at this thing. I turned to Lysander and whispered, We need to track it down. We can't let it keep killing like this. He nodded his agreement, and we carefully followed the trail the creature left in its wake. The first thing we noticed was the size of its footprints, comparable to a bear's but far more sinister in appearance, with elongated talon-like claws. Its height seemed to be at least seven feet, judging by the height of the claw marks we found on nearby trees. The smell was asphyxiating, a putrid mix of rotting flesh and mold. Every now and then, we heard low growls, guttural and animalistic, that sent shivers down my spine. On several occasions, we found the mutilated remains of more victims, twisted bodies with limbs ripped from their sockets and insides eviscerated. Their expressions spoke volumes. They had been trapped in never-ending terror before their untimely deaths. It wasn't long before Lysander managed to capture footage of the creature as it passed swiftly by a pickup truck behind us. With cautious haste, we found temporary solace behind a dumpster, catching our breaths while reviewing the recording. Clear enough to distinguish its terrifying features, broad shoulders, covered in reeking matted fur, a hunched posture, long arms ending with sharp claws perfectly designed for tearing flesh, glowing yellow eyes filled with malevolent intelligence. Our mission quickly evolved from survival to stopping this monster once and for all. Hours had passed since we began our pursuit, and now daylight was starting to creep through the darkness, Sunday morning at 6.45 a.m. Before proceeding further, we made a daunting phone call to Rico, asking for help. I'll never forget the urgency in his voice as he said, Get as many people off that rest area as you can, and I'll be there in an hour. Armed with knowledge about our enemy, we tried warning others at Silver Lake Rest Area. Most ignored our ramblings, dismissing us as crazy or high. Unfortunately for some, reality will take a gruesome turn. Just as Rico arrived and joined our frantic attempts to persuade everyone to leave, the creature resurfaced. It tore through the landscape like a bloodthirsty demon looking for its next sacrifice. Screams of horror filled the air as it grabbed a man and peeled the skin from his body like the way we peel an orange. Pure instinct took over both Lysander and me. We momentarily abandoned our objective to save others and focused our efforts on distracting the antagonist. The creature turned towards us snarling with rage and emitting a foul, sulfurous odor that permeated the air. Lysander distracted it while Rico and I quickly doused the truck's gas tank with flares before lighting it on fire. 
The intense explosion elicited a monstrous howl of pain from the creature. Wounded but not finished, it retreated into the shadows, too agile to be caught by those foolish enough to try. What happened next is almost inexplicable. As if melting away into darkness itself, the monster vanished from sight, leaving only a lingering sense of fear in its place. The police arrived, but they found nothing except more mutilated bodies and frightened survivors. Their investigation yielded no results. After all, who would believe such an extraordinary tale without having lived through it themselves? Silver Lake Rest Area was abandoned by authorities indefinitely as an eerie memorial to the death and terror that occurred within its boundaries. Life went on for Lysander and me, sleepless nights haunted by gruesome images, questioning whether we could have done something different to prevent those innocent lives from being lost. But we knew deep down that our brush with the unimaginable had changed us forever. We live knowing it's still out there, watching and waiting for the next unsuspecting victim. And though we can never forget, we hope to keep others aware of the lurking dangers hiding somewhere in the shadows of Exit 365. In the suffocating heat of August, I found myself driving along Route 66 somewhere in Arizona. The landscape stretched endlessly before me, offering no reprieve from the blazing sun above. My truck rumbled under me, faithfully carrying its cargo across the country. Days on the road seemed to drift together, the monotony broken only by the sparse population of gas stations, diners, and motels dotting the highway. That day began like any other without incident or fanfare, but as I pulled into one of those dilapidated gas stations for a quick stretch and fuel up, I noticed a bewildered man standing near the payphone at the edge of the parking lot. His clothing looked tattered and ragged, with dark stains smeared across it. He might have been in his mid-forties, his thin and disheveled hair falling over his creased forehead as he desperately sought help. I approached him cautiously and asked if he needed assistance. He looked up at me with wild eyes that could only be described as pure terror. The man in room seven, he stammered between gasps for breath. He's not human. Before I had a chance to react, the station owner rushed out from behind the counter to see what was happening. He soon recognized the frantic individual as Tomas Deruel, an art dealer who'd checked into a nearby motel earlier that day. He'd come to town to evaluate paintings found in an abandoned farmhouse. As Mr. Deruel continued to babble about strange happenings in his room, simply impossible shadows and terrifying whispers, it was difficult to ignore how these events sounded eerily familiar to stories floating around years prior involving broken travelers claiming they'd encountered unnatural beings while visiting rundown roadside motels. Hours later, Deruel and a small group of locals armed themselves, determined to confront whoever or whatever claimed residence in room 7 of that grimy little motel. I hesitated to join the group but curiosity got the best of me. We approached the door cautiously, weapons at the ready. With trepidation, Deruel inserted his key and unlocked it. The door creaked open, sending a wave of chilling air to greet us from within. My breath caught in my throat as we saw the entity, a creature of such indescribable evil that it felt like looking into the darkest depths of the abyss. What stood there deserved no name. It was a manifestation of our nightmares, a being that fed on our primal fear and terror. The tension in the room was palpable as we stared down our enemy. It watched us with malicious intent, its blood-stained hands gripping a sharpened axe that seemed to be crafted from human bones. Before we could react, 
It let out a wretched howl and lunged toward us with terrifying speed. My heartbeat thundered in my ears as I scrambled for cover behind an overturned dresser. The air filled with panic screams and gunfire as the chaos unfolded around me. I looked over my barricade only to witness one of the townsfolk falling victim to that grisly apparition, its gnarled talons tearing through flesh like paper and bringing forth a torrent of crimson. As his lifeless body crumpled to the ground, I knew I couldn't wait any longer. There'd be more casualties if this monstrosity wasn't eliminated. Determination rose within me, fighting through fear and despair. I'd send this demon back to hell or die trying. Gathering every ounce of courage, I charged toward the inhuman creature, my eyes locked on its gruesome visage. Its twisted, decaying features haunted my vision as it bared its grotesque teeth and met my advance. The beast towered over me, at least seven feet tall. Its skin was a sickly gray appearing as if it were rotting right off its skeletal body. The stench of decomposition filled the room. At 7.48 p.m., the room was plunged into darkness for a moment as we collided, our struggle like something out of a horror film. During those desperate seconds, my mind raced with fear and determination. This had to end now. I felt its nails dig deep into my flesh as we wrestled on the floor the searing pain reminding me that I was still alive. Lying on top of me, blood from its mouth dripped onto my face as it tightened its grip around my throat. No! I gasped, choking for air. In a last-ditch effort of pure desperation at 7.49 p.m., I grabbed a nearby shard of broken glass and plunged it into the monstrous entity's side. The beast howled in agony as black ichor oozed around the weapon lodged in its festering wound. Using this momentary distraction to my advantage, I managed to push the monster off me just enough for one of the group members to grab it by one sinewy arm and drag it away from us both. Don't let go! Another woman shouted from across the room as she frantically unfurled an ancient-looking scroll that Mr. Darrell found in his search for paintings. Her hands shook as her voice raised in chanting while others held on tightly to ensure the beast wouldn't escape. By 8 p.m., the creature seemed to be weakening, confined to one corner of the room while emitting an unsettling cacophony of shrieks and snarls. The woman's voice reached a crescendo, her incantations filling every corner of the space. Gradually, the wretched creature began to fade away, dissolving into a thick layer of darkness that seemed to be sucked into a vortex of shadows that spawned in the center of the room. We watched in horror as this swirling mass absorbed the last traces of the monster before completely disappearing. Eventually, the vortex dramatically collapsed on itself, leaving behind just a faint whiff of its malignant presence. As we tried to catch our breaths, Mr. Darrell slowly approached me, his eyes filled with amazement. It's finally over, he whispered in disbelief. We won't have anyone else fall victim to that evil thing. At 8.20 p.m., we gathered outside room 7, forever changed by what had transpired within its blood-stained walls. Our small-town lives were now marred by this unsettling truth. Malevolent creatures exist among us. For days after the incident, I found it difficult to sleep, my mind always returning to those gruesome memories. The beast was not caught or killed in a traditional sense. It was just banished for now. However, Instead of nightmares terrifying me awake every night, I gradually found comfort in knowing that despite our small-town way of life being forever disturbed by these unexplained horrors, we survived and prevailed. In those dark moments where shadows seem too long, or whispers seem too real, I remember how far we've come and how we stood strong together. And though some nights my eyes dart over at any glimpse of darkness while lying in bed, 
There is strength in knowing that whatever new terror surfaces will never face their darkest hour alone. It was the silence that first caught my attention. Every time I passed through Darby Canyon in Wyoming, there would usually be some sign of life, but that day was different. As a truck driver for 15 years, there wasn't much that could surprise me anymore. Yet, while driving on this narrow stretch of road, surrounded by dense forests and steep cliffs, I couldn't help but feel unnerved. The radio crackled to life, and my co-worker, Salen Grimes, started talking. Hey, Renard, did you hear about the hikers that went missing around here last week? Yeah, I replied hesitantly. I heard different stories from folks down at the truck stop. Some say it was a bear attack or a landslide. Frankly, we'll never know the truth. It wasn't long before I reached my destination, an old gas station near the edge of town. As I walked inside to grab a snack and pay for my fuel, I overheard an old man muttering to himself about a local legend named the Wendigo. People claimed this creature had haunted these woods for centuries and was responsible for countless deaths. I brushed off the old man's ramblings and climbed back into my truck. The thought of some mythical beast lurking in the shadows was entertaining but nothing more than folklore. However, as the sun began to set and my shift neared its end, my thoughts drifted back to those missing hikers. Suddenly, Zalen's voice erupted from the radio again. Renard! There's another report coming in. Some hunters found human remains just off the road near Sparrow Creek earlier today. Staring through my windshield into the encroaching darkness beyond, unease settled heavily in my chest. Was it possible some demented serial killer was stalking unsuspecting travelers around Darby Canyon, or maybe even the Wendigo itself? As I continued driving, I tried to dismiss my fear. I focused on the road, paying careful attention to every detail of my surroundings. That's when I saw it a flash of movement in the distance, heading directly toward me. My heart threatened to explode from my chest as adrenaline flooded my system. Swerving erratically, I veered off the road and slammed the brakes. From behind a nearby tree, a large figure emerged into full view. At first glance, it appeared to be a massive wolf or perhaps a bear. But as my eyes adjusted, I came to realize this creature wasn't like anything I'd seen before. It stood on two legs, its body covered in coarse hair and matted fur. Its face was twisted into a snarl, revealing long, jagged teeth that dripped with saliva. Not wasting any time, I grabbed my loaded shotgun from beneath the seat and fired a shot into the air. In that moment of chaos and confusion, Though swiftness seemed impossible for such a creature, the Wendigo disappeared back into the shadowy undergrowth. I knew one thing for sure. No missing hiker could face this horror alone and survive. Hastily returning to the truck stop later than usual that night, I shared my encounter with Salen and a few others who would listen. The townsfolk continue to debate what exactly is lurking in the woods surrounding Darby Canyon, while new tales of the Wendigo circulate among them. Newcomers are warned of the chilling events that now blemish our small town's history. Still, I can't help but shudder with terror myself, imagining how close they all remain to danger each night as they sleep soundly, unaware of its looming presence just beneath our noses. The next morning, I decided that I couldn't just stand idly by and let the Wendigo terrorize our town any longer. Planning with Salen, the two of us concocted a desperate scheme to outsmart the creature. After spending the early hours of the day scouring hunting stores for traps, weapons, 
and bait, we felt prepared. At precisely 4 p.m., we set out on our mission. With our gear packed, Zaylin and I ventured into the darkest depths of Darby Canyon. We located an area with multiple signs of the creature's presence, like torn trees and slaughtered wildlife. The grim sights were enough to leave even the most iron-stomached individuals feeling nauseated. Zaylin took charge of setting up the traps while I kept a lookout. One of our devices used an odorless substance that emitted high-frequency noises aimed at disorienting and incapacitating any living thing with an earshot. Another trap consisted of a baited net designed to ensnare our target without killing it. We were meticulous in our arrangements. They had to be perfect if we had any hope of containing the Wendigo. By 8.37 p.m., we had completed the installments and retreated to a nearby treehouse built by local hunters. Exhausted but vigilant, Zaylin and I took turns scanning our surroundings through binoculars. At approximately 10.06 p.m., we noticed subtle movement in the shadows as the Wendigo cautiously approached the scene. Its piercing yellow eyes glowed like embers as it sniffed around one of the traps. Salen whispered hoarsely in my ear, Renard, as soon as it goes for the bait, activate the frequency device. I kept my hand hovering over the remote control as we both silently prayed that our scheme would work. As soon as the Wendigo began ripping apart a carcass tied to a tree, I quickly pressed the button. The creature unleashed an ear-shattering screech as it collapsed to the ground, tumbling into one of our nets in the process. My heart was in my throat as Zaylin motioned for us to approach. While the Wendigo lay there disoriented, we could finally see its grotesque features up close. Its body was a sickly mixture of bones and rotting flesh bound together by tendons, creating an abomination that defied any semblance of a natural predator. We approached with caution. As Zaylin held a loaded revolver at the ready, I examined our makeshift prisoner while maintaining a safe distance. Its chest heaved rapidly, betraying intense suffering from the frequent attack. Our strategy had worked thus far, but we weren't quite sure how to proceed with the incapacitated monster before us. Suddenly, it dawned on me that containment would be our best shot at neutralizing the threat once and for all. We should call the authorities and have them take this thing away, I suggested to Zaylin. He looked at me with unease but nodded after considering our alternatives. Two days later, the Wendigo was transferred to a classified military facility for further study and containment. While Zaylin and I safely returned to our lives around town, the disturbing events surrounding the Wendigo left deep-rooted scars on our community's collective consciousness. Rumors circulated about the true terror that haunted Darby Canyon. Some locals speculated about other horrifying creatures lurking in the darkness, while most people simply chose to avoid discussing it altogether. Life carried on in this small town, shadowed by dark secrets veiled beneath hushed conversations and locked lips. Though the Wendigo no longer stalked through the woods surrounding Darby Canyon, a suffocating atmosphere of fear lingered indefinitely as people silently wondered whether other sinister beings waited keenly within dark corners for their next unfortunate victims. I knew it was unlike any other day when I pulled my truck into Cactus Corner's truck stop in Tucumcari, New Mexico. Everyone looked incredibly tense, huddling together and whispering among themselves. A quiver ran through the room as events beyond comprehension began to unfold. By the time I popped myself down on a barstool alongside an old bearded fellow named Zarbin Blackbird and ordered a cold one, the place had erupted into chatter. P. 
People were throwing around wild theories about disappearances, notably recent missing truckers traveling through this stretch of desert highway. Seeking answers, I leaned in close to Zarbin, who seemed well informed about the situation. Well, Buckert, he said after sipping bourbon from a dirty glass, you certainly picked a hell of a time to roll into town. Zarbin's eyes darted left and right before he explained that over the last few months, truck drivers stopping in Tucumcari had experienced an alarming fate. Many simply vanished with their cargo out on Route 40. The eeriest part of these vanishings? All traces of blood and God knows what else on the inside of their rigs. But bodies? Gone. Whispers had spread far and wide about the culprit's identity. Some believed it was El Chupacabra that had returned after years of dormancy, while others were convinced it was a cult of sadistic thrill-seekers prowling Route 40. I tried to shake off my feelings of dread and unease as I finished my drink, preparing to continue my journey. Delivering refrigerated goods across state lines wasn't supposed to be filled with treacherous intrigue. That night, as I drove along beneath a moonlit sky through the desolate desert landscape, I clenched the steering wheel tight enough to turn my knuckles snow white. Thoughts raced through my mind about El Chupacabra or a group of twisted individuals who could be lurking anywhere in the dark. A sudden screeching noise jolted me upright, and I instinctively stomped on the brakes as a figure sprinted across the road ahead. My God, I whispered, gripping my tire iron firmly as a twisted creature peeled itself from the asphalt. Its skin was like tanned leather stretched over a distorted skeletal frame, and it had eyes that glowed blood red. The thing emitted barks and howls no earthly animal should make before suddenly lunging for my windshield. Panic swirled in my chest as I slammed on the gas pedal, struggling to calculate if it was El Chupacabra or some twisted humanoid responsible for all those gruesome murders and disappearances. Dodging its snapping jaws, I struggled to focus on the task at hand, survival. Amidst the life-and-death chaos, I failed to spot another truck barreling toward me from around a bend in the road. Before either of us had time to react, our rigs collided head-on with a sickening crunch of metal and glass. Dazed from impact, I became aware that something even more harrowing than my encounter with that abomination was unfolding before my eyes. I was in a state of shock not only from the collision, but also from the terrifying creature that had just attacked me. As I struggled to climb out of my wrecked truck, I saw the driver of the other vehicle emerge, bloodied and dazed. The man, who I later found out was named Jim, managed to stumble towards me with a mixture of confusion and fear in his eyes. What just happened, man? What was that thing? Jim asked me, trembling, as we stood by our crumpled trucks. I wish I knew, I replied, my heart still pounding from the insanity of it all. I was attacked by that thing and then you. Jim's jaw clenched as he looked at the twisted wreckage. We need to get help. We can't stay stranded here with that monster roaming around. We decided to find a place where we could take cover and call for assistance. With sore limbs and adrenaline pumping through our veins, we staggered along the highway until we came across an old gas station not too far away. It was an eerie scene, this seemingly abandoned and forgotten outpost nestled in the desolate landscape. We stepped cautiously inside, unsure of what we might find. The gas station was dimly lit revealing shelves covered in dust and a thick layer of grime on the floor. The phone at the station's counter looked ancient but was surprisingly functional. Jim picked it up with a trembling hand and dialed for help. I glanced at my watch as he began talking to an operator. It was 3.27 a.m. 
As Jim relayed our predicament to the operator on the other end of the line, I couldn't help but overhear some rustling outside. My heart raced as I imagined what horrors might lurk in those shadows. I'll be right back, I told Jim while mustering my courage to investigate. Once outside, I briefly caught sight of the creature's glowing red eyes. Its grotesque form slithered behind a row of rusted gas pumps, its bone-chilling howls and snarls echoing into the night. I snuck up close enough to get a better look at the fiend because of my own need for answers. Its appearance was far worse than I could have ever imagined. The beast's leathery skin was stretched tightly over its skeletal frame, and its razor-sharp teeth gleamed in the moonlight. Suddenly it lunged at me. All I could hear was the sound of my own scream as I grappled with this monstrous abomination. As it snapped towards my throat, Jim burst from the station's door with a makeshift weapon, a rusty crowbar he had found inside. Jim swung with all his might, striking the creature over and over until it finally retreated with a screech that made our eardrums ache. We were both panting and shaking as we stared at each other in disbelief. Thank God you intervened. I whispered in gratitude as we stumbled back into the gas station. My watch now displays 4.05 a.m. We huddled inside, shivering from both exhaustion and fear, anxiously awaiting help to arrive. The next day, when rescuers finally came upon us in our dismal refuge, they showed no recognition or knowledge of such a creature despite showing pictures of our injuries. It seemed that Jim and I were left alone with our terrors, marked but not supported. The demon creature that had once stalked us on that dark desert road eventually took us to the closest town for medical attention. Whether it was El Chupacabra or something more human but equally disturbed, one thing became clear as we attempted to reconcile reality with what had occurred. More lives would undoubtedly be lost on Route 40, and the legend of the Cactus Corners truck stop would only grow. The twisted abomination that had crossed our path would forever be a mystery. Every time I close my eyes, I still see those gleaming red orbs glaring back at me. Every time I drive alone at night, I'm reminded of how easily, and without explanation, our world can plunge into a nightmare. The air crackled with energy as I rolled into the almost deserted truck stop in Ely, Nevada. It was late, probably around 2.30 a.m. on a random Thursday with not a soul in sight. I couldn't shake off this strange feeling, a nagging sense that something was terribly off. My hands gripped the steering wheel tighter, my knuckles white with anxiety. I pulled the truck to a diesel pump and climbed down from my cap. While filling her up, I mulled over the odd sensation that had been bothering me for the past several miles. Nothing was out of the ordinary at first glance, except for the emptiness of this usually bustling truck stop. Time seemed to slow down around me as I entered the small convenience store to grab a cup of coffee. The place looked like it hadn't seen customers in hours. As I sorted through some newly arrived Doritos bags at the corner snack area, it hit me. There wasn't anyone working at the counter. Hello? Anyone here? I called out my voice echoing through the eerie silence. An uneasy dread crept up my spine. No answer. That's when I heard muffled whispers from the back room. An extremely agitated man seemed to be expressing his terror to someone in his cell. He described some horrifying events taking place over the past few days involving an elusive figure named Slicer. The whispers alluded to brutal attacks on people passing by or stopping at Ely in any way. After he hung up, 
I didn't hesitate to grab him by his collar and demand answers. Terrified, he explained that Slicer had been stalking for days now, mutilating and injuring innocent people without mercy. Some believed Slicer was an ex-religious cult leader hunting down his former followers who abandoned him after his sensational downfall. Others speculated he was some twisted psychopath who stumbled upon Ely's desolation and saw it as a canvas for his sadistic artistry. However, everyone agreed that nobody had managed to see his face and lived to tell the tale. Just as we were about to leave, the store clerk whispered that Slicer was rumored to be lurking in the shadows of Ely's desert nights. At least, that's what old-timers and conspiracy nuts claimed. With trepidation and fueled by adrenaline, I darted back to my truck. If only I'd known beforehand about the Slicer's apparent trail of terror, I would have never stopped here. I sensed he was coming, and I needed to escape this ghost town before meeting him face to face. Carefully checking around my rig before hopping in, my heart pounding as if it would burst out of my chest, I revved up the engine like my life depended on it, which it might have. As wheels grated against gravel under the cloak of darkness, my rearview mirrors revealed something utterly dreadful. A shadowy figure emerged from behind the diesel pumps with almost ethereal grace. I stomped the pedal hard through desert roads with terror coursing through my veins. Sweat dripped down my brow while shivers ran down my spine. I never realized how much horror could engulf our seemingly mundane lives. At one moment, you're an ordinary truck driver just trying to make buck after buck. At another moment, survival instincts kick into overdrive. The slicer relentlessly pursued me. A twisted game of cat and mouse ensued where every wrong turn could be my last. Through desolate roads and long-forgotten places where danger seemed right at home, the slicer sent malice quivering throughout lonely outposts beneath Nevada's unforgiving stars. Speeding recklessly around a bend, desperate shrieks filled my ears. For a split second, I glimpsed the twisted silhouette of the slicer in my rearview mirror. In that fleeting moment, I caught a glimpse of his sickening features. Wild, unkempt hair cascading around a grotesque face adorned with unnaturally wide eyes and a malicious grin that stretched impossibly across his sunken cheeks. Panic consumed me as I pushed my truck to its limits, leaving nothing but a cloud of dust and the lingering stench of bloodlust in the air. As the distance between us grew, I made an effort to remember every gruesome detail the terrified store clerk and neighborhood rumors had shared. Slicer's victims had been found brutally mutilated, their screams forever etched into the night's silence. It was apparent that I had stumbled upon one of his hunting grounds and was now actively engaged in this ruthless chase. With each passing minute, Reality began to blur as fatigue and adrenaline scrambled my thoughts. Finally, as faint glimmers of dawn kissed the eastern sky, it seemed I had shaken him off, at least for now. My pulse raced, but relief washed over me as I noticed an old motel just off the side of the road. Although it appeared worse for wear, it would become my sanctuary until daylight could offer some form of safety. I checked into the motel under a fake name, ensuring not to leave any trace of my identity behind. The room was musty and unkempt. Nevertheless, I locked myself in and barricaded the door with whatever furniture I could find. Exhaustion overtook me, releasing me into a fitful slumber where nightmares quickly formed. On awakening from what seemed like mere minutes later, heart pounding against my chest, I inspected signs of forced entry. However, nothing appeared amiss, although I knew better than to let my guard down when dealing with such sinister creatures. I launched a hasty investigation to find out if anyone else was aware of this monstrous figure that haunted the town while hiding behind the facade of daylight. 
questioning locals as discreetly as possible and carefully weaving through recent events without raising suspicion, I pieced together fragments of this nightmare. Disturbing parallels emerged between the townspeople's tales and my own experience, and it appeared that Slicer's victims had always tried seeking help from others, only for it to result in more bloodshed. It became apparent that any form of collaboration or engagement marked these individuals for death, as though mere association made them targets. It was at this point that I realized something chilling. The store clerk and all those people I had met in my pursuit of answers now bore an unseen mark that lured the slicer closer. Unable to shake this dawning horror, I knew I had no choice but to bear the burden alone. Determined to rid myself of him and restore light to Ely's forsaken land, I came to terms with the haunting fact, if what plagued me was inescapable darkness, then darkness is what I must become. Utilizing every ounce of my wits, cunning, and instinct, I devised a plan, one that would potentially pit me against the slicer in a final showdown. Isolated from those who might get caught in the crossfire, I returned to my truck at sundown, ensuring it appeared conspicuous enough for him. My pulse raced, and sweat streamed down my face. This grim game could only end one way, with the tables turning on Ely's grim reaper himself. Every cautiously crafted step felt like walking along a knife's edge as evening closed in and shadows reached out for me. There wouldn't be any formal resolution or justice served for the slicer. He wouldn't be captured or killed, but he would recognize one thing. There were others just as relentless as he was, capable of residing within their darkness yet refusing to bow before his insatiable hunger. In confronting him while luring him far from the town of Ely, I would strip him of his power and haunt the hunter. I would force fear upon him the same fear he had instilled in us. That night, with eyes focused on the abyss ahead, I took to the wheel once more. The truck roared into life, and I pressed on with a singular purpose. Darkness had embraced me. It now clung to my every breath, furiously whispering a name that echoed within its murky depths, Slicer. Ever since last Tuesday, I can't shake the feeling that things aren't quite right. It was a seemingly normal day, if you could call navigating an 18-wheeler across Oklahoma's Highway 3. Normal. My destination? A small distribution center in the town of Porham. I'd driven this route countless times, but that day seemed to hold a mysterious air that I struggled to put my finger on. Halfway through my journey, I pulled into a rest stop, you know, the kind they have every hundred miles or so along these desolate highways. The sun was setting as I grabbed a quick bite to eat and chatted with another trucker named Levon Kincaid, who was also taking a break from his haul. We bantered a bit about road conditions and trucker life before he revealed he'd heard about something sinister happening near Antlers just south of our present location. I've been hearing some stories about folks going missing, he said, chewing on the last bite of his sandwich. Course, it could be just local folklore or something about that group they say lives out in those woods. What's their name? The Scarlet Finches? Something like that. I brushed off the conversation as Levon took one last swig of coffee and climbed back into his cab. As I continued my drive, twilight settled over the plains like a dark veil, and my thoughts couldn't help but drift back to what he had mentioned earlier. By the time I reached Antlers, it was pitch black outside. Suddenly, I spotted flashing red lights up ahead. It seemed like some sort of accident had happened on the road. As I approached cautiously, 
Ready for any potential delays, my blood ran cold, realizing it wasn't an accident but rather a gruesome scene laid out before me. Several lifeless bodies lay scattered strategically along both sides of the highway, their mangled limbs and vacant stairs bearing the chilling evidence of some carefully orchestrated horror. My stomach churned, and I fumbled for my phone to call 911 while trying not to fall apart. Through gritted teeth, I relayed the events to the operator as shockwaves of disgust washed over me. The first responders arrived swiftly, systematically combing the scene. An officer named Rick interviewed me while his fellow officers worked around us. Based on the wounds, it seems like a large knife or a machete was used, he said after taking down my statement. You know... There have been other cases of missing persons in this area lately. Some folks blame it on the Oklahoma Slasher. A modern-day urban legend claims he prowls the woods around here. It could be just a coincidence with all this talk of that cult Levon mentioned too. As I drove away from the nauseating scene, leaving the investigation to local law enforcement, I couldn't help but feel unnerved by what had happened. How could such violent acts be attributed to simple folklore or a miscreant group? Furthermore, why did these crimes follow a clear geographical pattern that included antlers? In any case, one thing was certain. Everything had changed since that unforgettable Tuesday in Oklahoma. The sense of dread that has clung to me ever since refused to dissolve entirely as I continued down my path in life and as I traveled further down that seemingly endless highway and eventually reached Porum, encountering gruesome acts by unseen hands and unknowable origins remained forever a lingering possibility with every mile ahead. The possibility of encountering more gruesome acts repeatedly plagued my thoughts. After delivering my haul in Porum, I made my way back to the Antlers crime scene, feeling compelled to learn more about the perpetrator. Could it truly be the Oklahoma slasher causing the bloodbath I witnessed? I stayed at a nearby motel and did some snooping around for answers. During one of my late night expeditions, I caught a glimpse of a shadowy figure darting between trees. Upon closer inspection by following the figure discreetly, I could only see glimpses of shiny steel and rust-colored stains on what appeared to be rugged military boots. Something about this figure seemed oddly familiar. The next time I spotted him, his gaunt face was unmistakable with sunken eyes, sharp cheekbones, and an unkempt beard. It was Levon Kincaid. His tall, lanky stature, which once seemed friendly, now appeared chilling as he slithered around town undetected. I shook myself from the horror of my realization and wasted no time alerting Officer Rick about what I'd discovered. It was 3.37 a.m. when I reached out to him, hoping he would believe my story. The way he moves, it's predatory. I explained in a hushed whisper over the phone. This has to be our guy. Officer Rick agreed to help track down Levon while keeping me updated. My heart raced with dread as we developed a plan that required me to keep an eye on Levon without getting caught or harmed. The following day, at 1.16 p.m., Rick arrived at my motel room, looking exhausted yet determined. We've got a lead, he said after taking a deep breath. We trailed Levon as he approached an abandoned warehouse around 6.15 p.m. It seemed like an ideal hideout for someone looking to avoid suspicion. As we entered cautiously, Levon was nowhere in sight, but a bone-chilling scene awaited us. The warehouse was covered with blood stains and splatters that soaked into the concrete floor. The smell of decay filled the air. Nearby, a steel table held a set of disorganized surgical tools, covered in dried blood and frightfully sharp. Officer Rick radioed for backup immediately, 
his face pale from the abhorrent finding. It was 8.42 p.m. when they swarmed the location, sirens blaring and the tension palpable. We heard footsteps behind us. Levon had returned. We concealed ourselves barely in time to watch him study his grisly, artwork, with a satisfied grin. He began to sharpen one of his knives with sadistic care. Out of nowhere, Rick lunged at Levon from his hiding spot. The two men grappled on the ground, but Levon managed to escape Rick's grip with surprising agility. One swift kick landed Rick hard on his back, groaning with pain. I held my breath, gauging whether to intervene or wait for reinforcements. As if sensing my presence, Levon scanned his surroundings with an eerie, predatory gaze. Time seemed to slow down as our eyes locked. A chilling realization washed over me. I might not survive this encounter. Just as Levon took a step towards me, sirens pierced the silence and red and blue lights flashed outside the warehouse windows. His terrifying grip on my gaze broke as officers burst into the scene, their guns raised. In that split second of confusion when officers charged in, Levon vanished. He was gone without a trace. Swiftly checking on Officer Rick, who lay unconscious but alive, I knew everything had changed since that Tuesday in Oklahoma. Weeks passed as law enforcement pursued Levon across multiple states, following trail after trail of violent crimes yet never ensnaring him. He remained an elusive phantom, leaving behind dread in every town he passed through. It happened like any other day. I was driving my 18-wheeler, hauling canned goods, through a remote area of Montana near Great Falls, known as the Highwood Mountains. Wide open expanses surrounded me, and the sky seemed to stretch on forever. The road wasn't busy at this time of day. There were few travelers daring to venture into these parts for reasons you're about to know. I chose this unusual route purely by coincidence. I'd heard stories about local folklore and strange occurrences around here, but it never deterred me. To me, those tales dragged down conversations in the secluded bars I frequented closer to home. Nothing more than cheap entertainment. But that evening, my entire perspective changed dramatically. When I reached a particularly desolate stretch of road, I spotted something out of place, a car with its hazard lights blinking on the shoulder ahead. A sense of unease began to flood over me. It was then that an unfamiliar face appeared from behind the stranded vehicle, a man named Clancy Geller. Unable to leave him stranded, I pulled over and offered my assistance. According to Clancy, his engine had overheated, and he needed a lift to the nearest service station. We started conversing as we continued down the desolate road, allowing me to learn more about him. His speech was as peculiar as his name. As we carried on our journey, Clancy mentioned how he once stumbled upon a severed hand while exploring the Highwood Mountains, just mere miles from our current location. He said it had been gnawed on by animals and bored deep grooves from what looked like teeth marks. Confused and unnerved by Clancy's grisly recollection, I couldn't help but feel unnerved by an overwhelming sense of dread, something I usually don't pay much mind to when driving through such remote areas. Moments later, we noticed a large figure emerging from the thick woods that encircled the highway. It stood on two legs covered in matted fur, and its eyes glowed like amber against the fading sunlight. A nauseating stench filled the air as it drew nearer. Clancy frantically whispered that this was the infamous sheep man of Highwood Mountains, a half-human, half-beast hybrid with a ravenous appetite for flesh. 
The twisted creature had been linked to missing people and mutilated livestock in the area for decades. But like any truck driver worth his salt, I had always been skeptical until this very moment. Just as I stomped on the gas pedal, Clancy lunged at me with a rusty hunting knife, attempting to stab me in a ferocious frenzy. Constantly swerving to avoid both the deranged Clancy and the approaching sheepman inflicted chaos around us. I fought back against him by fighting Clancy's advances, using all my strength to hold him off while maneuvering the truck away from the monstrous creature in a swift turn to avoid collision. At this point, my heart was pounding so fast that I could feel it clashing with the rhythm of the engine and the blaring sound of its turbocharger. I had heard whispers about strange occurrences, but this? This was a whole new level of nightmare. As I struggled and grappled with Clancy, I caught a glimpse of his eyes, devoid of any human emotion. Only pure insanity loomed within them. I knew that if either he or the sheepman got me, it would be a gruesome end. With each mile and swerve, Clancy became more intense and relentless in his attack. His knife nicked me more than once, leaving shallow cuts on my arm and face. He let out an unsettling cackle as his delirium reached its peak. And that's when it happened. Breaking out from the corner of Maya was another vehicle speeding straight toward us, a police cruiser, blue and red lights flashing. At that moment, Clancy must have felt a flicker of fear himself because he yelled obscenities that sent chills down my spine before leaping out of the truck like a madman. I wasn't about to slow down and put myself in further danger. Instead, I just kept driving. The sheepman seemed to lose interest in his prey and darted back into the woods as if he had suddenly turned into smoke. I cruised along the empty highway until I finally arrived at a small gas station about 30 miles farther south from where everything started. There were notable holes in my memory already due to sheer panic. However, what I saw next is something I can't ever forget. Upon staggering out of my truck, bloodied and dizzy from all the action, patrons inside immediately gasped and reeled back in horror. A kind old man cautiously approached me, leaning on his cane, as he asked if I was the infamous trucker from earlier. I nodded, unsure as to why he knew this. He explained that there had been an emergency call that went out about an escaped convict by the name of Clancy Geller. Apparently, Geller had a series of brutal killings under his belt and was sought after by police. The man took me inside and gave me some water as we waited for an ambulance to arrive. He also mentioned that Clancy was part of a group that worshipped this so-called cheap man. It turns out there's an entire cult following, with him being one of the most devoted members. That explained his deranged behavior, but it didn't provide any solace. I later recovered in the hospital, dealing with more questions than answers. I still don't know what happened to Clancy or that monstrous creature, and sometimes I wonder if it's just better not knowing their fate. But every now and then, when I cross that same desolate stretch of road late at night, bone-chilling whispers can be heard flowing in the wind, sinister laughter echoing through the darkness, and a creature lurking just beyond my headlights in the dead of night, only visible from a flicker in my peripheral. Never again will I doubt the stories told by fellow travelers. Never again will I take a shortcut through those wretched woods when darkness falls. And yet, even with these resolutions in mind, that eerie feeling always creeps into my bones whenever someone mentions Clancy Geller or the Sheep Man of Highwood Mountains. Perhaps some mysteries are better left to haunted memories. But maybe the ghosts of these strange events will continue tormenting me with glimpses under the uncertainty of nightfall for all the miles left to travel on this winding road called life.
I gripped the steering wheel tighter as I navigated my 18-wheeler down a notoriously menacing stretch of Interstate 10 in West Texas. This particular part of the highway always gave truck drivers like me an uneasy feeling. The vast emptiness and eerie silence were enough to send chills down your spine. But it wasn't until I reached the menacing Apache Canyon that I experienced something truly terrifying. It was August 17, 1998, and my name is Yarek Bertrand, a truck driver for over a decade. As I maneuvered through the dangerous canyon, my headlights illuminated something chilling, a mutilated deer carcass that seemed to have been ripped open. The sight caused me to blink hard and swallow the sudden lump in my throat. Seeing another semi up ahead, I sped up to catch up with the driver, a fellow trucker named Sefton Rollins. I needed someone familiar with this route who could calm my nerves and offer some company. We exchanged a few words through our CB radios and decided to pull into the upcoming rest stop for a break. As we huddled together at a picnic table, Sefton slowly began recounting stories he had heard about this very stretch of highway. According to him, there had been numerous mysterious disappearances over the years, all pointing towards one culprit, El Chupacabra, a grotesque creature that fed on livestock by sucking out their blood. I laughed nervously at first, but as we discussed it further, I found myself feeling more uneasy. The hair at the nape of my neck stood on end as Sefton's voice cracked with genuine terror when he described the chupacabra's sharp fangs and leathery skin. The conversation unsettled me so much that we decided to continue driving in tandem for some semblance of safety through that forsaken highway. As we approached Apache Canyon once more, we saw a truck stopped with its front end crumpled and smashed. Horrified, we leaped out of our trucks and rushed over to the wreckage. The driver, a man named Cormac Finnegan, was gazing in fear toward the nearby trees. He muttered something about a monstrous creature attacking his truck, its hideous reptilian countenance bearing an uncanny resemblance to El Chupacabra. As our eyes adjusted to the shadows, we spotted something large darting through the trees, a hulking beast whose eyes burned with a hateful ferocity. I could feel my heart pounding in my chest as Sefton, and I immediately reached for our guns. My hand was trembling as I raised my weapon, taking aim at the creature. The others did the same, and we began firing desperately. A deafening silence ensued as our bullets flew into the darkness. We need to get out of here, Sefton whispered urgently, his voice quivering. We scrambled to our trucks and sped off down the highway, leaving the remains of that terrifying encounter far behind us. Later on, we stopped at a trucker's bar, still reeling from the horrific events that had just transpired. Our conversation naturally turned to El Chupacabra and its dark origins. One grizzled patron revealed that the creature had started to appear after a series of strange experiments were allegedly conducted deep within those desert hills. He explained that years ago, Apache Canyon was known for its top-secret government testing site, where lab animals were exposed to extreme conditions. Some believe these supernatural beings were born as a result of those twisted experiments gone wrong. The chilling details resonated deeply within me as we sealed our jaws tight, understanding that we had narrowly escaped a fate worse than any of us could have ever imagined. Even now, there are nights when the dread that grips me as I drive my 18-wheeler through the arid highways while the mysteries of Apache Canyon haunt me won't go away. As time went on and countless other truck drivers shared their haunting experiences within that unforgiving stretch of highway, one truth remained. El Chupacabra and its grim origins remained an unsolved enigma. It was a harrowing reality that no amount of time or distance could erase. 
the memory lingers with me, a chilling reminder that some things are better left unknown. And so, with my grip tightening on the steering wheel and my eyes nervously scanning the seemingly endless expanse of arid desert, I couldn't help but wonder if that dreadful creature would ever terrorize me again. I tried to shake off the uneasy feeling and concentrate on the road ahead. Days had passed, and I hadn't seen or heard anything out of the ordinary. Everything seemed normal, just as it was before the encounter with the Chupacabra. It was around 7 p.m. on August 20th, 1998, when I parked my truck at another rest stop not far from where we had previously taken a break. Looking around, I noticed the place was nearly empty except for a few cars scattered in random spots. The sky was a mix of vibrant oranges and purples as the sun began to set. As I approached the restroom, I spotted a peculiar man leaning against the building. He appeared to be in his late forties, with a thinning hairline and a scruffy beard. His ice-cold blue eyes were fixated on me as if waiting for my arrival. There was something deeply unsettling about his demeanor. Yarek Bertrand, he said firmly, his voice raspy and unwelcoming. I've been waiting for you. Alarmed, I grabbed my pocket knife and demanded to know who he was and what he wanted with me. I'm Dr. Aaron Osborne a former geneticist from Apache Canyon's testing site, he replied gravely. As he spoke, he began recounting gruesome stories of twisted experiments conducted in secrecy within Apache Canyon, tales of violence and horror beyond belief. Dr. Osborne claimed that he had witnessed firsthand how these tests would create horrific mutations like El Chupacabra. More than anything else, he sought redemption for his involvement in the research project gone wrong. However, Dr. Osborne warned me that El Chupacabra had developed a taste for human blood aside from its usual feeding on livestock. While other livestock mutilations may go unnoticed or undocumented, when a human body appeared drained of life and bearing the telltale markings of the beast's vicious attack, people would start to ask questions. He pleaded with me for help, stating that he needed someone to deliver samples of a new experimental serum designed to counteract and eradicate the monsters created by the experiments. It was my chance to help put an end to this monstrous legacy before more lives were lost. With a heavy heart and mind racing, I agreed to assist Dr. Osborne. It was my duty not only as a truck driver but as a human being haunted by our encounter with the unspeakable creature lurking in Apache Canyon. I loaded the serum into my truck and waited for nightfall, as Dr. Osborne instructed. The screeches and howls in the distance reminded me of the dangerous mission I had agreed upon. Around 10.30 p.m., as I sat motionless in my truck, El Chupacabra emerged from the shadows. Fire lit within its hate-filled eyes as it approached me cautiously. Conjuring all my courage, I stepped out of the vehicle and faced it, holding a loaded syringe in my trembling hand. I lunged at the creature, plunging the syringe deep into its scaly hide. It roared in agony and rage but staggered back into the darkness as if the serum's effects had overwhelmed it. The following day, just when I thought everything was over, I received word from Dr. Osborne that there were more creatures like El Chupacabra roaming free in Apache Canyon. He begged me to continue our fight against these abominations until they were eradicated completely. As I drive through the desolate expanses of West Texas, my thoughts plagued by this newfound responsibility. I cannot shake that chilling feeling deep within me. Are we strong enough to combat these horrors unleashed upon our world? Now, as I grip the steering wheel tightly and prepare for the long haul ahead, I gaze into the eerie darkness of Apache Canyon and whisper a silent prayer. 
May we succeed in our mission to confront and subdue these merciless monsters, or else face the nightmarish fate that awaits us all. I bolted upright in my cab, parked just off Highway 371 near Pine River. The stinging sensation in my arm had snapped me out of a rare roadside nap. I rubbed the spot, trying to ignore the bothersome itch while trying to figure out what had caused it. It was on this job that I had a gut feeling that something terrible was about to unfold. The CB radio crackled and spat as it came to life with a voice from someone named Rennie Voss. Hey there, Ansel Briggs is speaking. Has anyone else stopped in the area of Pine River? I spotted some strange symbols on trees. I wasn't much for idle chit-chat, but the disturbance in the air made me curious. This is Vincent Mercer, I replied hesitantly my gut instinct growing stronger by the second. I'm nearby. What kind of symbols are you talking about? It looked almost like an inverted pentagram, Rennie answered with great concern. Other than that, there are torn animal carcasses scattered around. My heart raced as some unnamed terror unfolded before my eyes. This sounded far too ominous to be a simple act of vandalism, or a wild animal attack. The way Rennie described those symbols reminded me of stories circulating about the Pine River Butcher, a suspected serial killer who had left behind mutilated bodies along with cryptic signs. Feeling uneasy, I decided to investigate further with caution. As I cautiously stepped out of my truck and made my way closer to Rennie's location, I noticed a trail of blood leading into the woods just off the highway. With trembling hands, I grabbed my flashlight from the cab and followed the crimson path deeper into the darkness. Suddenly, I stumbled upon a mutilated deer carcass, its entrails spilling out and vultures greedily tearing out what remained. As morbidly fascinating as this scene was, I couldn't shake the thought that someone or something was capable of such a gruesome act. The images of deer carcasses swiftly turned into flashbacks of the Pine River Butcher's victims, their lifeless bodies similarly disfigured. Engulfed by the all-too-real terrors of my discovery, I scarcely heard Rennie's voice over the radio again. Vincent, get out of there! They're coming after you! My instincts screamed at me to flee, but I froze in my tracks as an overwhelming aura of malevolence grew around me. Shadows danced along the tree line, making it impossible to distinguish between reality and my imagination. Suddenly, a cold hand grabbed my shoulder, numbing everything in its icy grasp. I tried desperately to shake it off while fumbling with the flashlight only to hear more footsteps from all directions gradually closing in on me. I tried to warn you. Rennie's voice rasped in my ear as I blinked back tears of realization. Endless dread overwhelmed me as I found myself surrounded by figures adorned in black robes, followers of the Pine River Butcher who worshipped death and reveled in their ability to unleash violence upon unsuspecting victims. It was becoming apparent that their lust for blood knew no bounds. They were indeed a relentless, unstoppable force. But before they could lay their twisted hands on me, something else suddenly burst out from within the dense foliage. A monstrous creature with blood-red eyes tore into their ranks with unprecedented fury, eviscerating them one by one. And while this beast could potentially spare my life, I knew that accepting its mercy would only entrench me deeper into this nightmare. As the beast tore through the robed figures, I quickly realized the futility of my situation and decided to take advantage of the chaos and run. I sprinted back towards the highway with all my might, 
realizing that every step I took between me and this nightmare would increase my slim chances of survival. The cold night air burned my lungs, but I kept pushing on, praying to any higher power that would listen that the thing behind me wouldn't catch up. As I finally reached my truck, panting heavily and shaking uncontrollably, I noticed sparks flickering in the cab. Holding my breath, I peered through the window and saw a charred map, still smoking from some kind of fire. It showed a location not too far from where we were, an abandoned church. A sudden unearthly roar nearly pierced my eardrums as I whipped around to witness the mysterious creature that had saved me earlier locked into battle and who appeared to be the Pine River Butcher, a towering figure shrouded in tattered clothes, his face obscured by grotesque scars and rotten flesh hanging loosely on his skeletal frame. Despite the terror pulsing through every fiber of my being, something about that map intrigued me. A desperate lifeline, or a tiny sliver of hope, perhaps. Ignoring my better judgment while hearing their guttural snarls and cries grow distant allowed me a moment's bravery. Inhaling deeply, I jumped into my truck and sped off in search of this place that had consumed me with curiosity. The chill there nipped at my face as I barreled down the dark country road. Every passing tree cast foreboding shadows across my vehicle interior, which sent gruesome images dancing through my mind. As guided by some invisible hand, I maneuvered onto a winding dirt path leading directly to the decrepit church surrounded by dying trees. A cacophony of strange whispers filled the air, yet I still ventured inside. Beneath the church's rotting floorboards, I discovered a hidden passage leading down into a seemingly endless tunnel. My heart was pounding wildly in my chest as I descended into the darkness, driven equal parts by desperation and morbid curiosity. My flashlight flickered as I navigated the maze of tunnels below, the whispers in my ears growing louder and more intense with each step. Finally, I came across a sizable chamber filled with bones and increasingly intricate inverted pentagrams lit by dim candlelight. At the heart of this ritualistic lair sat a massive stone sarcophagus, a grotesque shrine dedicated to chaos, violence, and death. Etchings depicting otherworldly fiends surrounding a sacrificial altar climbed up its sides, subtly shifting like twisted shadows. A cold chill ran down my spine as realization washed over me. The Pine River Butcher had summoned that monstrous creature to guard his vile sanctuary. I snapped back to reality as a bone-chilling cackle echoed through the chamber. Eyes widening in horror, I knew what I needed to do. Placing my trembling hands on the sarcophagus lid, I enlisted every ounce of strength I had left in me and slammed it shut. An eerie silence immediately enveloped the chamber. As I trudged back above ground, beaten and bruised but alive, that chilling aroma of decay clung to my skin like an ill-fitting shroud. Driving away from that forsaken place, I made a silent vow never to speak of this nightmare again out loud or delve into truths best left buried. And while the beast may not have been slain nor the Pine River Butcher brought to justice yet, the fragile barrier between our worlds held true that night, perhaps offering those slain just a fleeting moment of respite in whatever hell greeted them next. But each shadow cast upon my path carried remnants of forbidden knowledge, glimpses of an abyss from which I would never truly escape. The faint sound of the radio playing country music pulled me from my daze. As the needle on the fuel gauge gradually inched toward E, I made my way to a truck stop in Pecos, Texas. My back felt tense, and my eyes ached from hours behind the wheel. I eased off the interstate, 
hoping refueling and a cup of coffee would bring me back to life. While maneuvering my 18-wheeler into one of the oversized parking spots at Apollonia's Truck Paradise, a sense of unease crept up on me. This place felt as hauntingly desolate as every other town on my latest route through West Texas. I stepped out of the cab and began filling up, the smell of diesel wafting through the air mixed in with dust and dried sunflowers. Striking up a conversation with a fellow trucker named Braun Jenkins helped shake off some of the gloominess. His laughter was infectious and genuine, yet he couldn't resist teasing me about how city folk like me never fare well in these parts. As we shared stories over a cup of black coffee inside the diner, Brown's smile grew somber when he recounted a man he once encountered on this lonely Texas stretch. Elijah Warren was a notorious name around these parts, a feared psychopath with long, greasy hair who was known for targeting truck drivers with his sadistic tendencies. My initial skepticism turned into concern when Braun detailed numerous encounters reported in bars and truck stops across these highways. Claims of Warren stalking drivers late at night, slashing tires, or sneaking into trucks to terrorize their inhabitants. A sudden chill washed over me as I recalled seeing glimpses of someone lurking around corners during my stops throughout this desolate area. Though I couldn't verify if it was Elijah Warren or just mere shadows playing tricks on me. Brown's reassurances fell flat when he admitted that no one had seen Warren for months. Some speculated he finally met his end, while others whispered about his imminent return. I shook off the hair-raising conversation and decided to head back out onto the open road, uneasy thoughts gnawing at the back of my mind. Soon, the hum of my truck's engine lulled me into a steady rhythm. The terror dulled to a quiet unease as I tried to shake off Brown's stories. Realizing just how late it was getting, I decided to pull over at the next rest area for some shut-eye. Finding a suitable spot, I turned off the engine and prepared to settle in for the night among fellow truckers and weary travelers. I hesitated for a moment, recalling tales of Elijah Warren delving stealthily into parked trucks. But ultimately, exhaustion took hold, and soon I drifted into an uneasy sleep beneath the vast Texas sky. Hours slipped by with nothing but the faint whispers of wind on my windshield. Suddenly, the sound of scratching shattered my dreams and replaced them with acute panic. Every muscle tensed as fear raced through me, heart pounding and hands clutching the steering wheel tightly. There was movement at my locked door, someone desperately trying to break in. My mind could only conjure terrifying images of Elijah Warren standing outside my cab, even though I couldn't be sure it was him. I mustered all the courage I could find and grabbed the flashlight from my glove compartment. Taking a deep breath, I suddenly swung open the door, shining the light directly at the intruder. To my surprise, it wasn't Elijah Warren at all but a teenager with messy blonde hair and dirt-covered clothes, wearing a desperate expression. The boy pleaded for my help, explaining that he had been on the run from someone for hours and was terrified. As we sat in my cab, I offered him some water while he recounted his story. His name was Josh, and he had been hitchhiking through Texas when a man picked him up. According to Josh, this man was tall with greasy long hair and a patchy beard, alarmingly close to the description of Elijah Warren. He told me they had been driving along when the man stopped at an abandoned farmhouse and proceeded to reveal a hidden room filled with bloody instruments, also mentioning a recent attack on another truck driver. Panicked, Josh managed to escape through an open window before running all night until he found my truck. Concerned for both our safety and thinking about Brown's stories of Elijah Warren, I requested that he wait in the cab while I checked around. 
We looked for any signs of danger or flat tires that might have been tampered with, but finding none, we cautiously hit the road together. We agreed to drive straight back to Apollonia's truck paradise, report what happened to the authorities, and warn Braun as well. As we drove under the moonlit sky along this isolated stretch of highway, each minute passed like an hour. My mind raced with thoughts about what would happen next. Would we run into that scary figure, or could we safely reach our destination? Adrenaline surged through my veins as every shape on the side of the road seemed threatening in one way or another. Just before sunrise, we finally made it back to Pecos. Tired but with renewed hope, we parked the truck at the diner and headed inside to find Braun and report the incident. Relief washed over us when we found him unharmed and chatting with a local sheriff. As we explained the situation to them, with particulars about Josh's encounter with Elijah Warren, blood drained from their faces. The sheriff called into the station, requesting backup and informing his deputies about our whereabouts. He decided to follow us to the abandoned farmhouse Josh had escaped from. Trepidation took hold as we reached that desolate place on a bleak Texas morning. The old farmhouse reeked of fear and decay as we stood outside it while the sheriff carefully searched the interior. He emerged pale-faced and horrified, confirming that there was indeed a hidden torture room that Elijah Warren must have used on his victims. What chilled me was the sheriff's discovery, trucker licenses collected as trophies by Warren. Within days, law enforcement officers swarmed the area but found no trace of Elijah Warren. However, they thanked both Josh and me for providing valuable information that would help in their ongoing investigation. He may not have been captured yet, but at least we had done what we could to shed some light on the darkness he created in these forgotten parts of our world. As much as I wanted to continue driving trucks for a living, my life would never be the same after those horrifying events in Texas. I've since quit trucking and settled down in a small town, where I'm finally free from restless nights haunted by shadows that followed me on desolate highways. But deep down, I know it isn't over. Elijah Warren is still out there somewhere, and maybe one day, he'll come back for me. I remember the first time I picked up a load from the storage facility out in Pine Ridge, South Dakota. Local legends spoke of a mysterious figure lurking in the area. I had heard stories about it from fellow truckers at roadside diners, but I didn't believe in that kind of thing. No one ever saw its face, but rumor had it that this figure was responsible for countless gruesome deaths and disappearances over the years. People said it was like some kind of ghost or an ancient spirit that had inhabited the land long before any of us were even thought of. It must have been a few months ago when I was en route to my next delivery. I needed to stop by Pine Ridge again to pick up another order. My boss had specifically requested that I use an old and nearly abandoned storage warehouse in that region. Unloading my truck, I caught sight of a strange man standing near one of the storage units. He looked out of place, with his tattered clothes and unkempt hair giving him a disheveled appearance. Before I could even offer assistance, he vanished into thin air. That night, as I slept in the cab of my truck, I heard faint screams and muffled cries echoing out from the darkness around me. Jumping into action, I grabbed my flashlight and ran toward the sounds, only to find nothing. The next morning, as I prepared to leave with my load, a local approached me. You know Jackson Winters? He asked hesitantly. Caught off guard by this inquiry, I nodded slowly. 
Jackson Winters was one of those individuals who went missing over a decade ago. Well, continued the man with fearful eyes. My cousin found something while fixing up a house nearby. It might be his body. He pulled out his phone and showed me photos that were almost unbearable to look at. Mutilated remains tangled amongst torn up furniture and debris. That ain't all, the man added quietly. We found scratch marks and bits of flesh inside the warehouse, like someone, or something, tried to drag these bodies away. As he walked off, I couldn't shake the sense of dread that enveloped me. Weeks later, after countless restless nights and a constant feeling of paranoia, I discovered the locals shared a chilling theory. There might be a human or inhuman entity preying on people around Pine Ridge. The more I considered that possibility, the more I began to feel drawn back to that old warehouse. As if it were speaking to some part of me, I never knew existed until that moment. So here I am now, driving towards Pine Ridge once again. The sun is setting, casting an eerie glow over the barren landscape. I approach the storage facility with caution and anticipation. I step out of my truck, feeling oddly like a moth being lured into a flame. As the sun disappears and darkness fully takes its place, I hear a low growl coming from behind one of the abandoned storage units. My heart pounds in my chest as I grip my flashlight tightly, moving slowly toward where the sound originated. This time, I know I won't be alone when I confront the source of the growl and find myself face to face with a figure that is as horrifying as it is human. Standing at least seven feet tall, it has a gaunt frame, barely covered in pale, marred skin. It appears sickly, with bulging veins running along its limbs. Unnervingly long fingers, tipped with razor-sharp nails, extend from their hands. Its face is what truly chills my blood, a twisted mockery of a human visage if you could even call it that. The thing barely had any features, no lips or nose to speak of, just ragged slits where they should be. The only discernible aspect was its glassy eyes, black orbs unblinking and devoid of life. It radiates an unsettling aura that settles against my chest like ice. What the hell are you? I ask in an attempt to conceal my fear as my flashlight trembles in my grasp. It glares at me, meeting my gaze for a torturous few moments before letting out another hellish growl. Suddenly, it lunges towards me with preternatural speed. Unthinkingly, I swing my flashlight at it with all the force I can muster, and it connects solidly with what feels like a bony jawline. With a guttural shriek of pain and frustration, the creature stumbles back for a moment. I scramble towards my truck to grab something, anything, that might serve as a weapon before diving back into the fight. In those few moments of reprieve, my mind begins working through possibilities. I recall the stories shared by scared locals and think back to that terrible sight of Jackson Winter's mangled body. Those distorted limbs, this thing must have been responsible for his death and countless others. As I charge back towards it, brandishing two tire irons, it initially responds defensively before briefly backing away. But I know better than to assume this is a retreat. In an instant, it lashes out with its grotesque arms and connects with my side, sending a white-hot lance of pain shooting through me. Saturday, 9.37 p.m. My back hits the ground hard and knocks the wind out of me. As I try to suck in the air desperately, I see the creature loom over me with those lifeless eyes. What do you want from us? I manage to choke out between ragged breaths. A guttural cry escapes it, and it raises one long-fingered hand to strike me down. But as its arm descends... An ear-splitting siren starts to resound through the darkness. The unexpected sound causes the creature to hesitate. 
Suddenly, two police cars come speeding towards us in response to my silent alarm. Their lights search the darkness, and one catches the monster in its glare. I watch as it howls in pain and takes off like a bat out of hell into the darkness beyond the warehouses. Monday, 11.26 a.m., nursing bruised ribs and countless scratches from our altercation, I met with local law enforcement to discuss what happened. They are reluctant to pass this off as anything more than an animal attack gone awry until DNA results from Jackson Winter's body reveal traces consistent with human cannibalism. Nobody can say for certain who or what this creature from Pine Ridge is. The authorities are determined to pursue any lead they might find. But there is only so much they can do, so much they're willing to risk, before their search turns cold and becomes just another unsolved case. As for me, I swear never to set foot in Pine Ridge again. That monster, human or otherwise, still walks those lands looking for prey. And should our paths ever cross again, I wonder if we could avoid descending into one final, blood-soaked dance of death. I was driving my rig through the quiet back roads near Eureka, Nevada, en route to delivering a shipment of heavy machinery. The sun had just slipped below the horizon, and the air took on a certain coldness as darkness fell. That evening felt different somehow, but I couldn't quite put my finger on it. Heading further down the road, I suddenly felt a strange sinking sensation in my gut. I had never been one to dabble in superstitions or folklore, but something about this stretch of road unsettled me. Further ahead, in my headlights, I saw a figure hunched over something on the asphalt. My instinct told me to step on it and get out of there fast, but innate curiosity had me easing my foot off the gas pedal. As I approached, the figure stood up and stepped away from whatever it had been detaching from its grasp. It was an old woman in tattered clothes with wild, unkempt hair. Need any help? I shouted through my truck's window. I could use a ride. She replied in a voice that sounded like gravel crunching beneath tires. I hesitated for a moment, but ultimately decided to let her in, thinking it wasn't too dangerous since she appeared frail and harmless. I'm Everett Collins. I said as she settled into the passenger seat. Marjorie Jacobson, she revealed before latching onto an uncomfortable silence between us. When we were deeper into the dark, winding roads of Nevada's rural landscape, Marjorie finally began talking. She spoke about people who disappeared on these roads over the years, specifically mentioning names like Harold Latchman and Rosa Talbert that appeared unusual. What happened to them? I asked, gripping the steering wheel tighter as goosebumps prickled on my skin. They say it's the walker, Marjorie whispered, her voice quivering ever so slightly. A creature that roams these roads, hunting those who don't belong. My skepticism was palpable. Oh, come on. You don't really believe that nonsense, do you? Stories like that will turn any perfectly explainable disappearance into some kind of unsolved mystery. But Marjorie seemed unfazed and continued. They say the walker is from a time long forgotten, with a hunger never satiated. Every year, people go missing on these very roads, their bodies found mutilated and broken. The authorities eventually stopped looking for the cause and chalked it up to wild animals or accidents. An uneasy feeling overwhelmed me, making me question my own convictions. The conversation was getting heavy, but it wasn't until Marjorie asked me to pull over so she could relieve herself that things took a turn for the worse. I noticed something odd as I waited. 
There were remnants of shredded clothes on the roadside and a foul stench in the air that turned my stomach. When Marjorie emerged from behind a bush, her eyes held a terrifying coldness that made my heart race with fear. Drive, she commanded, now with an entirely different voice, deep, powerful, resonating throughout my entire body. At that moment, I knew there was something much bigger at play here than just an old woman needing a ride, something I couldn't rationalize or even try to comprehend. As we continued down the road, I heard an unsettling cracking sound coming from Marjorie's body. The noise grew louder and quickly became unbearable. She seemed to be transforming into something unnatural right in front of my eyes a nightmarish creature unfolding within the narrow space of my truck's cabin. I couldn't believe what I was seeing, Marjorie Jacobson transforming into a grotesque creature right before my eyes. Her limbs twisted unnaturally, and her former frail body morphed into a bipedal anomaly with elongated limbs and a hunched back. Her ravenous eyes had now turned pitch black, and her mouth stretched, revealing rows of razor-sharp teeth. What are you? I stammered, trying to maintain control of the truck. Marjorie, or whatever she had become, let out an inhuman scream that chilled me to my very core. I am the walker, she snarled, saliva dripping from her malformed mouth. The truck swerved as I struggled to focus on both the road and this horrifying creature that sat beside me. My heart pounded wildly in my chest, but I knew I had to remain as calm as possible if I were to get through this night alive. Looking around, terrified and desperate for a way to save myself, I spotted a semi-truck approaching behind us. The wheels started turning in my head as I realized that if I could somehow signal the driver for help without alerting the walker, maybe there was still a chance to survive this nightmare. As we neared a bend in the road I took my chance. Rolling down my window slightly, I stuck my hand out in waving motions at the driver behind us. Glancing over at the walker, it appeared not to have noticed. Perhaps it was preoccupied with its own sinister thoughts. To my relief, the driver of the semi seemed to have noticed my distress signals and flashed his high beams, which then reflected off the metal surface lining the bridge just ahead. The sudden brightness caught the walker off guard as it recoiled from the light, its unfamiliar torso contracting like it was in pain. Seizing this opportunity and with adrenaline coursing through me, I cranked the wheel, causing the rig to veer towards the guardrail of the bridge. The truck screeched, and metal groaned against metal as we collided, throwing both me and the walker against the impacted side of the truck. In my peripheral vision, I could see the walker clawing at the passenger side window, its powerful arms breaking through in terror to escape. But before it could pull its twisted body out of the cabin, it lost its grip and tumbled down into the ravine below. It let out a gut-wrenching scream, one I would never forget, etched in my mind forever. As for me, I hung there, suspended by my seatbelt, in the mangled mess of my truck. Only moments later, the semi-driver pulled over and ran to my aid. He climbed up to me while swiftly dialing emergency services on his cell phone. Hang on, buddy! He shouted as he cut through my seatbelt with a pocket knife. Moments later, first responders arrived at the scene, administering medical assistance while searching for any sign of the walker in the riverbed below. However, their efforts were fruitless. Days later, I awoke in a hospital bed bruised and alive but with family and friends visiting one at a time due to hospital regulations. The authorities never found any trace of the walker that harrowing night. It remained elusive like countless times before. As much as I wished to expose its existence to prevent it from hurting more people traveling these Nevada roads, 
I knew that such a story would only be met with disbelief and mockery. So now, whenever I hear of another unexplained disappearance in rural Nevada, I grit my teeth and pray for those unfortunate souls that cross paths with Marjorie Jacobson, or more precisely, the walker. It was 2.37 a.m. on the outskirts of Fort Collins, Colorado, when my world flipped upside down. I had been driving trucks for six years and loved the freedom of the open road. That morning was routine, just me, my rig, and a fresh cup of coffee from a roadside diner, or so I thought. Little did I know, it would soon become anything but usual. The eerie silence was broken as Donovan, a fellow trucker on the same route, crackled through my CB radio. Hey, Elwood, are you hearing about all that messed up stuff happening along this stretch lately? Yeah, Downey, I responded, adjusting my cap as I took a swig of coffee. I've heard some crazy stories on the news, but you know how they like to exaggerate. There it was the first piece of what would turn out to be a puzzle far more sinister and terrifying than anything we'd ever known. About an hour later, east of Cheyenne on Route 80, Donovan's desperate voice startled me from my thoughts. Elwood, pull over now. There's something in the road. Quickly maneuvering my truck to a stop on the side of the desolate highway, I squinted through the darkness. An enormous figure lay sprawled across the pavement, surrounded by splinters and the shattered remains of what used to be someone's home. I grabbed my flashlight and cautiously approached. What I found made my stomach lurch, a giant creature, some cross between man and bear, decimated beyond recognition. The stench of blood mixed with gasoline made me gag. Donovan pulled his rig beside mine and scrambled out. Well, what is this thing? He asked in horror. Beats me, I grunted. At that moment, fear knotted our stomachs, like we were prey about to be hunted. Rumors spread like wildfire among us truckers that a beast, a local folklore monster known as the Mamalek, was responsible for the carnage. Many refused to believe it, latching on to more rational theories of a sociopath on a rampage or even a militia leaving destruction in their wake. But we had all seen the remains. An ordinary human could not wreak this level of havoc. Everything changed when, one evening, Donovan and I came across another crime scene. Missing limbs, not bones, and grotesque horrors that made us physically ill took the place of the victim's remains. With each new gruesome discovery, our dread multiplied, and chilling whispers echoed between us. It's still out there. Desperate to save others from sharing the same fate, we banded together with fellow truckers and formed an informal vigilante team. We spread out along the deadliest stretches of highway our shining beacons guiding those who crossed paths with Mamalek. Though our efforts were valiant and tireless, darkness crept back in, and more lives were lost. With no resolution in sight and terror escalating daily, paranoia ruled our once tight-knit community. It seemed as if Mamalek had infiltrated every corner of our lives, leaving no one unscathed. Clutching their guns and holding back tears, Donovan and I went searching one last time for answers or solace, anything to silence our mounting dread. And then we saw her, hulking and monstrous as she stalked a young woman through the shadows beside the highway. Despite our terror and having no idea how to stop her, we knew we couldn't leave this woman to suffer the atrocious fate so many others had. Heart pounding, Teeth clenched in adrenaline-fueled determination, we sprinted towards Mamalek. As Donovan and I sprinted towards the monstrous Mamalek, 
time seemed to slow. Its grotesque figure consisted of a mix of human and bear features. Bones clung to its massive body with thin, rotting flesh, and its eyes were like two small black holes, void of any recognizable emotion. It was 3.28 a.m. when Mamlek realized we were approaching. The menacing creature growled in a fury that shook us to our very core and abandoned the young woman it had been stalking. As it stood up to face us, our hearts pounded in our chests as we both hesitated with overwhelming fear. Well, are you going to do something or just stand there? Donovan hissed through clenched teeth, shoving me onward. I took a deep breath and finally found the resolve to move. Dodging Mamlek's deadly claws, I hurled my flashlight at its massive head. It only served to enrage the beast further. It was clear that brute force wouldn't do much against such a supernatural entity. We needed a different approach. I shouted over the chaos for Donovan to look for any abnormalities in Mamlek's form while keeping her distracted. It was 3.45 a.m. when we noticed a peculiar mark on her upper right arm. It looked like a crude sigil carved into her flesh, perhaps linked to her origins or powers. Aim for the mark! I screamed above the din of Mamalek's enraged roars. Donovan nodded and ran towards his truck to retrieve an old shotgun he kept stashed away for emergencies. Meanwhile, I put myself between Mamalek and the young woman, trying my best to block her path. At 3.52 a.m., my ears spiked with pain from a gunshot that rang out in the dark night. Donovan had risked his life for this shot and somehow managed to land it directly upon the sigil on Mamalek's arm. The beast shrieked out in pain for the first time that night flailing and howling a gut-wrenching lament that sent chills down our spines. Nevertheless, it did not die. Instead, the sigil mark began to emit streams of dark smoke from its deep grooves, and the ancient horror was slowly dragged downward towards some unknown abyss. By 4.03 a.m., Mamalek had entirely disappeared into the shadows. As we stood in confusion over the spot where she had sunk into the earth, a woman with silver hair emerged from behind a tree clutching a leather-bound notebook. She explained how she had been studying Mamalek for years, observing its exploits from afar. Her true name is Ashara, she said as she flipped through her notebook full of carefully drawn sigils. She was cursed by a vengeful shaman to endlessly roam this land fueled by rage and agony. The mysterious woman revealed that Mamalek could not be killed but implied that our efforts had weakened her temporarily. Although we were haunted by knowing Mamalek still existed, we couldn't help but feel somewhat content that we'd managed to buy a few peaceful days for the people traveling through these roads. As 4.15 a.m. slowly gave way to dawn, Donovan and I finally parted ways and returned to our trucks. The sun painted a new day over the horizon as we continued our respective journeys along the open road, each aware of the lingering darkness that remained hidden beneath its tarmac. From that day forward, our camaraderie strengthened as we knew only each other fully understood the terror we'd faced together. And though Mamalek would rise again one day without warning or mercy, so too would we be there, ready and waiting to confront it once more. It was in a small, dusty parking lot, squeezed between the highway and a row of skeletal trees, back when the time was almost an afterthought for me. I had pulled my truck to the side near Wilkes Bar, Pennsylvania, an area not particularly lively but necessary for work. My name is Elamine Stavrides, and I'd been driving trucks all my life, carrying loads of freight cross-country. 
As I stepped out of my cabin to stretch my legs and smoke a cigarette, I felt a strange uneasiness in the air. It's tricky to put into words but imagine the touch of a cold breeze that made your skin crawl as though you knew something was off. But here, on a chilly February evening, it was more than just Pennsylvania's biting wind. Inhaling one last drag, I tossed my cigarette onto the pavement and crushed it underfoot. Thoughts of getting back on the road swirled in my mind when I heard an unfamiliar voice coming from behind one of those withered trees. Mister? Could you spare some change? Just trying to make it through the night. I squinted, barely making out the gaunt figure shivering in a thin jacket amid the darkening twilight. Looking closer, I saw that he seemed malnourished like years had been chiseled away from his body. Yeah, sure, I replied gruffly as I fished out some coins from my pocket and handed them over. Have you seen anything weird around here lately? I asked him casually. For a moment, he hesitated before muttering broken stories about someone named Ben Zdopera, some enigmatic figure who'd been abducting and torturing people in the area leaving no trace behind but fear and terror. His serious expression sent an icy shiver down my spine. Later that evening, while driving off, I speculated about this Ben's character. Could he be a deranged serial killer, a lost soul not unlike the skeletal man I left behind? Perhaps there was something more haunting about him that no one could grasp. That night, I noticed something strange as I was heading to the local convenience store. A shadowy figure was lurking near the alley where a few young men were smoking. As I approached, an indescribable stench overcame me, making it hard to breathe. More worrying, though, was the fleeting glimpse of that figure's face. It bore an eerie resemblance to the gaunt man from earlier but was contorted in a grotesque manner that highlighted its hunger for pain and suffering. The sense of dread intensified as the figure seemed to melt into the surrounding darkness. Had I just witnessed the notorious Ben's opera? I can't provide any concrete evidence or confirmation, but deep down, I felt that whatever horrors lurked within his heart had targeted those now petrified boys. Even after all these years and countless miles under my belt, I still keep my guard up in remote locations at the mercy of anonymity, a safety instinct fortified by what I had seen that day in Wilkes Bar. I may not know for certain if Ben's Dopra existed or if he was a tortured soul craving retribution against his own kind. But one thing is clear, some monsters still lurk in our world. Glancing back at their hiding spots in dark corners of seemingly innocuous places, we are blissfully unaware of their presence. They watch, they wait. The next day, I couldn't shake the image of that gaunt figure from my mind. I talked to some fellow truck drivers at the local diner and gathered as much information as possible about Ben's opera. It turned out that a few of them had also encountered this sinister character during their stops around Wilkes Bar. After finishing my meal, I decided to stay in town for another day to try to put an end to this terror once and for all. I bought a disposable camera at a nearby store and set off to collect concrete evidence of this enigmatic antagonist's existence and activities. Around 3.22 p.m., I spotted that dark figure again, lurking not too far from the spot where I'd met the skeletal man two nights prior. Up close, I could now see Ben's grotesque visage, sunken eyes peering with malice, grotesque scars covering his face, and a perverse grin that seemed unwavering despite his increasingly disfigured features. Clutching my camera in my trembling hands, I aimed and took several pictures as he slowly approached a group of teenagers engaged in conversation near the alleyway. His movements were predatory, striding forward with calculated precision, instilling intimidation in everyone nearby. 
The overpowering stench seemed to emanate from his very skin, which bore sickly hues of decay. As Benz descended upon the teens like a vulture on its prey, an unnatural rage surged through me. I knew that if they were not saved quickly, these unfortunate witnesses would be Ben's next victims in his twisted path of pain. Without hesitation, I rushed towards the menace about to bear down upon them and screamed at the top of my lungs. Hey! Get away from them! Suddenly startled by my presence and interference, Ben's quickly turned towards me and let out a guttural growl that sounded both human and animalistic a shocking incongruity that sent a jolt of dread down my spine. The repulsion in his eyes was all-consuming. It felt as if I was looking at the very essence of evil. What do you want? He snarled, bearing rotten teeth that seemed to be held together by some unnerving dark substance. I brandished the camera, now struggling to maintain my own composure. I've got pictures of you. I'm going to expose what you've been doing here in this town, so you better back off and leave these kids alone. I managed a hint of authority despite the quiver in my voice. My intervention provided the youngsters just enough time to scramble away from his clutches. With a guttural laugh, Benz narrowed his gaze at me. You think your paltry pictures will stop me? He sneered. People have tried before and failed miserably. As he lunged towards me, I instinctively swung the camera as hard as I could, smashing it directly into his contorted face. Blood splattered across the pavement, yet strangely, either crack nor bruise graced Ben's bizarre visage. His eerie grin remained intact, a grim emblem of sinister stoicism. Feeling the situation grow increasingly dire, I seized this moment of distraction and fled towards the safety of a nearby gas station. Tire iron in hand for some semblance of protection should Benz choose to pursue me after mending what should have been a grievous wound. By some strange stroke of luck or divine intervention, Benz had vanished once more into the shadows, but not without leaving a haunting reminder. Bloodied streaks ran along the alley walls where his distorted form once stood, a sinister signature marking his inevitable return. I couldn't believe it. Even with all my best efforts to intervene and collect evidence against this monster, nothing had changed. The terrifying specter of Ben's opera still haunted the town of Wilkesbar, and his victim's suffering obviously continued unhindered. Though I knew it was far from over, a small sense of satisfaction briefly filled my psyche. At least for that day, I'd managed to protect someone from a gruesome fate at the hands of this deranged phantom dubbed Ben's Opera. All I could do now was pray that, through some twist of fate or fortune, this monster would one day reap what he'd sown and extinguish the fire of malice burning within his rotted heart. I was enjoying a hot cup of coffee perched atop a hill that overlooks the small town of Conifer Falls in Montana. It's always been quite a sight, with the cascading river shimmering in the distance and the tall pine tree shadows stretching out like fingers. That day had started innocently enough. I never knew I'd be witnessing unspeakable horrors. My name is Daxton Maddox and I'm a truck driver by profession. I've been doing it for 15 years now, and it's your usual day in, day out routine. Except that day was different. Later that afternoon, after having my fill of nature and caffeine, I started making my way through town to drop off some cargo at the local supermarket. When I arrived, there was an uneasy tension lingering in the air. So, how's life been treating you, Vasilios? I asked my old friend, who owns the store while signing the delivery papers. 
Ah, better days, Daxton. Better days, he replied with a sigh. You wouldn't believe this town's luck recently. Vasilios proceeded to tell me about a series of grisly murders that rocked Conifer Falls over the past few weeks. All victims left mutilated and defiled. The small-town gossip suggested it might be the work of Jack Silvermane, a notorious serial killer who escaped prison three months before. As I hit the road again, his words kept echoing in my mind. What was once familiar streets started feeling foreign. My eyes were scanning every corner for signs of danger. It wasn't until night fell that things took a turn for the worse. Driving on Copperwood Lane, a narrow, winding road through dense forestry, I spotted a man stumbling out of the underbrush, bloodied and terrified. Slamming on my brakes and rushing out to help him, he gasped to me that he'd been attacked by someone or something that had already claimed his friends. He whispered the name, Jack Silvermane, just as his eyes rolled back leaving me with a lifeless body in my arms. As I frantically dialed 911 to report the attack, I felt something observing me from the woods. A bone-chilling breeze whistled through the trees, signaling that whatever evil we were dealing with might still be lurking nearby. There was an intense aura of menace in the air. Every fiber of my being was telling me to run. However, I couldn't bring myself to leave the stranger's gruesome corpse unattended until it received some form of dignity. It was a painful wait for the local police, who arrived to collect his remains and inquire about any details of the incident. Detective Carswell questioned me in excruciating detail as I recounted what happened, but I couldn't shake this feeling that he wasn't sharing everything he knew about Jack Silvermane. The detective's eyes betrayed a certain familiarity with this tormentor. Look, Daxton, you know how these small towns go. Detective Carswell confided in me with a forced smile. Legends start, and people talk. But, it's important now to remain very vigilant. He shuffled anxiously before continuing. And if you hear or see anything else, you call me right away at this number. I nodded and exchanged awkward pleasantries as we parted ways while she cautioned me not to discuss this matter with others. So now, here I stand behind my bedroom window, peering out into the darkness at night, thick with gloom and uncertainty. Knowing deep down that unimaginable horrors are out there, waiting, but is it really Jack Silvermane? Or is it something entirely different? As I sit bolt upright in my bed, cold sweat streaming down my face, my dreams are haunted by those final words from Detective Carswell. Just remember, Daxton. We never did find the body of Jack Silvermane's last victim. Terrified to fall asleep again but unable to move, all I can do is pray for some form of respite from these nightmares as I clench a rosary in my white-knuckled hands. And yet, outside my window, amidst the howls of wind and incessant shadows creeping across my yard, there remains an agonizing dread. The agonizing dread that lingered outside my window persisted, pushing me to take matters into my own hands. I felt a compulsion to uncover the truth, despite the overwhelming fear gripping my heart. I knew that the strange occurrences happening recently had something to do with Jack Silvermane, but I couldn't simply sit and wait for fate to reveal its own plans. The next day, I decided to investigate Copperwood Lane, the place where I found the bloodied man just hours ago. Using the tire iron from my truck as an impromptu weapon for defense, I cautiously entered the dense woods that flanked the road. As I ventured further into the woods, I stumbled upon a chilling sight, a bloody mess of human remains scattered carelessly on the forest floor. The mutilated bodies appeared to have been torn apart as if by an animal, or by something monstrous. Just then, 
I heard something stir in the bushes nearby. Fear propelled me to confront whatever lay hidden. As I approach, my heart pounding in my chest, what emerged from behind the leaves was an extremely tall man with wild, dark hair covering half his face. His eyes were sunken and filled with an eerie coldness. His teeth were sharpened like razor blades, and his hands were large and rigid. Fingers adorned with such long nails they resembled eight-inch steel daggers. But what really stood out was a strange scripture etched across his forehead in jagged letters. Silver Mane. My stomach dropped as recognition set in. This monstrous figure was, without doubt, Jack Silvermane himself. At precisely 1.43 p.m. on the day when daylight doesn't seem like enough protection anymore. Jack let out a guttural growl and lunged at me with blinding speed. In those few precious seconds before impact, my reflexes kicked in. I took a swing at him with the tire iron, but doubt set in on whether I could fend him off with a mere piece of metal. Thankfully, it caught him right across the temple, sending the beast of a man crashing onto the forest floor. My heart raced as I stared down at Jack Silvermane's unconscious body, wondering what to do next. I knew I couldn't simply walk away, leaving this deranged individual free to kill again, so I pulled my cell phone from my pocket and dialed Detective Carswell's number. Hey, Daxton, you got something for me? He answered. Barely able to catch my breath, I relayed my harrowing encounter urging him to come quickly. Stay put. I'll bring it back up, was Detective Carswell's grim response. As I awaited law enforcement among the grisly remains strewn across the forest floor and the eerie stillness of Jack Silvermane's unconscious body, I had only one question lingering in my mind. How does one stop a man who can't be captured or killed? Would he remain dormant forever, or was this just another chapter in his tale of terror? Detective Carswell led the police reinforcements when they finally arrived. They meticulously surveyed the gruesome scene and cuffed Jack Silvermane, all the while whispering apprehensively amongst themselves about their past unsuccessful attempts to apprehend him. After everything was done and daylight began to fade over Copperwood Lane, Detective Carswell approached me with a heavy sigh. He shook my hand firmly and said something that sent chills down my spine. Daxton, you've done something incredible today, but somehow, deep down, I know this story ain't finished. It all began on a seemingly ordinary Tuesday as I drove my truck down the deserted Route 50 in Nevada, known as the loneliest road in America. The sun was setting, casting a beautiful, flaming orange hue over the distant mountains. Little did I know the chilling events that were about to unfold. I'd pulled into a rest stop called Cold Spring Station originally an old Pony Express station built in 1861. It was a slightly dilapidated building with boarded-up windows nestled beside a dry creek bed that once provided water to travelers crossing the harsh terrain. There was something eerie about the place, although I couldn't quite put my finger on it. My name is Selim Rosenwood, and I've been driving trucks for about 15 years. Long-haul trips are my bread and butter. They give me time to think, allow me to enjoy the open road, and allow me to explore some of the more forgotten corners of this vast country. As I leaned against my truck, stretching my legs, I noticed another visitor at the rest stop, a woman by herself named Lyrica Fawn. She had big, dark eyes and frizzy hair that framed her gaunt face. She appeared nervous and uneasy about something but dismissed my concern when I asked if everything was all right. 
We struck up a conversation to pass the time as we both waited for our travel companions to return from foraging for food nearby. Mine being my trusty dog Whiskey, hers being her husband, Harvey. Lyrica told me she'd recently heard unsettling stories of travelers disappearing along this very stretch of Route 50 that we were traversing. Suddenly, Whiskey came bounding out of the bushes, with Harvey following slowly behind him. He nervously rambled about finding strange symbols painted on rocks nearby while holding an old book he'd found discarded by the creek bed. The symbols matched those within its pages, old Native American symbols intended to ward off evil spirits known as Tyop, insidious creatures that hunted the souls of the living. As night fell, we decided to keep each other company and build a campfire, unsure of what would come in the darkness. Harvey fed the fire while I shared stories about my crazy adventures on the road, trying to lighten the mood. But Lyrica couldn't shake her anxiety. She stared into the flame with a haunted expression. That's when we heard the first blood-curdling scream from a distance. The hairs on our arms stood up as our hearts raced. Swiftly, we extinguished the fire and scrambled into my truck to turn on the CB radio hoping to alert others nearby. We received static-filled responses from panicked drivers describing similar horrifying noises and tales of their companions inexplicably vanishing. Gripping my shotgun tightly, I peered through the darkness, beads of sweat dripping down my brow. Harvey urged his wife to stay within the confines of my truck while he and I ventured out, armed with knives and flashlights in a futile attempt to understand our increasingly dangerous predicament. We came upon more unsettling scenes as we investigated. A nearby camper was abandoned, its occupants nowhere to be found. Only blood-stained fabric remained. A trail of crimson led us directly to one of those creepy symbols painted upon a rock. It seemed as though these terrifying events were hardly coincidental. Suddenly, Harvey grabbed my shoulder and whispered urgently, There! In the shadows! As I watched in horror, an enormous creature loomed over us, its silver-gray fur blending with the moonlight-drenched terrain. It let out an earth-shattering growl that sent chills down our spines. This was undoubtedly one of those elusive tile Lyrica had warned us about earlier. The beast lunged at Harvey before he had time to react, his screams forever echoing in my mind. The creature's razor-sharp claws tore through the fabric of reality itself, leaving Harvey to vanish in a bloody haze. I didn't know if this tie could be killed, but running didn't seem like an option. Gathering every shred of courage I had left, I charged the terrifying being with my shotgun raised prepared to battle the otherworldly menace before me. The shotgun roared as I fired at the creature, its body momentarily recoiling from the impact. Yet, instead of falling, it merely let out an enraged snarl and started to regenerate rapidly before my eyes. Its eyes, cold, black pools, bore into me, filling me with unspeakable fear. My hands trembled as I reloaded and prepared for another shot. The monster stalked closer, its silver fur bristling and glistening under the moonlight. Its massive body towered over me, nearly eight feet tall with a bulk that resembled more of a bear than a man. Its face was an abomination, twisted and contorted even as human-like features shimmered beneath its feral expression. Having no other choice, I aimed at its head and pulled the trigger, hoping to stop it once and for all. Amazingly, though, the creature deflected the bullets with its massive arms, leaving me defenseless. It lunged at me but suddenly froze in place. What do you want? I blurted it out in desperation, realizing that confronting this creature seemed futile. It stared down at me for what felt like an eternity before emitting a guttural growl, 
almost as if trying to communicate. Then it stopped and looked beyond me toward where Lyrica remained in my truck. Harvey's words echoed in my mind about those ancient symbols intended to ward off the tile. What if the answer could be found in that old book? Perhaps there was something Lyrica could decipher that might save us. Wait! I called out breathlessly to the monster while backing slowly away from it. Letting Harvey be taken was not in vain. There had to be a solution, some way to protect ourselves from these evil spirits lurking on Route 50. I sprinted towards my truck, praying that Lyrica would have an answer for me. As I approached her trembling figure, she nervously flipped through the book, her fingers landing on a passage that spoke of a ritual that could repel the tile. In haste, we collected the few items needed for the ceremony, local herbs and minerals strewn across the desolate desert landscape. Lyrica began chanting an ancient phrase, her voice trembling with fear yet persistent in finding a solution. The monster was trying to escape an invisible barrier by growling and clawing at the air in front of it. The ritual was working, but the barrier would not hold forever if we didn't finish in time. As we continued the ritual, Lyrica painted the protective symbols on our bodies using a mixture of crushed minerals and the blood from my wounded arm, receiving protection from the very thing that threatened to tear us apart moments ago. The chant was now feverish in intensity, as we were bonded by our shared experience. Minutes ticked by with agonizing slowness as we completed our task. The beast let out one final, ear-splitting cry before being swallowed whole by shadows and banished back to whatever demonic plane it had come from. Breathing heavily, Lyrica and I slumped against my truck as we tried to comprehend what had just transpired. Harvey's fate weighed heavy on our hearts, but I knew he would want us to go on living, fighting against whatever darkness might be lurking on Route 50. As we prepared to continue with our journey, we solemnly painted symbols of protection upon my rig, with trace elements of blood left in the vial just in case, ensuring no malevolent force could prey upon us again. I glanced at Lyrica one last time before firing up the engine, her sad eyes revealing an unspoken bond forged in fire and terror. It was time for us to leave Cold Springs Station behind. As we made our way down that eerie road once more, I couldn't help but feel that each move we made was one step closer to solving the riddles hiding in the shadows perhaps unlocking even more supernatural events entwined with Route 50. The loneliest road in America would never be forgotten, and though we had not vanquished the beast that haunted it, we understood that some mysteries were best kept at bay. Our experiences bound us together, teaching us that though we may tread this road alone, in facing the darkness, we can always find solace and strength through companionship. I'd always enjoyed taking the old, winding highway through the rugged hills of Arizona. It made my long hauls as a truck driver tolerable. That particular route snaked its way through Apache Junction, a picturesque town bordering Superstition Mountain. But this time, something was different. As I settled in for an overnight stop at a local motel, an uneasy sensation crawled beneath my skin. Maybe it was due to the encounters with old-timers in that area who'd mumble bizarre stories under their breath. They spoke of gruesome murders committed by a group called the Howling Coyotes. I convinced myself it was just barum lore, nothing to take seriously. Deciding to explore after sunset, I wandered around town while chatting with some colorful characters. By chance, I found myself at an abandoned factory on the outskirts of town, where locals said out happenings took place. Still hesitant about believing in this mythical criminal group, 
I decided to check it out, convincing myself it was all a harmless urban legend. The dilapidated structures stood like ancient guardians of a long-forgotten era as I crept deeper into the shadows. As my boot crunched on broken glass and scattered rocks, muffled voices echoed through the darkness. Crouching behind a rusted metal drum, I watched men in tattered clothes huddle around a fire. Their eyes glinted like predators scouring for prey in the dim light from flickering flames dancing in their pupils. They suddenly broke into frantic screams and guttural growls before collapsing to the ground in agony, clutching their throats as they convulsed violently. I choked down petrified gasps as I witnessed their metamorphosis. Human skin stretched and tore like paper to reveal fur-covered limbs beneath. Beastly snouts emerged from bloodied faces while fingers elongated into dagger-like claws. Horrified, I understood at that moment that the howling coyotes were not a figment of local superstition after all. Stifling my disbelief and terror, I slinked away before they could pick up on my scent. I reported the gruesome encounter to the police, but despite a thorough investigation, they found nothing except an old, abandoned factory. Conversations with locals revealed very little about the origins or motivations behind the howling coyotes. Some believed them to be descendants of ancient Native American shamans cursed by dark animal spirits. Others theorized they were once criminals who incurred the wrath of an ancient deity. I now knew their horrifying secret. The existence of a group of men with sinister intentions and savage transformations lurking in the shadows. As I made sure never to take the same route twice, fear choked me with every hall that led me back through those haunted hills. The truth behind the howling coyotes remains shrouded in mystery to this day. No conclusive information has been pinned down, and their name has faded into town lore a whispered boogeyman in the ears of frightened children. Every time I pass through those desolate hills, I can't help but feel my spine shiver. The shiver down my spine intensified as I continued driving away from the haunted hills. My resolve was firm. I needed to expose the truth behind the howling coyotes and put an end to their terrifying reign. That required careful observation information gathering, and perhaps even infiltrating their gruesome lair. Three days later, I found myself orbiting around Apache Junction once more. In the guise of a local vagabond, I hoped to go unnoticed by the coyotes while seeking out further clues about their sinister nature. While sitting at a dive bar nursing a lukewarm beer, I overheard two men engaged in hushed conversation. I strained my ears to catch their words. This new guy in here tonight, one whispered, came asking around about M. I needed to stay cautious. I decided to subtly follow these two men, eventually tailing them back to the abandoned factory where I had first witnessed the howling coyote's horrifying transformation. From a tent hidden nearby. I watched as they frequented the old factory over days that turned into weeks. While waiting patiently for an opportunity to get closer, a night, when they seemed more focused on their meeting than on patrolling, would present itself. It was just after midnight when that chance arrived. I crept silently toward the dark structure and eased a rusty door open enough for me to slip through. The putrid stench of decay and rot filled my nose on the inside as whispers weaved themselves through the air above. There were four of them in total, tall with snarled hair stuck against gaunt cheeks by sweat beads, as I rounded one dimly lit corner within earshot of their voices. Their eyes eerily glowed like embers hovering in a murky abyss. I recalled what they looked like when they transformed bodies contorting into unnatural positions as they bellowed heinous cries of pain. The thought of their dagger-like claws sent shivers through me as I overheard them detailing their next crime to be committed, 
the violent attack on a nearby ranch. The leader of the pack struck one man down without warning. His body crumpled, blood pooling around him. We can't have dissenters. Bravery is what makes us strong. His voice, cold like ice, penetrated into my hideous fears. My heart stammered as I stumbled backward, narrowly avoiding a shard of glass catching on my pants leg. The sound echoed and distracted them for only a moment, allowing me to slip away unnoticed by them. The dread inside me wasn't simply that of fear. It was a deeply rooted sense of duty to help end their reign of unspeakable terror that had plagued Apache Junction for far too long. I relayed the information that I had gathered to the police, detailed observations of their habits, plans, and appearances, emphasizing the urgent need for these monstrous beings to be stopped permanently. Using words alone felt inadequate in describing the grotesque sight and barbarity these men inflicted, werewolf-like creatures hunting humans under a cloak of darkness while they went about their days unsuspecting. Armed with my input, the authorities swept in swiftly to find irrefutable evidence linking several members to a string of brutal murders, along with undeniable proof of their unnatural transformations. Alas, they managed to apprehend only two, while the remaining pack members scattered into the vast Arizona desert like rats fleeing a sinking ship. Even though those responsible may not all be behind bars forever due to archaic laws that do not account for such monstrosities, the heavily publicized exposure stripped them of their power over the innocent. With great intensity, I watched those desolate hills recede from view as my truck rumbled away from Apache Junction for what I vowed would be the last time, plagued by shadows of my haunting past but also filled with hope that I'd managed to shine a sliver of light upon those dark corners where beasts like the howling coyotes lurked in perpetual cruelty. However, I knew my duty was incomplete. The remaining members may still be at large planning even more sinister deeds. And as long as they evaded capture, they continued to be an imminent threat. A cold chill settled in my bones, knowing full well I may yet find myself once more confronting these ghastly horrors whenever fate guides me down those haunted roads again. I was refueling my truck at a rest stop off Highway 84 in Oregon, the sun hanging low in the sky like molten gold. This stretch of the road held distant memories of past assignments, but none of them were as bizarre as what would soon unfold on this particular day. My name is Jonathan Blakewater, and I've been a long-haul truck driver for over 20 years. On that day, the world as I knew it would change forever. After grabbing a bite to eat at the nearby diner, I met up with another trucker named Riley Dencaster, an old friend who was spending the night at the rest stop. We traded stories about our experiences on the road when Riley confided in me that he'd heard whispers of some strange occurrences in the area. Riley wasn't one to scare easily or buy into gossip, so it caught my attention, but I dismissed it as just another one of those tall tales people like to tell about remote locations. As I said my goodbyes and climbed back into my truck to hit the road once again, I couldn't shake the growing sense of unease deep within me. This time, however, it felt different, less like normal nerves at embarking on a long journey and more like an ominous warning of what was to come. Miles down the highway, night had fully engulfed the sky, and stars sprinkled every corner of it. The moon cast its eerie glow upon dark, twisting roads framed by tall pines that seemed to reach out like gnarled hands attempting to snatch me from my cap. It made me uneasy, a rare feeling for a seasoned driver like me. 
The CB radio crackled to life beside me as Riley's voice pierced the silence. He spoke in hushed tones about a series of brutal attacks and unexplained disappearances plaguing this area over recent months. His words sent a chill down my spine as I realized I was in the heart of that very region. Local police had narrowed their focus to one prime suspect, a notorious biker named Scarlet and Gear Master, believed to lead a sadistic gang hellbent on wreaking havoc and living outside the law. I continued driving on edge, paying close attention to the other vehicles alongside me in case any of them seemed suspect. What started out as an ordinary day spiraled quickly into a nightmarish world where death and destruction lurked around every corner. As daylight broke over the endless ribbon of road, I found myself entering a small, secluded town nestled deep within the lush evergreens. The unsettling occurrences suddenly took a gruesome turn when I came across the lifeless body of a stranger on the side of the road. His body bore horrendous signs of violence. Mangled limbs and blood-stained clothes rendered him unrecognizable. The grisly scene weighed heavy on my mind as my journey continued onward. I couldn't shake the feeling that something dreadful was lurking just beneath the surface of this sleepy American town. The name Scarlet and Gear Master haunted me day and night, whispered from one trucker to another like an omen of our doom. Before long, it became clear that Riley had gone missing under mysterious circumstances too. Fear gripped me like an icy vice as I realized that Riley's disappearance could very well be linked to these sinister events. As I frantically searched for answers amidst a stack of unanswered questions, only one thing remained certain. Someone or something was stalking these lonely roads with a thirst for blood. Suddenly, out of nowhere, a sudden commotion erupted from a nearby gas station breaking the unsettling silence that had blanketed the town. I quickly pulled over my truck and sprinted towards the chaotic scene, desperate to find any leads that might help me unravel this gruesome mystery. As I approached the gas station, I witnessed the hulking figure roughly six feet five inches tall, his muscular arms adorned with tattooed sleeves, locked in a violent struggle with the attendant. The man's long, dark hair was matted with sweat and blood, and his eyes were wild and frantic, as if possessed by a demon. His face bore evidence of recent altercations, bruised knuckles and a broken nose, which skewed his sinister grin. I instantly recognized him as Scarlet and Gear Master from the police sketches Riley had shown me days before. Without hesitation, I launched myself at Scarlaxon, tackling him to the ground in an attempt to subdue him. However, his brute strength caught me off guard, and he swiftly threw me aside as if I were nothing more than a ragdoll. I struggled to regain my footing while Scarlaxon savagely attacked the gas station attendant once again. Mustering every ounce of my strength, I lunged at him for a second time managing to gain enough momentum to knock him off balance. He stumbled backward into a pool of gasoline spilled during the commotion, his body drenched in the highly flammable liquid. Seizing upon this opportunity, I grabbed a nearby road flare that had been previously discarded and struck it against the ground before tossing it at Scarlaxon. What happened next occurred too fast for my mind to comprehend fully a symphony of terror unfolding before my eyes. The roadside flare ignited the gasoline-soaked floor beneath Scarlaxon's feet. In an instant, he became engulfed in a raging inferno that scorched everything in its path. As flames licked at his body, his agonized screams filled the air, soon joined by the horrifying howls of witnesses who could do little more than watch in shock and horror. And then, just as quickly as it had begun, the flames vanished, leaving behind a charred and smoldering ruin. But Scarlaxon, the twisted mastermind behind so much death and destruction, 
miraculously survived. His thick leather jacket and jeans were seared beyond recognition, but he somehow managed to tear himself free from their melted confines. Horrifically burned but somehow still alive, the monstrous figure retreated into the darkness, his menacing laughter lost among the distant whispers of pines that echoed across the landscape. In the days following that nightmarish encounter, there were no sightings of Scarlax and Gear Master, no reports of casualties, and no wanton destruction. Yet, some still whispered that he lurked somewhere within the depths of Oregon's wilderness, forever scarred both externally and internally by his gruesome brush with death. With Riley's disappearance still weighing heavily on me, I continued my solitary journey along those dark, desperate roads. The skies may grow ever darker overhead, but the road unfolding beneath my tires grants some measure of solace in knowing that I survived my harrowing confrontation with an evil force unlike any other. As other truckers share tales about Scarlax and Gear Master around diner tables and late-night radio broadcasts, a troubled world continues to turn. The events I bore witness to will forever haunt me, a grim reminder of the darkness that lurks just beyond our perception. But despite it all, I hold on to a shred of hope. Perhaps one day, we will finally rid ourselves of Scarlax and Gear Master and all who share his demonic desires. Until then, I continue down these lonely roads with only my thoughts for company, bracing for whatever horrors may lie ahead. It all started with an odd smell. I couldn't quite put my finger on it, but it definitely wasn't your run-of-the-mill roadkill stench. That summer, I had been delivering goods to various isolated locations across southeastern Tennessee. Late in August, a shipment led me to a remote settlement known as Copperhill. As I approached the drop-off point, an old, dilapidated warehouse nestled behind thick trees and dense foliage. The whiff of that peculiar aroma intensified. The region's ridges and valleys looked like any other southern Appalachian scene. However, with each step closer to the warehouse, things felt more peculiar. When I arrived at the place, tendrils of caution curled around my gut. The warehouse seemed abandoned, Rusty metal sheets hung twisted and crumbling from its sides. Still, the scent had become unbearable, gut-wrenching even, at this proximity. Just then, another trucker named Elias Pritchard joined me at the scene. You smell that too? He asked in his thick southern drawl before spitting a wad of tobacco on the dirt. Nodding in agreement that something was off, we decided to fulfill our shipment obligations as quickly as possible so we could leave. As we entered the building to offload our cargo, we spotted something unexpected. Scattered amid haphazard piles of crates were human remains, bones that glistened beneath random pockets of light filtering in through the building's many holes. Some seemed quite fresh, others had clearly been there for years. Jesus Christ, Elias muttered under his breath before violently throwing up. Both nauseated and fearful of what we'd stumbled upon, we knew it was time to get out of there. Just as we turned back toward our trucks, someone emerged from a distant tree line, watching us from afar. I noticed him first, a disheveled, unnerving man in tattered clothes and a greasy, unkempt beard of matching length. He stared at us intently and didn't move an inch. Elias spotted him too. Old Lyra, he whispered, with a quiver in his voice. There are stories about him. I always thought they were nonsense until now. When I pressed him for more information about Leroy, Elias said he'd heard rumors the man was involved in some sinister activities. 
a local legend of sorts around the Copperhill area, much like the ones we just discovered. However, few had laid eyes on the eerie figure themselves. With Elias shaking uncontrollably by my side, I decided we could investigate no more, and without reporting our findings to the authorities. Considering both Delivery's illegality and old Lyra's involvement with law enforcement, they say his brother's the town sheriff. We resolved to keep it all hushed up. Instead, we drove away from the warehouse as quickly as possible, with that putrid stench still lingering in our nostrils and that gaunt, terrifying figure standing eerily against the backdrop of nature, unmoving. Not long after that troubling day in Copperhill, with neither of us certain what we witnessed or experienced, I decided to call it quits on truck driving altogether. But one thing certain, the gruesome secrets concealed within those dense southern Tennessee woods continue to haunt both Elias and me even now, our experiences forever etched into our memories like grotesque, gory images frozen in time. The name old Leroy still sends shivers down my spine. And what is he still doing there on that mountain? What other horrendous things has he done? But I suppose some mysteries are best left undiscovered after all. I couldn't shake the thought of old Leroy from my mind. Each time I closed my eyes, all I saw were his wild, bloodshot eyes piercing into my soul. After weeks of restless sleep, I knew it was time to do something about it. Coincidentally or not, my old trucking friend Elias reached out to me about the same issue. He planned on going back to Copperhill to confront our demons and find definitive answers about Lyra's true nature. Soon enough, we found ourselves in Copperhill again, ready to face our fears and get to the bottom of things. The locals knew of old Leroy but were hesitant to say much. We managed to learn from a local shopkeeper that he resided in a cabin deep in the woods, surrounded by frightening stories of murder and mayhem. We headed deeper into the woods. The musty smell of decaying leaves underfoot made for an eerily familiar scent, not quite as strong as that day last August but chillingly reminiscent. A feeling of dread crept up on us. As twilight emerged over the horizon, we finally stumbled upon Lyra's cabin, looking nothing more than an old shack with one barely intact aluminum roof. His home was covered in grime and overgrown vegetation. Hidden among those gnarly bushes, we watched old Leroy emerge, carrying what appeared to be a large plastic bag dripping blood onto the ground, a sight that sickened us both. He walked behind the shack and began digging a shallow hole in which he tossed the heavy bag before covering it with dirt. As if on some primal instinct, he suddenly froze and met our gaze with his terrifyingly hostile eyes from twenty yards away. Fellas, he snarled menacingly. Welcome back. The conflict became inevitable when Lyra lunged at us wielding a rusted hatchet with grotesque stains along its edge. Our hearts raced as that first swing gashed past Elias's arm, causing deep crimson streaks to appear. I dove in to save my friend, fueled by a mix of terror and anger. We wrestled with the hatchet-wielding menace, my bloody knuckles pounding his filthy beard until he collapsed, his body twitching and convulsing beneath our brutal assault. But rather than delivering justice of an executioner's nature, we left old Leroy alive, albeit battered and bruised, and alerted the local authorities about his grisly activities. It turned out that Leroy had been behind the notorious Appalachian murder chain, with over 20 missing persons reported and evidence of their brutal deaths exposed in a hidden torture cellar deeply buried. The notoriety of the case blew the small town wide open. The sad truth is that we never expected our quest for closure to lead us to these dark depths. Finally, with the events of last August now no more than a footnote in history, 
Elias and I moved on to forge new lives. We continued trucking but avoided routes through southeastern Tennessee, never forgetting the stench or old Lyra's malicious eyes. And even as justice prevailed through the disclosure of his terrible crimes, old Leroy himself evaded prosecution by disappearing from captivity one foggy night, further adding to Copperhill's growing dark lore. Perhaps some mysteries are best left unsolved. But this experience taught me that sometimes facing your fears is the only way to move beyond them. Although old Leroy vanished into those thick trees surrounding Copper Hill, we faced him together. And that inevitable outcome fostered a newfound feeling of confidence in both Elias and me. Yet one question remains, is old Leroy still out there? Preying on unsuspecting souls, or confined within these nightmarish memories hastily shuffled away in our mind's deepest chambers. Perhaps some fates are worse than death. They are merely trapped within your consciousness, forever lurking and waiting to strike. I was about 20 miles outside of Winslow, Arizona, refilling my water bottle at a rest stop. I noticed something odd in the distance, but I couldn't quite put my finger on it. The image seemed to shiver like hot pavement in the desert sun. The date was September 4, 1997, and I was halfway through my long-haul delivery route across the American Southwest. My name is Zephyrin Mosley, and trucking has always been in my blood. My father taught me to drive on these same routes when I was barely old enough to see over the dashboard. By some accounts, I was a seasoned professional with over 13 years of experience under my belt. Pulling back onto the desolate highway, strangely shrouded in eerie silence, I contemplated the peculiar landscape around me. As I drove forward, I considered the possible explanations for what my eyes had seen. It could have been heat hallucinations or reflections. But then another sinister thought crossed my mind. Could it be a chupacabra? The local folklore spoke of a creature that prowled deserts and grasslands alike, terrorizing communities while it hunted livestock. I shook my head, admonishing myself. This wasn't a time for fanciful folktales. This was real life. A few more miles under the wheels and a walkie-talkie belonging to one of my longtime trucker friends crackled to life. Hey, Z.F. Farin. It sputtered out mockingly. Jasper Vasquez had always been one for poking fun at just about anything or anyone. You wouldn't believe it. Did you see what happened just up ahead? My heart raced as Jasper recounted two men found brutally attacked by an unknown assailant at the edge of town, both with violent lacerations down their backs and shoulders. The vivid descriptions sent horribly familiar images flashing through my mind as I pushed past the cold and growing sense of dread. Something in Jasper's voice made it clear that this wasn't a prank. I resolved to help him and hoped he was mistaken. As we hatched our plan to investigate further, we found ourselves surrounded by eerily quiet and abandoned truck stops. Murky shadows loomed ominously in the dark corners, causing us both to feel a foreboding prickling down our spines. As we carefully navigated the back roads and alleyways, we couldn't help but become increasingly suspicious of every shape and noise. Our senses were heightened, poised for confrontation or escape, whichever came first. I think we need to get back on the main. Jasper began murmuring just as his words were abruptly cut short by the sound of breaking glass. Frozen in terror, we waited in tense silence as the shuffling noise crept nearer followed by a guttural growl. This time, escape was not an option. We had to face whatever malevolent force hunted us down. 
drawing our weapons and moving closer together, Jasper and I steeled ourselves for what was to come. Movement flickered at the edge of my vision, and I swung around just in time to catch it. A massive canine-like creature with razor-sharp claws approached us cautiously. As it stepped closer, its eyes gleamed with an almost human intelligence that belied the cruel beast before us. Staring at it, or rather, him, since its ambiguous gender weighed heavily on my mind, I saw evidence of something even more sinister lurking behind those predatory eyes. This creature was no ordinary beast. It bore characteristics hinting at its possibly mythological origin while being capable of unspeakable devastation. Yet another endearing trait for would-be unfortunate foes. Our breaths caught in our throats as we prepared for an imminent attack, battling against the fear that threatened every inch of our being. And just as it seemed the creature was about to pounce, it let out a low, guttural growl before lunging at us. Jasper and I barely had time to react, dodging the vicious claws while frantically firing our weapons at the demonic creature. It snarled, unfazed by the barrage of bullets, and lunged for me once more, missing my torso by mere inches. In a desperate attempt to fend off the beast, I managed to tackle it onto its back. My hands grasped at its leathery neck, struggling to keep its snapping jaws away from my face. The odor of blood and rotting flesh filled my nostrils as I battled against the creature. The antagonist was an enormous beast with sickeningly mangled fur that looked more like mangy, rotted leather on its canine-like body. Its face was twisted and monstrous with a misshapen snout filled with jagged teeth dripping with dark saliva. Two haunting crimson eyes stared back at me with cold hatred. Jasper fired another round into the creature's flank, which only served to enrage it further. It thrashed violently beneath me, attempting to throw me off into one of the abandoned buildings lining the desolate street we found ourselves on during our investigation. Despite my best efforts to subdue it, I felt its strength growing stronger. In a last-ditch effort, I took my hunting knife from my boot with shaky hands and plunged it into one of the creature's glowing red eyes. It screeched in agony and rage but didn't let up in its attempts to kill me. Thankfully, Jasper seized this opportunity to unleash several rounds directly into the beast's chest causing it to finally loosen its grip on me and collapse onto the pavement below, breathing heavily but still alive. As we faced this monster that mythology seemed ill-equipped to ever describe fully or accurately enough, a blend of man, canine, and an unspeakably cruel nightmare, it felt as though time itself had simply ceased to exist. All that mattered was the primal fear and adrenaline coursing through our veins as we fought for survival. We backed away from the creature cautiously, unsure if it would suddenly lash out again despite its apparent defeat. It glared at us with its remaining eye, seemingly daring us to strike again. Then, something unexpected happened, blood oozed from its wounds but not like any other ordinary blood I had ever seen. This dark crimson liquid started pooling underneath the beast, searing and burning through the asphalt-like acid. As we stared in horror, a black cloud of smoke rose from this peculiar bloodbath, enveloping the creature whole. The air filled with a pungent stench that made us gag, a blend of sulfur and decay before fading almost as abruptly as it came upon us. The smoke vanished as quickly as it appeared, taking the supernatural creature with it, and leaving behind nothing but a scarred patch of ground. Jasper and I exchanged both relieved and fearful glances, knowing that while we had won this battle, the war was far from over. Over the next few days, we kept a vigilant eye out for any signs that the beast would return or that its gruesome handiwork would continue spreading fear and death throughout our community. 
We knew that we had merely been spared for now by an entity too dark to fully understand. But at least we were able to prove that such evil existed and lived among us in plain sight. For now, we managed to cheat death by stopping this nightmarish antagonist in his tracks. We remained alive to fight another day, bruised and changed forever. But we were all too aware of what wickedness lurked in the darkest corners of our world, biding its time until it could reveal itself once more. And so I carry on my long-haul roots, carrying with me a profound awareness of the unknown horrors that might lie waiting just off the familiar paths we travel and a readiness to confront evil if it should ever choose to cross my path again. The wind howled through the broken windows of the abandoned warehouse as I parked my truck in a remote area of South Oregon, just outside Medford. The time read 3.27 a.m., and the moon cast eerie shadows across the desolate landscape. It was a lonely road, but it was a shortcut I had taken many times on my route. Little did I know that this night would forever change my life. I told you we shouldn't have stopped here, grumbled my friend Hector, who had decided to accompany me on this long haul. He rubbed his hands together, trying to regain circulation from the freezing night air. Relax, I said, clutching my thermos tightly as I took a sip of lukewarm coffee. We've never had any problems here before. That's when we heard it an unnerving cackle echoing throughout the barren surroundings. Our eyes darted back and forth, searching for the source of the sound. A feeling of unease rippled through us as the laughter died down. Our conversation turned to local legends whispering about an infamous figure known as Bloody Mary Ellen, described as a malicious spirit or possibly a serial killer roaming rural highways. She was rumored to be responsible for numerous unexplained disappearances and grisly deaths. We brushed off these tales as simply urban legends until an imposing figure appeared not far from our truck. The woman stood at least six and a half feet tall, with wild, unkempt hair and dirty rags haphazardly draped over her emaciated figure. Her appearance sent chills down our spines. Convincing ourselves that she was merely a homeless person, Hector and I uneasily laughed off our anxiety. Awful late for a stroll, don't you think? Hector shouted in her direction, attempting to ease our nerves with humor. She lurched forward, revealing a large, serrated blade in her hand. The smile that crept across her face was menacing, a look that neither of us would ever forget. In a sudden violent frenzy, Mary Ellen sprinted towards a sleeping trucker resting not far from us. She pounced on him like a rabid animal and proceeded to systematically dismember and mutilate the man. Amidst the carnage and bloodshed, she screeched unworldly noises we never thought imaginable. Panicking, Hector and I scrambled to start the truck and flee the gruesome scene. Our trembling hands fumbled with the keys, struggling to insert them into the ignition. Do something! Hector urged as Mary Ellen grew closer, her blade coated in fresh gore. Finally able to start the engine, I slammed my foot on the gas pedal, leaving behind tire marks, scattered debris, and disturbing images seared into our memories. Weeks later, after speaking with locals from nearby towns who mentioned similar experiences, we pieced together Bloody Mary Ellen's history. A drifter accused of witchcraft in late 19th century Oregon, she had been lynched by a mob of vicious townspeople. Ever since then, her vengeful spirit has emerged every generation to prey on innocent victims passing through the area. How is it that Bloody Mary Ellen continues to haunt this desolate stretch of road? 
Does her spirit endure only through fear and tales passed down between generations? Fingers gripping the steering wheel tightly as we narrowly escaped certain death. As I pulled the truck further away from that horrifying scene, the clock on the dashboard read 3.33 a.m. Hector and I breathed heavily, gasping for air after the adrenaline-fueled confrontation. Both of us couldn't shake the feeling that Bloody Mary Ellen would find a way to reappear in our lives. It's not over, is it? Hector asked in a trembling voice. I could tell he shared my fear, and the answer lay painfully clear in both of our minds. Her grotesque figure and those agonizing noises she had made kept us from sleeping soundly for the following few days. On the fourth day after our terrifying encounter, I decided enough was enough. We needed to find a way to stop this sadistic spirit from causing any more harm. Grabbing my laptop, I began scouring online forums for any hints as to how to eliminate, or at least weaken Bloody Mary Ellen's presence. Strangely, every thread discussing her seemed to be deleted not long after being created. Finally, deep in a hidden corner of a paranormal website, I came across a post from someone who claimed to have bound her spirit using a ritual involving elements of black salt and protective sigils drawn with ash from burned willow branches. Reading more into it, we learned that at exactly 3.33 a.m., at the site where Bloody Mary Ellen took her last human breath, we had to draw her once again using these vital components. Armed with our inconspicuous vials of black salt and bags full of willow ash gathered under hushed whispers, Hector and I returned to Medford. Once there, we found the information about her original lynching site hidden within dusty old records in Medford's library. On our way to the location in question, Winding through haunted woods on an abandoned dirt road illuminated only by the feeble flickers of our headlights, we came across a sickening sight. A mutilated animal carcass lay to one side of the road, its entrails strewn all around. Was this one of Bloody Mary Ellen's displays of power? I swallowed hard and assured Hector that we were close to ending her gruesome reign once and for all. At the site where she had perished in the 19th century, an eerily quiet clearing with a noose hanging from a gnarled tree, we set to work. An approaching storm ominously hung above us as we prepared the ritual. When the time turned to 3.33 a.m., I started reciting the invocations laid out in the forum post amid rumbling thunder and flashes of lightning striking dangerously close. The wind tore at my skin while black salt and willow ash danced through the air, forming shrouds that seemed to encase an unseen figure writhing in fury. Her guttural screams pierced the night as the ritual progressed, chilling me to the bone even more than the icy rain battering my face. Suddenly, just as the storm reached its peak, silence fell. Did it work? Hector looked at me with hope glistening in his eyes like raindrops on glass. But as reality began to sink in, a sudden, unsettling realization flashed before both of us. We could neither kill nor capture Bloody Mary Ellen. Instead, our feeble attempt at containing her spirit may only have facilitated a haunting transformation within her vindictive soul. No longer tethered by previously understood restrictions, her potential malevolence expanded like the deep shadows cast by a full moon. Hector and I glanced at each other with heavy hearts, reluctantly accepting our failure to banish Bloody Mary Ellen once and for all. We could only imagine what gruesome fate awaited unsuspecting victims who crossed paths with this newly empowered and enraged entity. As lightning continued to flash across Medford's stormy skies, we trudged back to the truck. With each electrifying strike, we held on to a thin shred of hope that, eventually, someone with greater skill might find a way to tame Bloody Mary Ellen's fury. Until then, 
Her chilling aura and thirst for blood would fester in our memories and very souls, for we knew all too well that some nightmares never truly end. The deafening blare of a train horn echoed through the Arkansas River Valley as I pulled my truck over to the side of Highway 64. My heart raced at the thought of what had just occurred. I felt the hairs on the back of my neck prickle as a shiver went down my spine. It was a seemingly ordinary night hauling cargo across Conway, but now there was a knot in my gut that told me otherwise. Aurelio McCullough that's me. I drive this freight route every night and never once bore witness to anything unusual, but tonight was different. Sweat beaded on my brow as I considered calling my longtime friend and co-worker, Leontine Weems, who should have been a few miles ahead of me by now. Hey, Leo, I said nervously when she answered. Can you pull over for a sec? Something really weird just happened. What's up, Aurelio? She inquired, concern apparent in her voice. You sound shaken. I nearly hit someone or something on the road. I stammered, still shaken from the fleeting glimpse I'd caught in my headlights only moments ago. Could it have been a wild animal? Leo suggested it logically. Do you roam around here all the time? I wanted to consider her theory, but an unshakable eerie feeling told me this encounter was no average road hazard. The figure on two legs seemed hunched at an unnatural angle. Its movements appeared swift yet disjointed. Records at the local library warned of sinister happenings throughout history near those same tracks where I stopped. A series of violent incidents linked by one unsettling pattern. Some claimed a malignant apparition haunted these parts, dubbed the Hunchback of Conway by locals. Others whispered about Olvera Trepanikov, an escaped Soviet war criminal rumored to lurk within tunnels underneath old train stations. I hesitated mentioning this dark lore, but Leo sensed there were thoughts I was holding back. Aurelio, if there's something going on, we can't just ignore it she urged, her voice firm. What's really bothering you? I spilled my fears about the eerie connection between the figure I saw tonight and the gruesome accounts I had discovered in my research. As we plunged deeper into speculative conversation, an abrupt realization slammed into me. If the hunchback of Conway were merely a myth, how did it survive through generations with such chilling detail? Our obsession with uncovering the truth regarding this mysterious antagonist grew by the day. We spent evenings after our roots scouring old newspaper archives and interviewing locals who claimed to have had their own encounters with the ominous figure. Our investigation took a terrifying turn one night when we found signs of a horrific struggle under a bridge near the same train tracks as my initial encounter. The evidence was too graphic to describe, but it became clear to us that the perpetrator could only be the hunchback of Conway or Olvera Tropinikov. Fearful for our safety yet determined to bring an end to these sinister events, Leo and I plotted together to confront whoever, or whatever, was behind these atrocities. Armed with flashlights and other potentially lethal gear, we vowed to expose and confront this malevolent force before it struck again. The tension in the air was palpable as we approached a derelict rail station later that night, not knowing whether we'd come face to face with myth or vengeful reality. As we cautiously stepped into the decaying railway station, our flashlights illuminated the dust-covered platforms and the peeling paint on the walls. The smell of mold infiltrated our nostrils, warning us that this place had been abandoned for a long time. It was hard not to let my imagination wander, but I had to focus on the objective, 
finding out who or what was behind these heinous acts. The place seemed to be void of life, but as we ventured further in, we noticed shuffling sounds echoing through the massive interior of the rail station. Heart pounding, I glanced over at Leo, seeing her white-knuckled grip on the flashlight betray her nerves. Suddenly, a guttural groan pierced the eerie silence. We froze in place as a bone-chilling figure emerged from the darkness. Before us stood a man. No, this could not be a man. His grotesque disfigurements left him barely human in appearance. His flesh was an unnatural shade of gray, mottled with purplish bruises, and open wounds seeped pus. His body was twisted and gnarled like an old tree, leaving him hunched over at an unnerving angle. Where there should have been eyes, there were only empty sockets oozing black ichor that trailed down his cheeks. Despite his grotesque deformities, I could see the strength in his limbs and concluded that he wasn't incapable of inflicting severe damage. I found myself making connections between this creature and the grueling injuries inflicted on the victims. Trembling and fearful for our lives, Leo and I shared a resolute nod as we prepared to confront this abomination. What do you want? I stammered through clenched teeth. The creature's garbled reply sounded like tortured speech forced through layers of rotten flesh. Leave now. Leo piped up in defiance. We're not leaving until we put an end to the atrocities you've committed. Letting out a screech, the creature lunged at Leo. I could only watch helplessly as its long, bony fingers wrapped around her throat, constricting her airflow. At that moment, I pushed past my terror. I'd be damned if I let this thing take another innocent life. Gripping a rusted pipe that had been discarded on the ground, I took a calculated swing at the monster's head. The blow landed with a sickening crunch releasing its grip on Leo as he staggered back in pain. While it stumbled away to recover from the blow, something caught my eye on the floor nearby. A weathered newspaper clipping detailing the escaped Soviet war criminal, Olvera Trupanikov. I stared at the photo of him in disbelief before my eyes drifted upward toward the hunched figure writhing on the ground. Was this what became of Olvera? Could some sinister experiment gone wrong have cruelly mutated him? The realization settled heavily on my chest. The beast regained its balance and fixed its empty gaze on us once more. Seemingly resigned to our determination, he growled morbidly. Leave, or your lives become mine. As we stumbled away from that forsaken place, Leo gasping for breath while clinging to me for support, we knew that we had escaped with our lives by a hair's width. We also understood that chasing after this twisted fusion of man and monster might be an ordeal beyond human limits. The burden of their victim's pain weighed heavily on our conscience. Nevertheless, there were times when some secrets were best left concealed within their dark corners. We made a pact then, Leo and me, to live our lives while carrying the knowledge of this horror but never to speak of it again. Though complete closure was denied to us, we still clung to the hope that the hellish being we encountered would eventually find its own twisted form of peace and cease to blight the world with its monstrous presence. The strangest delivery I've ever made during my truck driving career happened on a particularly odd Tuesday in mid-June, just outside Knoxville, Tennessee. I remember it taking me off guard because everything seemed so ordinary when the day began. The warm sunshine and blue skies were almost cinematic as I found myself cruising down the road to meet up with a few of the locals for some chatter before making my delivery. My name is Archibald Kinsley, but my friends call me Archie. 
I've been trucking for over a decade, and despite not always being the most well-liked job, it's what I'm good at and how I make a living. On that fateful day, after catching up with some friends in town over cups of steaming coffee, I found myself heading out into the seemingly tranquil countryside. Everything took a chilling turn when my phone rang, an unfamiliar number flashing on the screen. Answering cautiously while maintaining one hand on the wheel, the raspy voice on the other line sent shivers down my spine. I've taken Richard Carrington, and you'll find him at Old Mill Road's abandoned silo. They muttered before hanging up abruptly. Perplexed and horrified by this revelation, my mind reeled, grappling with the unexpected news. Richard Carrington was my longtime friend and fellow truck driver. We hung out pretty often, so hearing that he'd been kidnapped shook me to the core. My eyes darted nervously as I veered off course toward Old Mill Road instead of sticking to my usual route. As I drove on unfamiliar roads lined with looming trees, budding anxiety mixed with adrenaline propelled me toward Richard's potential whereabouts. Reaching the road's end, a dilapidated silo stood ominously in front of me like a monument to misfortune. With sweaty palms gripping the steering wheel tightly, apprehension seeped in stronger than ever before as thoughts of entering the menacing structure flooded my mind. Pausing barely a few steps from the entrance, I took a deep breath and dialed 911 on my cell but hesitated to hit send on account of the potential danger Richard was facing. Stealing myself for whatever awaited inside, I ventured cautiously into the depths of the silo. Unsettling shadows rose along the damp, cold walls, swallowing all the comfort I had clung to on my journey. Amidst the chilling darkness, I fumbled upon what appeared to be writing on the wall and squinted to read. Richard is only the beginning, it cryptically declared. My heart plummeted into my stomach as I reached for my phone to call for help, only to realize that there was no signal. I stumbled through the dimly lit corridors, frightened and determined to save Richard. It suddenly dawned on me that it might be the work of Lucius Carruthers a local madman who had harbored a grudge against Richard since high school. The rumors were rife about his maddening descent into darkness. Whispers around town suggested that he'd taken his fascination with true crime to a dangerous and twisted level. Just as panic began to consume my thoughts, I caught sight of my injured friend through a doorway in desperate need of help his violent assailant nowhere in sight at present. As I approached Richard's battered form, I took note of his injuries, the purple bruises on his face and the cuts that marred his arms. It was painful just to look at him. He seemed to have been severely beaten. His breathing was shallow and labored. Archie, Richard whispered as I crouched down next to him, trying not to disturb his injuries. You have to get out of here. Lucius is insane. I quickly freed him from his bindings before we made our way back through the decrepit halls of the silo. Time felt like a ticking bomb as we cautiously moved through the darkness. How do you know it's Lucius? I asked, my voice barely above a whisper. It was his eyes, Richard replied. They're unmistakable cold and filled with unbridled rage. I recognized them from when we used to see him around town. When we finally arrived at the silo's entrance, we saw another blood-scribbled message nailed to one of the doors. Your friend will pay for your ignorance. It wasn't possible that Lucius had stealthily posted it during our escape attempt, which heightened my fear for Richard's predicament. We stumbled out into the cool night air, relief washing over us momentarily as we seemed to have outwitted our tormentor for now. My phone buzzed in my pocket. I finally had a signal again. Hastily dialing 911, 
I informed them of our whereabouts and awaited their arrival. Within minutes, police cars rolled up, their sirens cutting through the silence of the countryside. Officers swarmed toward us, taking in what appeared to be two desperate survivors who had narrowly avoided a grisly fate. Relief was short-lived as Lucius' haunting figure emerged from behind the trees lining Old Mill Road. He looked exactly how I remembered him from the last time I saw him at a high school reunion. Tall, slender, his piercing eyes bore into my soul as if he could see every fear lurking within my mind. Lucius Carruthers, one of the officers called out as they aimed their guns at him. He merely smiled, dripping with menace. No weapon could be seen. It seemed he was prepared to die. But that wasn't his plan. He wanted us to suffer. With a guttural chuckle that echoed throughout the backdrop of the night's eerie canvas, Lucius lunged towards Richard and me. Two officers tackled Lucius to the ground before he could cause any more harm, pinning him down while securing cuffs around his wrists. His laughter silenced momentarily by the pavement as we watched the scene unfold in front of our eyes. You'll regret this. Lucius cried out as they dragged him away, his voice laden with venomous threats despite being neutralized. You may have survived tonight, but you'll never be safe. Richard and I glanced at each other, our shared unease veiling our expressions at the eerie proclamation. In the weeks following, after recovering from his injuries, Richard and I were forced to reconsider our lives as truck drivers. Constantly looking over our shoulders, no longer comfortable in hushed conversations or solo roadside missions. The horror of that night spent clawing through darkness left us both with a lingering dread, an inescapable reminder that Lucius' torment tainted our very beings even though he remained caged behind prison walls. Later on, Word reached us that Lucius had managed to escape during a transfer between correctional facilities. The grisly path of terror bled through two more towns before officers lost all trace of him, his legacy echoing through whispers and anxious glances cast toward any stranger whose eyes bore even a slight resemblance of cruel clarity. Our lives would never be the same. We couldn't shake the foreboding threat that hung over our heads like a storm cloud, ever present. Lucius' evil was not patient, it was calculating. Even in his absence, fear and unrest pocked our existence. For now, Richard and I live each day cautiously, tied together by the bond we forged in a dilapidated silo with lurking darkness encroaching upon murky hope. And as we keep one eye firmly set on the horizon for the return of an elusive nightmare, we crouch beneath its threatening shadow, waiting for the moment that evil will surface once more. I remember the day well. It was March 12, 1999, and I found myself in the secluded town of Greenstone, Arizona. It was an unusual place for a truck driver like me to end up, but I had a delivery to make at one of those newly constructed factories on the outskirts of town. Little did I know that what I experienced that night would stay with me forever. As dusk settled upon the desert landscape, I pulled into a local bar to unwind and grab a bite before hitting the road again. The atmosphere inside was casual, though quiet. Conversation among strangers seemed almost reserved. I couldn't help but feel like an outsider, as if everyone there shared some unspoken secret. Shrugging it off as small-town paranoia, I ordered a hot meal and washed it down with a cold beer. What brings you around these parts? Asked a man sitting beside me named Emil Kostler. Just dropping off some cargo, I replied. But I won't be sticking around for long. 
Emil raised an eyebrow. Well, you best watch your back out there tonight. Strange things happen in this town. That night, as I drove along the desolate highway toward my next destination, I couldn't help but think about what Emil had said. His foreboding words lingered in my mind, evoking an uneasy feeling that something sinister was lurking close by. And then it happened. The seemingly ordinary road ahead suddenly transformed into chaos as my headlights shone upon the most heinous scene imaginable, a mutilated body lying off to the side of the highway. It looked as if it had been torn apart by some savage brute, limbs twisted and shredded beyond recognition. I slammed on my brakes enough to get out and take a closer look. The gruesome sight was truly mesmerizing, drawing me closer despite every fiber in my body screaming for me to leave. Finally, grasping the gravity of the situation, I fumbled for my cell phone to report the grisly discovery. Just then, I felt a searing heat on the back of my neck. The hair on my arms stood on end as I hurriedly called the police, too terrified to speak above a hushed whisper. There's a body. I'm on Route 64, just outside of Greenstone, Arizona. Please hurry. I dared not turn around as I listened to the operator confirm my location. As I regained composure and turned to face whatever horror was lurking behind me, there was nothing. Only darkness and silence remained. Terror turned into curiosity as I learned more about the sinister force that hunted this desolate stretch of road. Some said it was a deranged serial killer, while others insisted it was something far more monstrous, born from the deepest pits of folklore. A local legend is known as El Diablo Verde. But no matter what the townspeople believed, it remained a mystery shrouded in fear and paranoia. With each subsequent trip through Greenstone, I became increasingly intrigued by its macabre allure, always half expecting to see that same chilling scene and just hoping it would never find me. As time went on, the darkness of that grim memory began to fade into uncertainty. Had I really seen what I thought? Or was it simply the work of a twisted imagination? Whatever the case, I couldn't deny that the creeping sense of dread persisted whenever I found myself driving through Greenstone. On my last trip, only a few days after witnessing the grisly scene, I decided to confront my growing obsession by talking to some locals. Aside from Emil, I had been avoiding conversations with Greenstone's residents as much as possible to stay off their radar. But my attempts at remaining a stranger were becoming increasingly futile. I walked into a busy diner and slipped into an empty booth. As I glanced around the crowded space, my eyes landed on a group of rough-looking men huddled in one corner. Their whispered conversation and furtive glances at me only heightened my unease. You're wasting your time, friend, said a raspy voice beside me jolting me back to reality. An old man with unkempt white hair and a crooked nose had sat down across from me without so much as an introduction. He leaned forward. These people won't tell you anything about El Diablo Verde. His piercing eyes held mine for what felt like an eternity. How do you know about? I started to ask, but he raised his hand to stop me. My name's Willard, he said simply. I've been living in this town for decades, and trust me, if there's anything worth knowing about that damned creature, I've got the scoop. Willard described how this beast was unlike any other, a vicious tangle of fur and muscle with piercing red eyes that haunted those who looked upon it. It was uncanny in its movements and reveled in causing fear among its prey before striking with brutal force. Residents believed it stalked Greenstone at night, seeking vengeance for some past wrong. As Willard regaled me with gruesome tales of victims found mutilated beyond recognition throughout Greenstone's dark history, 
I found it difficult to see this monstrous figure as anything but a sick manifestation of human violence. I couldn't shake the feeling that there might be some truth to his stories. It wasn't until Willard leaned in closer, revealing a barely perceptible scar across his throat, that the pieces fell into place. You're looking for proof, aren't you? He whispered, lifting his chin just enough to show off the jagged wound. My blood ran cold as he grinned. I was attacked three days ago. Got lucky until now. Want to know what saved my life? Gripping my forearm tightly, Willard beckoned me to follow him outside. As midnight descended upon us, he pulled an old pistol from his pocket and handed it over. I heard something rustling in the underbrush that night. He confided as we walked deeper into Greenstone's outskirts. It closed in on me fast, like a predator stalking its prey. Willard recounted. He described desperate gunshots piercing the air and that horrific beast fleeing back into the darkness, leaving scarcely any evidence of its existence. The cold metal pressed against my palm as I questioned whether I could face such a creature. But before I could think further on the matter, Willard grabbed my arm and pulled me behind some roadside bushes. A guttural growl resonated through the air nearby, sending shivers down my spine as we both held our breath. Moments later, the El Diablo Verde emerged from behind a nearby tree, even more horrifying than I could have imagined. Ever so slowly, we retreated while keeping our eyes locked on the beast that had terrorized Greenstone for so long. Upon reaching safety's reach, we remained silent and listened to each other's pounding heartbeats before parting ways. I continued on with this nightmare forever etched into my memory. The insatiable pull toward Greenstone loosened its grip on me as the image of that mutilated body and the demonic eyes of El Diablo Verde became a horror I've carried with me ever since. It was around 3.07 p.m. on a mundane Tuesday afternoon when I found myself pulling up to a small truck stop just off Highway 20 in Dubuque, Iowa. Rusty's Roadhouse was its name, and it seemed like your typical greasy spoon nestled in the heartland of America. I wasn't expecting much more than a hot meal and a place to lay my head for a few hours before continuing my long haul down to Texas. My name is Orson Braddock, and I've been driving trucks for over 15 years now. Time spent behind the wheel had taught me that no two days on the road are ever identical, despite the seemingly endless stretches of concrete highways. But what transpired at this little pit stop would turn out to be one of those moments I'd never forget. As I settled down into my booth, I noticed a group of regulars huddled together by the bar engaged in a heated discussion. Curiosity peaked. I leaned in to catch wind of what they were all arguing about. The word, Grinnell, caught my attention. Apparently, something terrible had befallen that notorious intersection near town. With each person adding their memory or hearsay to the story, it morphed into something not quite human and definitely not natural. I made the decision to participate because I was feeling braver than usual and could only muster a typical plate of mac and cheese. Are you all talking about that thing that's been attacking folks around here? A man with grisly features and a thick beard turned to me, sizing me up before saying, Yeah, son, my name's Monty Albin you wouldn't want to cross its path. The others nodded solemnly in agreement. Word had it that this creature, or human gone mad, had been responsible for countable maimings and worse throughout the area over recent years but remained elusive and unidentified. To some, it seemed to be a legendary cryptid, to others, perhaps an unhinged murderer. 
Whatever it was, no one wanted to find out the hard way. As horrifying stories of unexplainable attacks and gruesome deeds continued to circulate around the room, I couldn't help but become increasingly fixated on the dark cloud that this alleged Grinnell was casting over everyone present. Despite my skepticism, a growing sense of genuine fear began creeping into my mind. A woman named Esther shared her own harrowing tale. One foggy morning, she stepped outside her home to find her husband Carl lying motionless in a pool of blood, viciously mutilated down to his entrails. From the corner where she grieved, Esther's eyes remained haunted. When night arrived, I hesitantly climbed back into my truck's cab. The unnerving stories clung to my every thought like overgrown ivy vines draped across a disused building, tightening their grip and refusing to let go. I tightened my hold on the steering wheel as I passed the Grinnell intersection in the midst of ominous clouds that seemed to be churning with anticipation and darkness. Then it happened. An all-too-human scream echoed into the night, one split second of terror resonating from directions unknown. It was as if reality itself had become unglued before me, despite the fact that everything, the headlights piercing through the darkness ahead, the hum of the tires beneath me, still seemed tangible for now. Instinct took over. I slammed on my brakes without thinking twice about what may lie ahead. Heart pounding, I threw open the door of my truck, running out towards the unsettling scream. What on earth could have caused such a sound? As I cautiously moved closer to where the noise seemed to have originated, I noticed something that sent chills down my spine. Footprints, large, inhuman footprints, were imprinted in the damp soil beside the road. A lingering stench hung heavily in the air as blood and viscera stained the ground beneath those marks. It was horrifying to think about how close I had come to becoming another victim of Grinnell. Despite my mounting dread, something inside me urged me forward. I had no weapons or means of defense against this creature should our paths finally cross, but my throbbing need for answers conquered all rational thought. Before my journey into this nightmare began, I was nothing but an ordinary truck driver who laughed at tales like these. Yet now, faced with undeniable proof of the grisly happenings plaguing this small town, I found it impossible to turn away and leave these people to their fates. Following the gruesome trail led me to an abandoned shed on the edge of a dense forest. The decrepit structure seemed like a fitting haven for such a ghoulish tale's antagonist, and as I neared it, horror and curiosity continued their twisted tango inside me. To my surprise and relief, this shed's interior revealed a grisly scene absent of any supernatural horrors. Instead, it was brimming with rather mundane paraphernalia of an obviously demented handiwork. Tools and knives glinted maliciously in the dim light, while gory murals bled down the walls. They were maps bearing pictures of countless victims mutilated beyond recognition by an artist plagued by madness. A sense of nausea clouded over me as I looked closely at one of these crude illustrations highlighting meticulously disfigured entrails all too similar to Esther's Carl. Bound in layers of grime, it appeared as if this unhinged murderer had been keeping track of its every brutal exploit, preserving them as grotesque reminders or perhaps trophies to savor. My stomach churned with a mixture of dread and rage. What kind of sick person would relish in the suffering of innocent victims? Grinnell was no mythic creature but something far worse, a human consumed by darkness and warped beyond all reason. I began to rifle through the shed's gruesome contents, hoping to find evidence that could aid local enforcement in capturing this sociopath before it struck again. Among the filth, I stumbled upon a disturbing photo, dated just days ago, depicting a man as ordinary as they come, 
grinning before his dusty truck parked at Rusty's Roadhouse. My blood ran cold as I finally understood why the screams had sounded so close to me on that fateful night. Grinnell's next victim was right there alongside my cab. I felt anger boiling inside me at the sight of this twisted individual daring to blend in and share drinks with the same people left reeling from his monstrosities. Fighting back bile, I knew what I had to do. This small town needed justice, putting an end to Grinnell's deranged reign of terror once and for all. The police would surely be interested in everything I'd uncovered within the shed, especially since it was drenched with blood from countless massacres. Tightly gripping the damning photograph, I rushed out of the shed. My resolve grew with every pounding footstep back towards town and the newfound mission that had fallen upon me by sheer fate or twisted destiny. Grinnell may have eluded capture thus far, but with proof in hand and a furious determination burning inside me now unquenched by any lingering doubt or skeptic's laughter for those haunting tales told earlier, nothing could stop me from bringing the monster to its knees. I was driving my usual route through the small, remote town of Pinnacle Point on March 10th when I decided to take a break and grab some dinner at the local diner. The room was filled with laughter and playful banter between regulars as I sat there. Little did I know that life at Pinnacle Point would never be the same again. As I savored my cheeseburger, I looked out of the window just in time to see a man sprinting down the street his shirt stained with what appeared to be blood. Instinctively, I bolted towards the door and shouted to the diner owner, James Hampson. Did you see what happened? James looked puzzled but hesitated before replying. There have been rumors about a man stalking certain warehouse areas where trucks like yours are parked. Careful out there, buddy. Trying to dismiss my worries, I left the diner and jogged back to my truck. Pinnacle Point wasn't exactly crime-free, but nothing had ever escalated to this level of violence before. At first glance, everything seemed normal around my truck. It was only when I opened the driver's side door that I noticed the dried blood smeared on it. Panic crept over me as I moved a few steps ahead revealing a corpse lying hidden between my truck and another vehicle. The unsettling thing was that neither of us had heard anything from so close by. Sirens wailed in the distance as police cars raced toward us after someone dialed 911. While they cornered the crime scene, an officer approached me for information about what happened. As days turned into weeks, fear consumed Pinnacle Point. No one knew who or what this mysterious attacker was. The serial killer, or creature, struck again and again with seemingly random victims. But why? Using their connections from previous investigations, law enforcement managed to trace these horrific acts back to a man named Drago Lazarevic. Drago had once been a renowned surgeon with a dark secret. He'd become obsessed with ancient folklore, specifically stories of an evil creature that only attacked truck drivers. With this newfound knowledge etched in the back of my mind, I felt vulnerable. Had Drago come after me? The ambience in Pinnacle Point had grown increasingly tense, with its residents now recalling eerie instances they'd brushed off in the past. Drago was able to elude authorities for months, transforming from a respected doctor to an elusive sadist and murderer. Through the grapevine, we learned he'd been conducting gruesome experiments on his victims, likely emulating that very malevolent creature from those cryptic tales. Although police finally managed to corner Drago at his residence, something went horribly wrong. Like the creature in those stories, 
Drago slipped away unnoticed. Witnesses recalled seeing an ominous figure lurking at the scene before it vanished into the darkness. Much remains unknown regarding Drago's whereabouts or the origin of the evil he so desperately sought to embody. Today, we can only hope that justice will find him before he continues his despicable acts. But as another truck driver disappears in Pinnacle Point, hope dwindles with each passing day. The weeks following the discovery of Drago Lazarevic's hideout were chaotic, to say the least. Pinnacle Point felt like an entirely different place. Feeling compelled to contribute to tracking down Drago, I decided to use my free time to do some research and see if I could uncover any new leads. On March 14th, at around 2.47 p.m., I stumbled upon an article mentioning a book he cited in one of his medical publications. Evil Unearthed, Ancient Creatures of Myth and Legend by Dr. Harold Worthington. Figuring that this book must have held some significance for him, I set out to find a copy. After days of searching various bookstores and libraries, I finally found it tucked away in the corner of Pinnacle Point's public library. Flipping through the pages feverishly, a specific passage about a creature known as Melibosis caught my eye. This sinister creature was said to prey on travelers and truck drivers who ventured onto its territory, disemboweling its victims with razor-sharp claws and leaving them for dead under vehicles. It was all starting to make sense. Drago must have planned his attacks based on these stories, envisioning himself as Melibosis. I made my way back home that night in a daze, an unnerving mixture of terror and determination coursing through me. That evening, March 19th, at 10.34 p.m., I received an anonymous tip via email detailing sightings near one particular warehouse frequented mostly by weary truck drivers like myself. With nothing more than sheer determination fueling me, I teamed up with a couple of my fellow drivers and ventured towards the warehouse at 1.03 a.m. on March 20th. As we approached cautiously, I couldn't help but imagine Drago lurking in the shadows, his once reputable appearance now twisted by his newfound obsession. The formerly well-respected surgeon stood at around six feet one inch, his once neatly combed hair now a chaotic mess. He had hauntingly dark, sunken eyes and wore a tattered, old surgical gown stained with the blood of his victims. His long, bony fingers were adorned with claw-like extensions that Drago, in his madness, had surgically attached. As we conducted our search of the warehouse, our flashlights illuminating every grimy corner, we couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched. The air was cold and heavy with dread as every small noise set us on edge. It was 3.27 a.m. when one of my colleagues, Rick, let out a horrified gasp. We quickly followed his gaze to find the eviscerated body of yet another truck driver suspended from a chain in the rafters. The horrifying sight was almost too much to bear, and we knew there was only one man capable of such monstrous cruelty. As it approached 5 a.m. on that horrifying morning, we heard faint footsteps echoing behind us. Before any of us could react, Drago lunged out from the darkness, his wretched claws extended and ready for attack. We did our best to fight back, however. It quickly became clear that Drago's surgical skills served him well beyond the operating table. He knew exactly where to strike for maximum pain while avoiding fatal injuries. Emerging from the warehouse, battered and bleeding, we realized that we had underestimated just how dangerous he really was. Though we managed to escape with our lives that night, miraculously, fear continued to grip Pinnacle Point. Despite no further sightings of Drago Lazarevic after that terrifying encounter, an uneasy tension hung over everyone in town. 
It felt as though his dark presence would forever lurk in our shadows, watching and waiting. The streets remained deserted long after dusk fell over Pinnacle Point, and the laughter that once filled the local diner was replaced with hushed whispers. The big question on everyone's lips remained, what if Drago wasn't alone? Was there a possibility of others who worshipped Melibosis, eager to adopt Drago's methods and continue his grisly work? We could only hope that no more lives would be claimed by this horrific tragedy and that the darkness that currently envelopes Pinnacle Point would one day be lifted. But for now, at least the trucks kept rolling and life went on. I was driving my big rig through the Nebraska sandhills, heading towards Broken Bow, with only the stars and the howling wind as my companions. It was early April when the air held a slight chill, and I was enjoying the trip so far. The sandhills were both calming and eerie, a vast stretch of rolling dunes that seemed to go on forever. Unexpectedly, I got a crackling message through my CB radio from another driver who was about an hour ahead of me. Fair warning there, Road Ranger, he said, his voice laced with apprehension. I just spotted something strange off Route 83, about seven miles south of Thetford. I don't know what it is, maybe nothing, but keep your eyes peeled. His voice alone sent a shiver down my spine and I mentally prepared myself for anything out of the ordinary. As I continued along Route 83, making progress toward the alleged oddity checkpoint, I couldn't help but notice an overwhelming tension in the atmosphere. It grew darker as I headed further into the night, and I considered whether to keep pushing on or take a break at one of the few small towns scattered throughout the sandhills. Ultimately, my curiosity was piqued, and I pressed forward. Just as I crossed that seven-mile marker described by my fellow trucker, my high beams illuminated something up ahead. A mangled deer carcass sprawled out on the roadside. The animal appeared to have been torn apart violently, leaving bloody trails across the windswept sand. Jesus Christ! I muttered under my breath reaching for the CB radio yet again. Before grabbing it in time, something darted in front of my rig, too fast to make out any distinct features but enough that I swerved instinctively to avoid hitting it. My heart raced as my truck came to a shuddering halt, and I found myself hesitating about whether I should open the door and investigate. Barely summoning up enough courage, I stepped out of the cab and cautiously approached where the creature had dashed across the road, my flashlight illuminating the path. Suddenly, to my right, I heard a low growl that echoed through the night. I shone the light toward it but saw nothing lurking there. I hesitated for a moment before running straight back to my truck, slamming the door shut and locking it. Starting up the rig, I sped away from that desolate spot just as something very, very large slammed into the side of my trailer with incredible force. God help me, I whispered, flooring the accelerator as adrenaline pumped through my body. Petrified and desperate for answers, I got that same trucker back on the CB radio. What followed was a conversation filled with strange theories and dark legends about shape-shifting creatures called skinwalkers that roamed the desolate landscapes in search of prey. The further I got from Thedford's bizarre sighting, the more paranoia gnawed at me relentlessly. That night led me down a rabbit hole, delving deep into local lore and whispered tales. Some suggested witchcraft could have been involved or even a twisted individual with monstrous desires. Eventually, countless conversations later, an eerie truth emerged that would haunt me forever, 
There was a name whispered among many who journeyed through those lonely sand hills nights, the Howler of Thedford. A horrifying figure with no known origin or motive beyond terrorizing these isolated roads and ambushing its prey. I still drive through those sand dunes dotted across Nebraska but always remain wary. However, to this day, either the Howler, nor any information linking anyone or anything to it has been discovered. Now, when I pass other truckers on those same roads late at night, we often share knowing looks with one another, leaving the details of that encounter unanswered. The Howler's true identity remains an enigma, a nightmarish reminder of the unknown horrors lurking in those desolate, faraway landscapes. My hands gripped the steering wheel tightly. I decided to take my investigation into my own hands rather than allow the howler to continue stalking these desolate roads unrestricted. Enlisting the help of a few trusted fellow truckers, we planned to unearth whatever was hiding in the darkness, no matter how dangerous it was. We began searching the sandhills for any potential hiding spots or dens where the howler could have been lurking. Our search took place entirely during daylight hours. We knew better than to wander around at night in this treacherous landscape with a predator on the loose. A few days into our search, we stumbled across a series of caves tucked into the side of a large dune. By the door, there was a pool of wet blood and a nauseating trail that led further inside. It looked fresh. Nerves running high, I gradually proceeded into the cave with my flashlight leading the way. The walls of the interior were etched with deep scratches and streaks of crimson gore. Something terrible undoubtedly found solace here. There were mutilated animal carcasses strewn about many ripped to pieces and devoured as if left for easy consumption. As I pushed further into the cave, my flashlight eventually landed upon a tall figure standing still in its depths. I gulped. It barely resembled anything human anymore. Substantial deformities twisted its limbs at grotesque angles, while charcoal renderings had been smeared over its leathery skin possibly remnants of its metamorphosis from human to beast. I froze in place, attempting to shake off my fears and maintain control over the situation that unfolded so nefariously before me. My companions joined me wordlessly, their eyes fixed on the monstrosity as well, until one spoke up. It's crazy! How did it evolve like this? But before anyone could answer, there was an audible crack as a feral growl escaped from the howler's throat. My heart raced. The monstrous figure began to move, its lumbering steps echoing throughout the cave, backing us into a corner. Suddenly and without warning, my instincts kicked in, and I launched my knife straight at the beast's leg. To our collective surprise, it hit its target, and the howler screeched in pain, collapsing as bright crimson blood spilled from its wound. We saw that brief moment as an opportunity to escape, running out of the cave with all the adrenaline our terrified bodies could muster. We trekked hastily through the dunes back to our trucks as a sense of relief settled over us. We didn't kill the howler. We only injured it and maybe bought some time for others who traveled these lonely roads. At least now, we had witnessed its grotesque form firsthand and couldn't claim ignorance when warning future souls to beware. After that chilling encounter, I knew there'd be no rest for me or my fellow truckers until we found out more about the Howler of Thedford, what sinister force transformed it from human to fiend and what drove it to embark on its malevolent spree. But no matter how hard we tried to uncover the truth, Answers eluded us like shadows flickering in the darkness. Perhaps some mysteries were better left unanswered, or so residents of Thedford would like to believe. As the days passed and wounds healed, tales whispered through truckers' ranks began to fade but never vanished entirely. 
A lingering dread settled upon each passerby who traversed those abandoned roads, knowing they were never truly safe. I still shudder at the memory of closing in on that nefarious creature, yet I feel compelled each time I drive through Nebraska's sand dunes, an enduring reminder of the Howler's existence and all those still haunted by its unknown fate. There may never be a resolution or true understanding of this enigma, but one thing remains certain. The Howler of Thetford's reign continues to cast a shadow over all those who travel these lonely roads in fear of the unknown horrors that may lie ahead. I still remember that peculiar morning of September 19, 1998, when I pulled into the rest area near Elma, Washington. It seemed like a regular day, nothing out of the ordinary. The sun was rising, casting a warm glow over the dew-covered grass of the rest area. My name is Jedrek Malkowski, and I'm a long-haul trucker who transports goods all across the country. That particular day, I'd been driving since midnight and felt like taking a break. I had no idea the seemingly innocuous stop would quickly turn into a living nightmare. As I stepped out of my cab to stretch my limbs, I noticed something odd on the edge of the woods just beyond the rest area. Deep gouges in the ground and claw marks on nearby trees that seemed almost too large and deep to be made by any animal in those parts. Was it just my eyes playing tricks on me? I should have taken it as a warning sign at that instant. Later on, when I parked for a meal at a roadside diner, fellow truckers were whispering in hushed tones about some mysterious attacks that had been happening all over the Pacific Northwest. Some claimed it was the work of an unknown serial killer, while others believed it to be some kind of mythical creature from Native American folklore. They called it Nalusa Chido, or the Black Thing. But none of this made sense to me. My rational mind just couldn't accept those explanations. But as time went by and more incidents occurred, with no clear suspect in sight, I started having second thoughts about dismissing those stories as mere hogwash. Perhaps there was a grain of truth in them after all. It wasn't until weeks later, when I witnessed an actual attack on another trucker just outside Kettle Falls, that I understood why Nalissa Cheeto instilled such terror among people. In that short moment, before everything descended into chaos, I saw a dark, shadowy figure with twisted limbs and sunken black eyes standing beside the truck. Its mouth opened wide, exposing massive, razor-sharp teeth dripping with dark fluid that seemed more sinister than mere blood. Within seconds, its massive claws cut through the cab like a hot knife through butter, leaving the trucker no chance of escaping its grisly fate. And as quickly as it appeared, Nalusa Chido vanished into the woods, unscathed and unstoppable. Panicked shouts erupted from the onlookers as they tried to make sense of what had just transpired. Abject terror pulsed through my body, forcing my legs to carry me back to my truck with maddening speed. I took off without even knowing where I was going my hands gripping the steering wheel so tightly that I feared it might crumble under the pressure. My mind raced with images of the monster and all the murders it had committed, grisly accounts relayed by those who survived or had stumbled upon the aftermath. The true identity of Nalissa Chito remains a mystery to this day. Whether it's a mythical creature or a deranged killer in disguise matters little to those who've encountered it firsthand. All we know is that a seemingly never-ending trail of fear and destruction follows in its wake. As another storm rages outside my humble motel room tonight, I know deep down that despite all our doubts and skepticism, some mysteries are better left unsolved. 
For as long as there are places shrouded in darkness, things like Nalusa Cheetah will continue to lurk in those shadows, waiting for their next unsuspecting victim to cross their blood-stained path. After that night in Kettle Falls, I couldn't shake off the urge to learn more about Nalusa Cheeto. I was terrified but somehow drawn to the danger. I had to find answers. There must be some avenue my rational mind could explore. In the following days, I immersed myself in local folklore and searched for survivors of the mysterious attacks. On Monday at 9.37 a.m., I managed to track down a man named Danny Ochoa, who claimed to have survived a close encounter with the beast. His story was strangely similar to what happened in Kettle Falls. I needed to meet him. I met with Danny on Tuesday afternoon at 3.15 p.m. in a busy cafe where we could talk without drawing attention to ourselves. He was a scruffy, middle-aged man with haunted eyes filled with fatigue. When I asked him about his harrowing encounter, he shuddered and proceeded cautiously. He described his ordeal with Nalisa Cheeto in graphic detail, how its skin appeared almost like tar, how it stretched its bony limbs out unnaturally while stalking its prey, and the sickly sweet smell of decay it exuded as it tore through flesh and bone with unnerving ease. The conversation left me shaken but also determined. As we parted ways that day at 4.46 p.m., Danny warned me about getting too involved and said that once you're marked by Nalisa Cheeto, there's no turning back. I took his cautionary words seriously but couldn't abandon my pursuit. Five days later, armed with information from myth and survivor accounts, I ventured into the Pacific Northwest woods on Friday morning at 8.52 a.m. as part of my self-appointed mission to find out the truth about Nalisa Cheeto. With me were high-resolution cameras and audio recording devices, hoping to gather evidence of its existence. But deep down, I knew there was no guarantee of a safe return. As dusk fell on the second day of my expedition, at precisely 6.34 p.m., a chill ran me down to my core. I knew I was about to face Nalisa Chito at any moment. This time, I wouldn't have the luxury of becoming an unsuspecting victim. With bated breath, I froze on the spot as Nalisa Cheeto emerged from the forest depths. Its presence sucked out any semblance of warmth around me, an omen of death. The creature approached cautiously and stood just yards away from me. Its pitch black eyes bore into mine with unnerving intensity, and its foul smile widened to reveal those frighteningly sharp teeth. I managed a shaky swallow and carefully reached for one of my cameras. To my horror, it sensed my movement and lunged toward me with a gut-wrenching screech. Time seemed to slow to a snail's pace as its claws descended upon me. But before they could make contact, I deployed a makeshift flashbang that temporarily blinded the monster. Taking advantage of Nalisa Cheeto's surprise, I scrambled backward and sprinted as fast as my legs could carry me. My heart pounded in my chest like a jackhammer as adrenaline surged through my veins. Hearing the creature recover quickly and pursue me relentlessly sent shivers down my spine. At exactly 7.12 p.m., after minutes that felt like an eternity, I managed to find cover in an abandoned cabin within the woods. A cruel irony since we were now both trapped. No matter what new horrors awaited inside that ramshackle structure as darkness closed in around us, I knew I had made it farther than anyone else had against Nalisa Cheeto while getting close to uncovering its darkest secrets. But then again, who could truly comprehend or vanquish such an enigma? Even though I'd survived this time, Knowing that my own curiosity sealed my fate as a perpetual target, I understood why some things were best left in the shadows. There's a little evil inside us all. All we can do is hope that we're never pulled into its sickening embrace.
As I was driving my 18-wheeler through the desolate wasteland of Nevada on Route 50, known as the loneliest road in America, I passed by a disconcerting sight that would pique my curiosity for years to come. The day was September 14, 2011, and the sun beat down on the arid landscape. What caught my eye wasn't just unusual. It was downright puzzling. My name is Alec Groves. I've been a trucker for over two decades, and this route has been part of my monthly itinerary for 15 years. Scattered beside the road, like a trail of breadcrumbs leading into the barren wilderness toward an inconspicuous side road, were tufts of matted fur and pools of clotted blood. My heart thumped hard against my chest in nervous anticipation. I decided to pull over and chat with Trevor Sanderson, a fellow trucker who I saw parked on that dusty side road. We exchanged pleasantries before inquiring about the gruesome trail leading toward his truck. He took a drag from his cigarette and exhaled before explaining that he had come across some tracks, what seemed like enormous paw prints accompanied by human footprints. Together, we followed the strange detritus to an abandoned shack with its door hanging off its hinges. A putrid stench permeated the air, warning us to stay away. I stared into Trevor's terrified eyes as we cautiously crossed the threshold. Inside, we found torn apart animal carcasses scattered around the room, mutilated beyond recognition and intense claw marks etched deeper into the walls than any earthly creature could achieve. It seemed as though something nefarious had taken up residence in this forsaken place. What do you reckon happened here? Trevor whispered hesitantly. I dunno, I replied while swallowing hard, disturbed by what we were witnessing. We searched the shack for clues and found a tattered journal belonging to someone named Henry McCullen. The entries recounted his encounter with a monstrous creature, both animal and human in nature, that he had named the Skin Stalker. We compared the footprints and claw marks with the vivid descriptions in McCullen's journal, apprehensively confirming that this was indeed the lair of the Skin Stalker. The sound of crickets abruptly ceased outside, breaking our concentration. Our hearts raced, adrenaline coursing through our veins as footsteps growled ominously nearby. Quickly, we ducked behind some rotting debris, remaining paralyzed for what felt like hours. Eventually, we couldn't resist the urge to see what was approaching our hiding place. With bated breath, we took a slight peek at the entity lumbering past our sanctuary, certain it hadn't yet noticed us. The foul creature looked like a demented chimera, part beast and part humanoid but entirely grotesque. It dragged an eviscerated carcass while mumbling guttural sounds as it snacked on its prized morsel. We dashed through the shack's back window as quietly and quickly as possible when the skin stalker momentarily left our line of sight. Freedom welcomed us with open arms. However, something about its lifelike statue poses raised an alarm bell in my mind. As Trevor and I fled back to our respective trucks in unison in panic, we spotted a dusty old newspaper article pinned to a makeshift bulletin board near Route 50's entrance. The headline read, Local man found dead, mauled by unknown assailant. Next to it was a blurry photo of a man who strikingly resembled Henry McCullen. Trevor and I exchanged glances before starting up our engines and bolting down Route 50 without uttering another word or looking back. Sometime later, distant howling haunted Route 50 as a dark shadow slithered between the moonlit sagebrush. The legend of the skin stalker persisted in desert whispers, but we could never be sure if it was nothing more than a terrifying figment of our imagination or an authentic demonic presence. To date, whenever I find myself traveling on Route 50, I pass that side road without blinking. 
but my conviction in the disconnect between ever believing in the skin stalker and leaving that horrible shack became a battle. Putting as much distance between me and that grim scene as possible seemed like the best strategy. A few days later, I found myself back at a bar near Route 50, nursing a well-deserved drink and chatting with an old-timer named Frank. I shared my harrowing experience, hoping for some insight or perhaps some knowledge about the sinister entity out in the desert. Frank listened intently, taking slow sips from his beer and nodding his head thoughtfully. After finishing my tale, he leaned in closer and said quietly, You ain't the first to come across that shack, you know. There used to be a whole family living up there, the McCullens. They say old Henry floated between sanity and worlds beyond our comprehension. As I continued talking to him, he recounted disturbing rituals Henry had performed, trying to gain unnatural abilities by invoking ancient spirits. Unfortunately for him, something grotesque had answered his call, the Skin Stalker. Frank proceeded to share the ghastly disappearances of travelers passing Route 50. Although their deaths were blamed on wild animals or accidents, people would claim they saw an unholy amalgamation of man and beast wandering the land at dusk. Those who ventured too close to its lair suffered gruesome fates. My heartbeat quickened as Frank detailed the creature's appearance, hideously disfigured beyond recognition, with patches of fur intermingled within decaying and peeling flesh. Its eyes glowed with an unearthly fire that seemed to devour everything within sight. As unsettling as this information was, I couldn't help but feel relief wash over me, knowing I wasn't alone in experiencing this unsettling encounter. Three days later, Trevor reached out to me after hearing reports about missing campers not far from where we'd found the shack. Without hesitation, we headed back out to the area, armed and ready to face the monstrous skin stalker once more. As we approached, a harrowing sense of deja vu overcame me. We found the campsite in disarray, with blood splattered throughout the area. We followed the massacre's grisly trail toward the abandoned shack, our weapons clutched tightly in hand. We saw the remains of what was once a human being as we ventured closer. The skin stalker must have heard us approaching because it suddenly appeared from the shadows of a nearby ravine. Trevor fired a shotgun round in its direction, but the creature only screamed in fury before charging towards us. Run! Trevor shouted, and we hurried towards our trucks. As I pulled away from that horrifying scene, I glimpsed something unexpected, pain in the skin stalker's eyes. It reminded me that this morbid creation, this cursed creature, was once a man who had lost control over his ambitions. Trevor and I decided to share our story with local authorities and Frank's network of old-timers. Together, we formed a group focused on tracking down and eventually putting an end to this gruesome monster's tirade. While people still pass by Route 50 with curiosity about the loneliest road in America's legend, they remain oblivious to the devious sentinel lurking in the shadows of abandoned shacks and whispering canyons beyond their view. We took comfort in knowing its secret would continue to elude them. For Trevor and me, our mission goes on, safeguarding unsuspecting travelers while seeking some semblance of peace for Henry McCullen as we hunt for a way to release him from his tragic curse.